RMS Queen Mary, Queen of the Queens by William J. Duncan Published by Droke House Publishers in 1969 Audiobook narration done by Alex Adner of the Alex the Historian YouTube channel Author's Note To my wife Ada, who has made all my voyages smooth with her love, devotion, and encouragement Chapter 1 A City Buys a Queen Waddling a half-chewed, unlit cigar from side to side in his mouth while scanning a newspaper, Lloyd D. Hart sat cross-legged on an old couch made of discarded automobile seats inside the wooden shanty at the entrance of his landfill dump on the waterfront of Long Beach, California. To look at Hart, one would scarcely think he would be the type to rummage through the pages of Barron's, the Dow Jones Weekly Financial Journal, but browsing through financial newspapers was his daily ritual. Hart's appearance is deceptive, a cover for the real man under that country boy exterior, a financial genius with a rare quality of being able to play the wildest long shots and come up a winner. As he pored over the pages of the tabloid weekly, Hart spied a one-paragraph item that held peak interest for him. He raised up from the slouch position and started a suppressed giggle that warmed its way into a full laugh. Sitting across from Hart was Frank Cassidy, a wealthy, retired building contractor, who came down to Hart's dump almost every day to spin yarns, cuss the liberals, the communists, and the general state of the Union. Cassidy enjoyed an occasional mouthful of Copenhagen, and had just stoked three fingers full of snuff behind his lower gum when Hart's stomach began to quiver in a belly laugh. "'What'd you find, L.D.?' Cassidy asked. "'By damned, Frank, I think I finally got something that'll turn that old boy purple with rage. He'll hit the ceiling!' Hart said, tearing the small item out of the journal. He showed Cassidy the item he ripped out, and Cassidy, with a wry smile, a snuff spit, and a head shake, silently agreed with Hart's scheme. It was on that April day, in 1966, in a Long Beach, California dump that two Oklahoma farm boys started a gag that was to decide the future of one of the world's greatest merchant ships, the RMS Queen Mary. By chance, Hart saw the brief newspaper item that Cunard Steamship Company, planned to sell the Queen Mary for scrap. Hart, several years before, had joined a group of businessmen in one of his uncanny business deals, purchasing the 6,000-ton Canadian ocean liner Princess Louise on the daring dream that the ship could be converted into a posh floating restaurant in Southern California, where restaurants are so numerous that within one block one can order tacos at one place and truffles at another. Novel restaurants, even floating ones, were nothing new to the blasé Californian, and Southern California was far from any cuisine capital. However, the Princess Louise was a famous ship, and had a certain allure about her that the other investors felt would draw crowds. Hart proposed that the 330-foot Queen of the Northern Sea be docked at Long Beach. Principal opponent of that plan was a Long Beach Harbor commissioner named Harry E. Bud Ridings, Jr., a Cadillac dealer, civic leader, and then chairman of the powerful board of harbor commissioners. Ridings, a slightly built, nervous man, appears to be always in a fitful dash to get things done. He believed that the harbor was for active shipping, and not for dead ships that would take up valuable dock space tied to a pier. The Princess Louise, as a restaurant project, would be a dead ship, he argued. The idea of tying her to a Long Beach pier was rejected, and the promoters went to neighboring Los Angeles Harbor at San Pedro and tethered her to a dock just a bridge away from Long Beach. Like most everything Hart touches, the Princess Louise become an instant success. Hart never let writings forget that he'd made a mistake in judgment about old ships and new ideas. The Cunard decision to sell the Queen Mary, Hart thought, would give writings an opportunity to make up for his mistake. After all, he whimsically plotted, the 81,237-ton, 1,019-foot luxury liner was the second largest ship in the world, and her 12 decks would be ample space for a restaurant, maybe several. Hart believed, to be successful in pulling off a practical joke, you must plan it well. He went so far as to pick up the deck plans for the Queen Mary from a travel agency to prove to writings the potential uses of the ship. Ridings took the ribbing in stride. He also pocketed the tiny news item. He was going to turn that gag into something real. He was going to turn Hart's sautern and soda water into sparkling champagne. Long Beach was 75 years old. It had, over the years, been a popular resort, 
and at one time was described as the Riviera of the West by a Time magazine writer. In fact, the city does look much like the French Riviera. It has an 11-mile area of beachfront and is in a Mediterranean mild, temperate zone. Low coastal hills form natural barriers to protect the city from the southwesterly winds that blow off the Pacific Ocean. The Riviera of the West, however, was not altogether a gleaming white strand of Pacific Beach. It was seedy in spots, and seedy where it showed the most, its downtown section. What hotels hadn't been turned into cheap apartment houses were old and shabby. The waterfront area, although undergoing urban renewal, still had the look of a sailor's honky-tonk. The old storefronts along Ocean Boulevard, where trains once stopped in the 1900s to let vacationers off at the front door of the plush beachfront hotels, were now tattoo parlors, cheap bars, hamburger hangouts, and pawn shops. Architecture here bellied the fact that in 1933, an earthquake almost leveled the city. On the streets, young sailors mingled with old pensioners. The screeching, monotonous beat of rock and roll music wafted out of jukeboxes in the bars over to senior citizens' shuffleboard courts. This part of the city contained the meager homes of older citizens. In fact, Long Beach had long had the image of being an old folks home, an image the city had tried to live down, but not too successfully. The Miss Universe contest, a beauty pageant that drew beautiful women from all over the world to Long Beach, where one was chosen the most beautiful in the world, left Long Beach in 1959 in a dispute over the pageant director. Catalina Swimsuit Company, the pageant's chief sponsor, owned the title Miss Universe and moved it and the contest to Miami, Florida. The city feebly tried to recover its loss with a Miss International Beauty contest, a duller and somewhat smudged carbon of the Miss Universe pageant. It never caught the public's fancy and never got the worldwide news coverage of the original contest. An attempt to bring a World's Fair to Long Beach, even to the extent of housing the fair on the landfilled Pier J, went sour too. The pier was still under construction in Long Beach when Hart started needling writings to buy the Queen Mary. Clearly, Long Beach needed a new image maker. Hart had unwittingly given writings the image maker, a ship as an image maker for a city that sees thousands of ships come in and out of its harbor every year? Not just a ship, but a special ship. A famous ship that people would travel for miles just to see. The Queen Mary, Ridings felt, was that kind of ship. Ridings was sold on the idea, but he needed support for his idea, and he needed it from City Hall. He was planning his strategy carefully and somewhat secretly. While he was still probing the possibility of getting someone to buy the ship for Long Beach, Kinnard hadn't officially announced that the Queen Mary would be scrapped. The news wasn't long in coming. The skippers of the Queen Mary and the Queen Elizabeth opened sealed messages while at sea, May 8, 1966. Kinnard told the skippers and the world that the Queen Mary would be taken out of service at the end of 1967, and the Queen Elizabeth at the end of 1968. Now that the news about the pending sale of the vessels was more than speculation, Riding set up a luncheon meeting with Harry Fulton, a former newspaper reporter who was now special assistant to city manager John R. Mansell, and a man close to the city politics. Ridings wanted a barometer reading on the political winds at City Hall. During the meal, Ridings turned the conversation to the Queen Mary. Fulton, a balding, slow-talking, methodical Irishman, listened intently. What Ridings was proposing went beyond a seagoing restaurant. Even though Hart had charted out restaurants fore and aft in the giant Cunarder cruise plan, he had them thumbtacked to the wall of his dump's shanty. Ridings was telling Fulton of a plan to convert the old British luxury liner into a hotel, convention center, shopping complex, and of course, with a sprinkling or two of restaurants. In a shell, it would be a tourist attraction. Ridings was talking factually. He had done much research on the proposal before making any overtures. Ridings had personally plowed through the morgue files of the Long Beach Independent, Press Telegram, and the Los Angeles Times, searching for details on the last days of the 67-year-old Hotel Astor in New York City, which was to be torn down to make way for a 40-story office building. There was a clamor to save the old French Renaissance structure, 
and when it was to fall to make way for a glass skyscraper, people came from miles around to buy souvenirs of the old hotel at the auction. And when the old Metropolitan Opera House in New York was to be replaced with the new Lincoln Center, another cry went up to save the structure. For the old Met, they paid up to $200 a seat for the last performance. People in the United States like to preserve old things to look at, but will not tolerate utilitarian things that get old. Few would even pay $5 for an opera ticket before someone decided to tear the place down. How much better, writings thought, to put a landmark that is old enough to be historic in a new locale where nobody has seen it before. Writings also knew the history of the glorious old ship, and he knew that for some reason, this ship had that special mysticism that makes some ships great and others just so many tons of steel plating. Fulton listened intently. He was impressed and said so. For Fulton, a man who seldom expresses enthusiasm about anything, that was the equivalent of a full endorsement. Perhaps his newspaperman's instinct surfaced when he was confronted with the unusual idea, and he knew that the unusual inevitably makes news. Fulton was no stranger to the Queen Mary. He was born in Belfast, Ireland, where his father worked for the Harland and Wolfe shipyards. His father had helped mold the steel that went into the 46,000-ton Titanic, the White Star liner that tragically crashed into a submerged iceberg and sank on her maiden voyage in April 1912. He had heard his father talk about the Queen Mary many times. Ships and shipbuilding were part of Fulton's heritage. Ridings had found a supporter. After lunch, Ridings went to the harbor building to run the idea up the flagpole with Frank Black, a New Englander who also knew ships and ports and most of all, good public relations. Since Black had been PR chief for the Port of Long Beach, more newspaper, magazine, radio, and TV space had been given to the Port of Long Beach than any other port in the United States. Long Beach had become the largest dry cargo port in the world, and Frank Black wasn't letting anyone forget it. He is one of the few master craftsmen in the PR trade, a field flooded with hacks and ex-newspapermen who pervert their talents for higher pay. Writings had only to mention the magic name Queen Mary and Black, his hazel eyes flashing, was up from his high-backed upholstered swivel chair, pacing and talking. To his trained public relations mind, this was the idea of the century. He was no stranger to the Queen Mary either. The first time I saw her, Black told Writings, was in 1939. She was a young lady in New York, and I was a young boy going to the World's Fair. She awed me then. The second time I saw her, I was aboard a victory ship coming home from the war. She was coming out of the late sun in the cold mid-Atlantic. I watched her steam past and vanish below the dark eastern horizon in less than five minutes. She awed me then. She's just that kind of ship. That kind of ship was what Harry E. Bud Ridings was looking for. He had two supporters now, and his idea began to take shape. On May 31, 1966, Ridings wrote a one-page letter to Sir Basil Smallpiece, chairman of the Kennard Steamship Company, in which he proposed an alternative fate, instead of the breaker's hammer for the Queen Mary. Specifically, I propose purchase of this great ship, Ridings wrote, for the purpose of permanently berthing her at Long Beach, as a great hotel, restaurant, and shopping complex for discriminating Californians and visitors to California. Seeking support, he wrote a second letter that day to Roger Corton, executive secretary of the British American Chamber of Commerce, in which he outlined his idea for the Queen Mary and asked Corton for support. Corton liked the idea and became Riding's third supporter. He immediately wrote Kennard, endorsing the proposal. Some weeks later, Riding's received a courteous reply from Kennard that was far from an enthusiastic endorsement. But he was not discouraged and began scouting a number of major financial houses to drum up interest from the private sector of the community in buying the 31-year-old luxury liner. He received encouraging responses along with a few blank expressions, but no firm offers. Almost a year had passed, but Ridings had not given up the idea. On March 7, 1967, he wrote another letter to Kennard, this time directing the communication to the attention of Lord Mancroft, Vice Chairman of the Shipping Company. 
In May, Lord Mancroft replied with the first note of enthusiasm the British firm had shown. He ended the letter by saying Cunard would be very happy to discuss the project. Ridings was in Japan on a trade mission for the Long Beach Harbor Department when the letter arrived, so Fulton wrote Mancroft on the city's continuing interest. Cunard replied in mid-May that they were now actively interested in Long Beach's proposal and invited representatives of the city to inspect the liner firsthand when it arrived in New York on its regular transatlantic run, May 23, 1967. Ridings, now back in Long Beach, was still trying to find private sources to make the purchase. In an unexpected move, however, Cunard moved up the deadline for the sale a year to July 24, 1967, little more than a month away. There was no time left for private sources to put together a package. It appeared as though the Queen Mary was slipping out of reach for Long Beach. Other United States cities announced intentions of buying the ship. New York's mayor, John Lindsay, wanted the massive 81,237-ton ship welded to a Brooklyn pier and converted into a high school for 3,000 students. Philadelphia was interested in the Mary for a hotel. Atlanta, Georgia exporter Henry McMahon wanted her for a floating trade exhibition. Scrap dealers in Italy, United States, Japan, Great Britain, and Hong Kong wanted the tons of metal the ship could yield. Ridings and other city officials, now actively interested in the Queen Mary purchase, met in the Harbor Department building overlooking a network of piers to map out a new plan to buy the Queen. In the distance, and within sound of the meeting room, rows of oil pumps like so many Trojan horses corralled in wire fences made whooshing sounds each time they dipped their heads to suck up another barrel of oil. And inside the sheltered Long Beach Harbor, on tiny man-made rock and earth islands, Oil wells camouflaged to look like high-rise apartment buildings probed the harbor floor for more oil. The fossil fuel had lain in the city's tideland pools for eons of time. The deposit is the third richest oil reservoir known, and from this underwater supply, the city expects to realize approximately 250 million over a 35-year period. There, within the Earth's crust, under the ocean floor, and in Chapter 138, Statutes 1964, first extraordinary session of the state legislature, lay the answer to the city's dilemma over the Queen Mary's purchase. The state legislature prohibits Long Beach from spending a single penny of its share of oil revenue from this offshore oil field for general services. As trustee for the state, Long Beach must use the money for improvements to the waterfront areas, the city's harbor. Could a 31-year-old British ship be considered waterfront development? Without a specific purpose, perhaps not. But Long Beach held a legislative fifth ace in its poker game with the state. The city and the California Museum Foundation had been discussing a six to eight million dollar maritime museum on a triangle of land near the Long Beach Arena. Howard Edgerton, a savings and loan company executive who was then president of the Museum Foundation's board, suggested that portions of the Queen Mary be made into a maritime museum. What better location than a ship for a maritime museum, Edgerton asked. Writings reasoned that since Queen Mary's scrap value was about $2 million, the city could buy the ship for less than it would cost to build the land-based museum under discussion. The next step was to seek the approval of the State Lands Commission the agency that held tight reins on Long Beach's Tideland oil. The commission, based in Sacramento, responded favorably. Even Governor Ronald Reagan endorsed the proposal. In London, Kinnard's announced plans to sell the Queen Mary generated considerable interest. The steamship company received 300 inquiries, at least 100 of which Sir Basil Smallpiece said expressed genuine interest. He was not, of course, including the inquiry from a man in Little Rock, Arkansas, about buying both the Queen Mary and the Queen Elizabeth and welding them together as the world's largest catamaran. The interest in buying the Queen, especially by New York, Miami, and Philadelphia, had Long Beach worried. On the possibility the city might submit a bid for the ship, the whole project was presented to the Long Beach City Council. Nine men, who ranged in age from a 40-year-old optometrist, Dr. Thomas Clark, to a 65-year-old retired businessman, Raymond C. Keeler. The idea was unique, but the councilmen were cautious. Few cities had ever bought a ship, especially a 31-year-old British model that was so big, the city would have to sail it clear around the tip of South America to get it to Long Beach. 
The sales pitch was really up to city manager John Reed Mansell, a stubby, cigar-smoking man who virtually growls when he talks. Mansell said the Queen Mary would become a centerpiece for Long Beach's multi-million dollar shoreline development. Mansell read a detailed six-page report, concluding with, In summary, there is no question in our city staff mind that the Queen Mary will provide the city with an outstanding tourist attraction and present a prudent investment. Edgerton, speaking on behalf of the museum project, commented, The historic Queen Mary is rich in lore of the sea, and a museum, combined with other proposed uses, could make an outstanding tourist attraction for California. The city council agreed to probe further and permit Fire Chief Leonard V. Forrester and the city's building superintendent, Edward M. O'Connor, to go to New York with Ridings and Fulton to make an inspection of the ship. The Queen Mary, they found, was old, shop-worn, and would present many challenges, but they concluded it was entirely feasible to use the Queen Mary as a hotel, convention center, restaurant, and sea museum. The city council voted to bid and authorized a delegation to make the bid in London. Vice Mayor Robert F. Crow, City Attorney Leonard Putnam, Llewellyn Bixby Jr., then newly elected president of the city's Harbor Commission, Clark Hedgens, an attorney, Samuel Cameron, a member of the museum board, Ridings and Fulton, made up the delegation. The question, Fulton said, was how to come up with a realistic bid. In the Hilton Hotel in London, Fulton, Putnam, and Ridings worked out a formula to arrive at a figure that would make a winning bid. We had no magic formula, Fulton said, but we took all the variables, such as the ship's value and scrap in England, the ship's value and scrap in Hong Kong, what New York might pay for the ship as a school, what Miami might pay for her as a hotel. We then analyzed how much the furnishings were worth and came up with a bid. It was more than the $3.2 million the delegation had authority to bid. Fulton telephoned city manager John R. Mansell and told him they'd have to have authority to bid more. Mansell said $3,450,000 was top. Fulton submitted the sealed bid July 24, 1967. Long Beach added a condition to the bid. The city was to have an option to sell a final cruise from England to Long Beach. The delegation had hired a driver in London, a South African named Jim Lindsay. Lindsay, the men suddenly realized, had overheard all the conversations and was probably the most dangerous man in all of England to the negotiating team from Long Beach. What really worried the delegation was that in England, newspapers pay handsomely for hot first-person stories on any subject of current interest. The purchase of the Queen Mary was certainly current interest, and Lindsay had a real story to tell. Lindsay unofficially became part of the Long Beach delegation. He became quite helpful in the long run, Putnam recalled. I'd say he was a good, tenacious negotiator. Lindsay could have straightened a lot of new stories out if the press had known of his first-hand knowledge. The New York Times, London Bureau, filed a story on the Night Wire, July 24th, that New York City, on a bid of $2.5 million, was top bidder. Long Beach wasn't even mentioned in the seven-paragraph story. The United Press International Night Wire indicated that Americans dominated the field in the bidding. Again, playing up New York's bid high in the story, and mixing Long Beach's proposal along with offers from Philadelphia, Miami, and New York in next to the last paragraph of an 11-graph story. The Associated Press filed an even briefer story, mentioning bids from New York and Atlanta, Georgia, but not Long Beach. The prospects appeared grim for Long Beach. Cunard, the Wire report said, was delaying the announcement until July 26 because Cunard was in continuous negotiations with a prospective purchaser. But the sometimes sardonic London Times moaned editorially, It will be the final irony if the Queen Mary ends her days as a floating school for New York children, a funfair spectacle for Californians to gape at and gamble in, or, surely the height of incongruity, a showplace for the products of the American industry, but it looks as if one of these things will happen. Strangely, the Times didn't mention the alternative fate, sending the stately old monarch to the shipbreakers for scrap. Many in Great Britain thought the Queen Mary should have been towed to sea and sunk rather than allowing her to fall into foreign hands. Cunard didn't. 
The steamship company for almost a decade had been losing as much as two million a year on each of the two queens. The behemoths of the seas were too big, too costly, and too old to prosper in seasonal cruising, the defensive measure steamship companies were taking to compete with jet travel. Cruising was a thriving business for smaller ships, but the giant transatlantic liners were too big to maneuver into the exotic harbors on cruise itineraries. Time was running out for the two ocean monarchs. Cunard was trying to recover some of its losses by selling first the Queen Mary, and later the Queen Elizabeth. For all the bidders, Cunard had two stipulations, that the Queen Mary would not be put into service in competition with Cunard, and that the character and dignity of the ship would be maintained if she were kept afloat. Cunard did not want the Queen Mary's honorable past sullied by a questionable future as a floating gambling palace. Only one of the bidders, besides those from the United States, had even suggested anything for her but the scrap heap. Hong Kong shipping magnate C.Y. Tung said he was undecided on whether he'd use her for scrap or convert her into a hotel. London bookmakers, who take the slightest occasion to give odds, were favoring New York's purchase. Eighteen bids were before Cunard when twelve men and one woman gathered around a boardroom table July 26 to decide on the fate of their prized ship. The board members accepted Long Beach's bid of $3,450,000, but final approval rested with the city council, which was called into an emergency session on Friday, September 26th at 4 p.m. The council voted to honor the bid price. The Queen Mary would be home in Long Beach for Christmas. The weary Long Beach delegation returned home without putting so much as a farthing down on the Queen Mary. The bidding was so close, Sir Basil Smallpiece said, but Long Beach's offer was the best of 18 bids considered by the board. It ensures that the character of the Queen Mary will be preserved because of an essential part of the plan to use the Mary as a museum. Malcolm Finister, director of the H.E. Moss & Company shipbrokers in London, revealed the Long Beach bid was only $50,000 over the number two bid submitted by Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The British press called the Long Beach purchase the Great Queen Robbery. New York Democratic Congressman John M. Murphy warned Long Beach at a news conference that it had purchased a floating fire trap. He had opposed New York City's purchase on the same grounds. Mayor Lindsay expressed sorrow over New York's losing to Long Beach. When Governor Reagan received the news that Long Beach had won the bidding, he wrote Mayor Edwin Wade of Long Beach his congratulations, adding, there is no question that the Queen Mary will become a tremendous tourist attraction and that it will bring new visitors and new money to Long Beach in particular and California in general. May I commend you and all the others who worked so imaginatively and diligently to bring this venerable lady of the high seas to California. Governor Reagan's letter was just one of thousands flooding Long Beach City Hall after the news of the purchase was out. Most were congratulatory and some were even applications for employment. Many asking for jobs came from Great Britain, like one from 69-year-old Captain Archibald Cook of Argyllshire, Scotland, who offered his services as captain on McMary's last trip from Southampton to Long Beach, Captain Cook as master of the Queen Mary. William Bolton of Dunbertonshire, Scotland, asked for a job as a plumber aboard. A.S. Woolley, a London postman, sought a job on the ship as a security officer to halt last-minute souvenir snitching. Alan Whitehead and Pat Fox, two former Queen Mary crewmen who had moved to Long Beach, asked for jobs. London cleanser salesman G.F. Samuels wrote to recommend his product indicating his company had supplied the Queen Mary with it in the past to treat her vast timber decks whilst keeping them white, clean, and infection-free. John S. Blake, a 45-year-old retired Navy commander from McLean, Virginia, applied for a job as the Mary's skipper in Long Beach. 16-year-old Nancy Roberts of Garden Grove, California, wrote asking if the Queen Mary had ballroom facilities to accommodate 550 persons. She wanted to rent the ballroom for the May 1968 junior-senior prom for Pacifica High School in Garden Grove. The letters from England all expressed nostalgia over the Queen Mary leaving England, but Mrs. Audrey Walker of Nottingham ended her letter with the comment, She couldn't have gone to a nicer country. The Queen Mary is many things to many people. There has never been another ship like her, 
although exactly what there is about her that makes her so special is hard to define. But ask anyone who has been touched by this mystic Mary, and they'll tell you the magic is surely there. It was this indefinable quality that convinced Long Beach it must exercise its option to sell a last great cruise passage on the Queen Mary from Southampton around Cape Horn to Long Beach, the longest passenger cruise the old ship had ever undertaken. Cunard officials were aghast at the city's decision. They had strongly advised against such a cruise, offering to bring the Queen to Long Beach with only crew members. What's more, two of the world's largest travel agencies rejected the city's offer to handle the booking. Fugazi Travel Bureau of New York snapped up the idea and agreed to put the travel package together, despite the fact that it had less than two months to complete the arrangements, which normally would have required a year of planning. The sale of the Queen Mary marked the passing of an era, and hundreds of American Queen Mary fans urged the city to sell passage on the Great Last Cruise. As a tribute to the Queen Mary, such a sentimental journey had to be made, they argued. In the heat of the tropics, it appeared Cunard was vindicated in its prediction that such a trip was not feasible. But in the final analysis, the Queen Mary could not have gone out of service any other way, and 1,200 people, mostly elderly Californians, who made the last voyage proved it. They lived out the final seagoing days of one of the most legendary ships of all times, a ship that survived a depression, a war, and the scrapyard, a ship that was a floating Taj Mahal, a British ship that carried more Americans than Englishmen, a ship that carried the poorest of the poor and the richest of the rich, a living legend in our times. Her future, now secure in the purchase by Long Beach, will become perhaps even more legendary. But for the oil of Long Beach and a strange California Supreme Court ruling that allows Long Beach to spend its share of revenue from Thailand oil only for harbor development, the ship might have been welded to a Brooklyn, New York pier as a high school, gutted of her beauty and converted into a blackboard jungle. Or worse, the breaker's hammer and the welder's torch might have slashed her steel into scrap to be remolded into Japanese-made toys and Toyotas. She served a better fate. And certainly, she deserved to live on rather than to become scrap steel in a melting pot. This is the story of the legend and lore of the Queen Mary, from the time she was no more than a line on a shipbuilder's blueprint to her last great cruise, and a look into her future when she'll never sail again, but promises to remain Queen of the Queens forever. End of Chapter 1 Chapter 2 Cunard Builds a Queen The story of the Queen Mary begins on a summer day in Nova Scotia in 1831, when a young merchant, Samuel Cunard, stood on the shore at Halifax and watched a stubby 450-ton steamboat named the Royal William chug into port. Cunard, a partner in a shipping business with his father, Abraham, wondered if this steamboat could cross the Atlantic hauling passengers and cargo. He spoke of his idea of an ocean steamer to his father. Abraham, a practical and frugal man, did not share his son's vision. He knew that steam needed fuel, and fuel costs money. Sails needed only the wind. Abraham had other reasons to doubt the potential of steam, which was in the 1830s still greatly untried. The American-built ongoing steamship the Savannah had failed to kindle the enthusiasm of seamen in trials 12 years before. Merchant seamen still thought of steamships as riverboats, Ocean travel of that day was aboard the sleek sailing ships built by the master craftsmen in New England, which could catch a canvas full of wind and be in England in less than a month. American shipbuilders were among the best in the world, and American ships ruled the seas. Samuel Cunard, however, believed in the future of steamships. Three years later, he purchased the Royal William, and on August 18, 1833, he steamed the squat ship from Quebec with a consignment of furniture, an Irish harp, a trunk, and seven passengers. Twenty-three days later, the Royal William steamed into Gravesend, England. Cunard's steamship company was born. Five years later, 
Samuel Cunard convinced the British government that steam was more reliable than sails, and obtained the first steamship contract to carry mail on a promise that his new Royal Mail Steamship Packet Company would provide two voyages a month for mail service between Liverpool, Halifax, and Boston. With the mail contract as collateral, Cunard ordered three steamships to be built. The first, the Britannia, was a paddle-wheel steamer, 270 feet long and 1,156 tons, big enough to carry 115 passengers and 250 tons of cargo. The Britannia began regular Atlantic crossings February 5, 1840, and the world marveled that the steamer crossed in only 14 days and 8 hours. Her boilers consumed 38 tons of coal a day to steam a mere 9 knots. Steam-driven ships had come of age. At last, Great Britain had the ship that could beat the fast Yankee sailing vessels. In the years to come, Cunarders replaced the sail with steam, the wooden hull with iron, the paddle wheel with the screw propeller, and the coal furnace with the turbine. For 90 years, the name Cunard was synonymous with steamship. However, in the late 1920s, it was becoming clear that soon, neither Cunard nor Great Britain would rule the seas. Government subsidized shipping companies in other countries, particularly Germany, were edging in on Great Britain's long control over transatlantic shipping. Germany, struggling to retain her old world posture after World War I, was in a race with France and the Scandinavian countries to build a fleet for Atlantic shipping. Speed was the key. The fastest ship afloat was the Cunard steamship Mauritania, a 37,938-ton vessel that crossed the Atlantic at a record 26.9 knots. The Mauritania held the coveted Blue Ribband, a steamship Oscar for the fastest crossing between Ambrose Lightship off New York and Bishop's Head Lighthouse off Cornwall, England, a distance of some 3,000 miles. The Blue Ribband is just an honorary title, no more than a certified page out of the ship's log documenting the daily speed during the crossing. And although there was no actual blue pennant as such, the Mauritania had claimed the mythical pennant for 21 years, from 1908 to 1929, so long that passengers often insisted that crewmen show them the blue ribband. Sailors would sheepishly point to the dog vane, a small bluish pennant on the mast which indicates the direction of the wind. The Mauritania's speed crossing was done in a record timing of just under five days. Cunard, faced with a high shipbuilding cost in the post-World War I years, had built only five new ships, all of them in the 20,000-ton class, with speeds of only 17 knots. Other European countries were building bigger and faster ships. The North German Lloyd Line had built two ships in the 50,000-ton class, with the Blue Ribbon in mind. The German steamship company had held the Blue Ribbon from 1897 to 1907, when its Kaiser Wilhelm der Gloss was the fastest ship afloat. But in 1907, the Cunarder Lusitania captured the title. The Lusitania's sister ship, the Mauritania, proved to be faster and took the record a year later. But for the intervening war years, the story of the Blue Ribbon might have been different. In 1914, the Germans were making preparations to recapture the speed title, but the war ended all chances of peaceful competition. The Blue Ribbon is more than just an honorary title, however. This keen competition has over the years stimulated progress in naval architecture and marine engineering. Construction of the two German liners was to this aim. The first of the two vessels to be launched was the Bremen, a 900-foot, 51,731-ton vessel which had revolutionary engineering designs such as a rudder shaped like an airplane wing, geared turbines, a bulb bow under the waterline, and a greatly reduced weight factor because the Germans had found a way to maintain boiler pressure at 330 pounds per square inch. On trial runs, she did 26 knots and better. The Bremen sailed from Bremerhaven, Germany on July 17, 1929 to begin her maiden voyage. She was fog-bound in the English Channel for 24 hours, but on the morning of July 18, the fog lifted and the Bremen sailed for New York. Captain Leopold Zeigenbein had orders to make all speed and capture the Blue Ribbon. 
The Bremen arrived in New York on July 22nd. She had shaved 8 hours and 52 minutes off the crossing time, and she has wrested the blue ribbon from the Mauritania. At Fire Island, some 50 miles out of New York, the Bremen also accomplished another first. She catapulted a Junkers W-33C plane from her deck, and 40 minutes later, Baron von Studnitz landed the Junkers in New York and delivered six sacks of mail. This quick mail service, a forerunner of the overseas air mail of today, was just another threat to Cunard. Eastbound mail service from America to Europe might be lost to the German ship if the sea air experiment with mail delivery worked. Oddly, on the day that Bremen arrived in New York, the New York Times printed an editorial saying that air transportation would never be a menace to ocean shipping. And in the same edition, a story told of President Herbert Hoover's plan to eliminate poverty in the United States. In years to come, the Times would be proven wrong. In three months, President Hoover would be proven very wrong. As the Bremen sailed victoriously up the Hudson River that afternoon, Captain Ziegenbahn was handed a wireless message by his radio operator. He opened it, and it read the message, The officers and ship's company of the steamship Mauritania heartily congratulate you on your record passage and wish you every success. Signed, S.G.S. McNeil, Captain, RMS Mauritania. The crew of the Cunarder threw a party that night, honoring the German crew and their victory, but there were no celebrations in England. By less than nine hours, Great Britain had lost her supremacy of the North Atlantic. Cunard had long known it was living on borrowed time, but the news of the Bremen's victory hit the island nation like a shockwave. The London Daily Telegraph moaned, This is a direct blow to national pride. The London Times asked, what is England going to do about her sullied pride? The question was being asked in Parliament, too. The question was already answered by Cunard. Three years before, two of Cunard's naval architects had designed a 1,000-foot superliner and presented plans for the vessel to the steamship company's board of directors. Tight money had held the idea to a mere sketch. The three-year-old plans were dusted off for renewed consideration. The Bremen, meanwhile, sailed on her eastbound voyage and set a new record crossing, four days, 14 hours, and 30 minutes, on August 1, 1929. Five days later, Captain McNeil made a desperate attempt to regain the Blue Ribbon for the Mauritania, and the news wires flashed the amazing news that the aging vessel got up enough steam to average 27.4 knots and traveled 687 miles in one 24-hour period. When she arrived in New York, the Mauritania made a game try, missing the Bremen's westbound record by only four hours and two minutes. Captain McNeil wasn't ready to give up. On August 21st, she finished her crossing line only seven minutes behind the Bremen. She had not broken the Bremen's record, but she'd proved to be a spunky ship, and she'd broken her own records twice. While the Mauritania was straining to get extra nautical miles out of steam, a pilot taxied a Junkers W-33 single-engine seaplane out onto the Elbe River near Dessau, Germany, August 9th, to try an experiment that would one day shrink the world. The pilot throttled back the engine and fired two groups of rocket charges attached under each wing. The aircraft was literally shot into the air. In 1929, jet propulsion was beginning. Jet propulsion, or even the loss of a steamship speed record, hardly even caused a second notice in the United States. The Bremen's victory didn't even rate a paragraph's notice in either of the two daily newspapers serving Long Beach, California. The New York Times was one of the few newspapers in the United States that gave any more than routine notice. Newspapers in America were busy chronicling the last reckless days of the Roaring Twenties. The United States that summer of 1929 was hell-bent toward Black Friday, October 23rd, when the nation's economy was strangled in a mire of Wall Street ticker tape. In England, the Cunard Steamship Company was facing its own survival test. It had to either accept or reject the challenge of having the fastest ship on the seas. Conservative members of the Cunard board, including its chairman Sir Thomas Royden, argued that it was a bad time to build a big ship. With the recent new speeds the Mauritania had been able to achieve, the Conservatives wanted to overhaul and remodel the old ship for its speed challenge. But 
Was not this Samuel Cunard's company? And was he not the man who seized a dream and built an empire on a puff of steam? And wasn't the Cunard company recognized as the giant of the steamship industry? Would Samuel Cunard, if he had lived until this day, have remodeled an old ship? Or would he have built a new Challenger? One board member thought that he would have built the Challenger. Sir Percy Bates rummaged through a worn leather briefcase until he retrieved a tattered piece of paper. He asked Sir Royden if he could have permission to read from the paper. He rose and read a statement made almost 50 years before by John Burns, who was chairman of the Cunard Lines when the Etruria was launched in 1884. Burns was answering critics when he said, There is no courage in entering upon great enterprises in prosperous times, but I have faith in the future and confidence that the Cunard Company will hold its own upon the Atlantic. The Etruria had been a successful ship. Silence fell over the boardroom until someone called for a vote. Before the board session ended, it was decided not only to build one superliner, but two, which would work in pairs in a weekly shuttle service between the United States and England, fulfilling the prophecy that Samuel Cunard wrote in his diary almost a hundred years before. Steam-driven ships, properly built and manned, can be established on the North Atlantic trade route within measurable time, and could start and arrive with the punctuality of railroad trains. The French had already announced that they would build a giant ship, which would be bigger and faster than the Bremen. This announcement gave more urgency to Cunard's task. Great Britain is a small island nation, isolated from the European continent by the English Channel, which is at its widest 140 miles and at its narrowest 20 miles yet a gulf wide enough to make England dependent on her empire to survive. Supremacy of the seas, not only militarily, but also with a merchant fleet, was an absolute necessity. Such a dependency made England subject to every economic shadow that fell over the world. The shadow was there in 1929 when Kennard officials ordered the go-ahead on plans for the first of the two superliners. The American Depression had begun and both England and France, since 1923, had been sagging under the weight of inflation. The whole world, it seemed after World War I, was in a spendthrift mood. American investments in European countries had pumped money into Europe. In fact, American money had built the Bremen and her sister ship Europa. With the Depression sapping the United States, this money was dried up, and nations like Germany were feeling the squeeze. On May 28, 1930, with the United States deep in the Depression, Cunard announced that John Brown Shipyard in Clydebank, Scotland, would build the new 1,000-foot Cunarder. The ship was designated as Job 534. Because of the ship's revolutionary design, John Brown's engineers built a special 500-foot tank and began experimenting with ship models. Inside the test tank, engineers simulated every type of North Atlantic weather, and conducted more than 8,000 experiments with prototypes before selecting the final design, a 17-foot, 800-pound self-propelled model. This model was sent up and down the make-believe North Atlantic through every conceivable type of weather and wave for more than 1,000 miles. The model was designed with a massive hull, a knife-like sloping stem, a rounded, almost flat stern, and three raked funnels. In late November 1930, the final trial runs of this miniature superliner were made. The Cunard Steamship Company liked what it saw and accepted the design. The Steamship Company awarded John Brown Shipyard a $30 million contract on December 1, 1930, to build Job 534. Ten days later, workers laid the keel and began building the biggest ship that the Clyde River folk had ever seen. But it wasn't the biggest in the world. Across the English Channel at St. Nazaire's shipyard in France, an even larger vessel was taking shape. There were other happenings in the world that would have a direct bearing on the ship under construction in Clydebank. In Germany, the obscure National Socialistic German Workers' Party had elected a man named Adolf Hitler as its propaganda minister. Japan was sparring with China over Manchuria. In the United States, banks were padlocked and bread lines were forming as the Depression spread. In Long Beach, California, that depression had halted construction work on a rock breakwater to enclose the city's harbor. 
One of the engineers on that Long Beach Breakwater project was a young man named Charles Vickers. He had never heard of Job 534 in Clydebank, Scotland. But 38 years later, Vickers, as general manager of the Long Beach Harbor Department, was to plan how Job 534, the Queen Mary, would come through that breakwater to her final resting place as a California landmark. Before this could happen, however, the ship under construction in Clydebank, Scotland, would have to survive a depression, a war, and the breaker's hammer. The ship, resembling Noah's Ark as workmen fashioned the hull from steel ribs and welded into place huge steel plates, had so far avoided the depression deluge. Work went full ahead night and day in Clydebank and in machine shops all over the British Isles. Parts of the vessel were being constructed in Manchester, Sheffield, and Leeds, and a dozen more towns. In Manchester, for example, a shop was turning out the ship's giant main reduction gears, 14 feet in diameter. Each gear was made of two steel drums, three feet thick, and with 433 teeth cut obliquely across their circumference by a machine that worked around the clock. By November 1931, the construction was progressing ahead of schedule. Cunard announced that the ship would be launched in May 1932. Immediately, rumors spread that this ship and her sister ship would be named for the two granddaughters of King George V and Queen Mary. Job 534 would be named after the elder princess, Elizabeth. The old Maritimers scoffed at the rumor. Hadn't Cunard always named his ships with the ending Ia? A fetish because he was born in Nova Scotia. They were betting on a queen's name, Queen Victoria. But this was not Queen Victoria's time when the pound sterling was the most sound currency in the world. This was 1931, and the world was running scared. Great Britain, already weakened by the cost of the greatest war in her history, began to slump under the weight of the pound sterling, which was now replacing the dollar and propping up the world's sagging economy. Cunard was in a financial crisis. The company was nearly broke, and construction of the great ship at Clydebank was sapping what little profits they had made. Although steamship fares had been cut nearly in half, the Depression had halted American tourists from traveling to Europe, and few Europeans were traveling to America. Cunard's annual report in 1931 showed a net profit of only $90,000 as compared to $4 million the year before. Walter Runciman, chairman of the White Star Line, Cunard's chief competitor, had urged that Cunard merge with White Star or buy out the company. Runciman was a proud man, but White Star was in so much trouble, he was willing to plead that Cunard purchase the line. Cunard's directors turned down the offer for the third and final time. Runciman, having failed in what he felt was White Star's only chance to survive, resigned as a trustee and accepted a government cabinet post as president of the powerful Board of Trade. World conditions were at their worst. Germany was on the verge of revolt. Japan was buying scrap steel from all over the world and pounding it into armament. The fascists in Italy were turning an old ally into a foe. There was widespread unemployment throughout the world, and nations were growing more inward. The consequence was international distrust, and nations began establishing tariff walls to protect themselves, a disaster for dependent Great Britain. Unemployment resulted in England and the Depression tidal wave finally swamped the tight little island kingdom. Cunard directors reached a decision. Job 534 would have to be scrapped. On the morning of December 10, 1931, Cunard shareholders received a special post, a long, rambling letter from H.J. Fluitt, a secretary of the board for Cunard Steamship Company of Liverpool, England. It began, The impact of the national crisis on the Cunard Company renders it advisable, and went on for paragraph after paragraph before it reached the point, to suspend the construction of number 534, pending some change in prospects. At noon the next day, the John Brown shipyard whistle blew and 3,000 men lined up before pay windows to draw their last checks. Decembers are dark, dank, and dreary in the English Isles, but that December was the blackest the Scots could remember. For some reason, all big layoffs, or the folding of giant companies, seemed to be timed just before Christmas. And so it was in Clydebank, Scotland, as work stopped on the giant ship one year to the day that the keel was laid. Proud Scott craftsmen were on the dole. 
Sir Percy Bates, the man who had risen to express faith in Cunard's future and insist on building Job 534, was now the board chairman. The 51-year-old chairman was on the spot. He insisted the company was right in going ahead with construction and assured England the ship would be finished. In his mail daily were hundreds of letters containing small contributions from the English, who asked nothing in return but to finish the liner. There was concern that the bulk weight of the liner, which lay like a giant beached whale in a timber cradle on the mud banks of the Clyde River, would sink this unfinished skyscraper of the sea into the soft marshland on which the shipyard was built. She stood eight decks high as a rusting monument to the ravages of the Depression. There was talk of cutting up the giant hull at John Brown's yard to make two smaller ships for Cunard. There were suggestions that the government subsidize the completion of the liner. The suggestion came before Walter Runciman, then president of the Board of Trade, and the man who had humbled himself to ask Cunard to purchase White Star Line. Runciman appeared before the House of Commons and gave his answer. Direct government assistance is out of the question. Prime Minister James Ramsay MacDonald, Great Britain's first Labour Party PM, also told the House of Commons there was no basis for a government loan, but the unemployment situation in England and elsewhere in the British Isles was getting more desperate each day. The London Daily Mail offered £50,000 as a loan to Cunard to finish the liner. Rumors that the ship's construction would resume kept the hopes buoyed along the Clyde. Time dragged on, and Job 534 was no more than a hulk that cast a dark shadow over the squalor of tenements jabbed against the shipyard. In 1933, as Cunard was celebrating its 93rd anniversary, Neville Chamberlain, Great Britain's Chancellor of the Exchequer, called the paralyzed construction of the ship a national calamity, and pleaded for a government subsidy and loan to resume the work. The world situation and unemployment at home called for the government action. In the United States, a new political rising star, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, had been elected president and was promising great social reforms to get the country moving again. One of the projects that got the country moving again was a proposal by New York City to build a midtown tunnel under the Hudson River. Cunard officials in New York protested the tunnel idea, claiming that if the superliner at Clyde Bank were finished, her draft would endanger the tunnel. The protest was ignored. Germany was moving too but not in a direction that England liked. Adolf Hitler, in 1933, had been named Chancellor, and his fanatical followers of the Nazi party were in a drive for power that would one day engulf the whole world, and oddly, have an effect on the marooned Job 534. The ship construction had been idled for two and a half years, but the momentum of hobnailed boots goose-stepping in Germany and the unrest at home decided the British government to step in and subsidize the construction of Job 534. Runciman had got his pound of flesh. Cunard was forced to merge with the White Star Line as a condition of government help. Chamberlain appeared before the House of Commons December 14, 1933, and announced that the government intended to help finance Job 534, and that Cunard and White Star Lines were merging. His announcement was warmly cheered, but Labour MP Neil McLean leapt to his feet and demanded that if the government subsidized the liner construction, the people should have control over the ship. His demand went no further. In the merger, both Kinnard and White Star would sell their properties, including the unfinished ship at Clyde Bank, to the new company, to be called Kinnard White Star Company. Kinnard was the stronger of the two companies, with 15 ships in service, and so Kinnard shareholders got 62 shares of the new company, while White Star shareholders got only 38. Chamberlain argued that the merger was unusual, but circumstances surrounding the merger are unusual and the results achieved were the justification. The merger, he said, would put an end to the ruinous competition of two great companies for much of the diminishing North Atlantic trade and help to restore Great Britain to maritime prestige. The people at Clyde Bank were jubilant. An old housewife, mopping her tears with an apron, said, This is the best Christmas gift that the Clyde folk could have received. But construction would not start in time for Christmas. There were long delays in getting government papers signed, and it wasn't until April 3, 1934, that work actually began, and then for only a token of the laid-off workers. Led by bagpipers with fluttering kilts, 400 men marched down cobblestone streets to the shipyard. The pipes were playing, The Campbells Are Coming, 
but the workers and the townspeople were singing different words to that tune, the Cunarders restarting. As the workers marched to the yard behind a triumphant scroll of bagpipes, there were cheers and tears from those who stood on the sidelines. The Scots, by nature, are not an expressive people, but that day was different. A full lunch bucket and full paycheck were something to be emotional about. Workmen had to use burlap sacks which they swung over their heads to frighten thousands of nesting rooks which had taken roost in the ship's forms. A rook is a corvine-type bird that resembles the American crow in both size and color. The rooks weren't all that was in the ship's nooks. Workmen also had to scrape 130 tons of rust off the ship's unfinished hull. Work on the French liner had never stopped. The French government had immediately stepped in and saved the ship. She had been launched October 29, 1932, and named for the French province Normandy. The ship was so large, 86,496 tons and 1,029 feet long, that she was launched on the day simply because it was one of the two days a year that the tides at St. Nazaire were high enough to float the mammoth ship. When the workmen started rebuilding the Job 534, the Normandy was being fitted for her maiden voyage. Within weeks after Sir Thomas Bell, chairman of the board at John Brown Shipyard, ordered work on number 534 to be restarted, 3,800 men swarmed over the ship working day and night shifts to complete the vessel. Inspectors had gone over every inch of the vessel to make sure years of idleness had not damaged the ship. The Clyde side echoed with the clatter of hammers, the screech of cranes, and the rat-a-tat-tat of rivet machines. But to those who lived in the dreary, drab little cottages at Clydebank, the crescendo of hammering was a symphony. Ten days after work began, the Prince of Wales made a surprise visit to John Brown's yard to inspect the work. He insisted on going 200 feet up in a riveter's cage to watch the placing of beams in the superstructure. To the surprise of his escort, the prince walked out of the wire cage over the vast expanse of A-deck to peer over the side to watch work below through the network of girders. His host breathed a little easier when he started down in the lift, but halfway down he ordered a halt and climbed out among the lower framework, dodging hot rivets falling from above. The prince, on his way to an exhibition of Scottish Boy Scouts, was smiling broadly when he came to ground level again. She will be a wonderful ship, he predicted, and rushed off to visit with the Boy Scouts. All over England, men and equipment were putting together the final pieces of the ship in Clydebank. The rudder, weighing 140 tons with doors in the side to enable it to be inspected internally whenever the ship was in dry dock, was being fashioned in England. So were four bronze propellers that weighed 35 tons each. Even the cabins were constructed ashore and then fitted into place. All told, 200 firms and 250,000 people were involved directly or indirectly in her construction. And in six months, after the 400 workmen marched back to the yard, Job 534 was ready for launching. She had, as yet, no name. The speculators were saying Job 534 would be named Britannia after Cunard's first ship, or Queen Victoria. It was a cinch, the story goes, that Cunard would not change its 94-year tradition by giving this ship a name not ending in Ia. There is a legend attached to the actual naming that goes like this. Cunard wanted to keep the Ia tradition by naming the ship in honor of Queen Victoria. Crown permission was needed to name a ship for a monarch, living or dead, and therefore a Cunard representative approached King George V. And in that unique British manner of couching questions in indirect statements, said to the king, Your Majesty, we would like to name Job 534 after England's most illustrious queen. King George, or so the legend goes, replied, I think that would be splendid. I'll ask Her Majesty's permission. Thus, the legend concludes, Job 534 was named after the living monarch, Queen Mary, George's wife. The legend is still around, but Cunard's public relations chief, Douglas Lobley, says, Poppycock, that story has been around for years, but it simply is someone's own invention, probably that of a journalist in need of a story. I've heard at least a dozen versions of the same story. The truth, Lobley contends, is that Cunard was anxious to get away from the Ia endings for its ships. And after all, the board now had White Star to contend with, and the White Star ships all ended with Ick. 
Giving credence to the legend, however, are newspaper reports both here in the United States and in England that everyone thought the ship would be named Queen Victoria, and the name Queen Mary came as a surprise. The name was kept secret until the Queen herself said the words September 26, 1934, as she christened the ship. If Queen Mary's full name had been used, Victoria would have been part of the name, but Victoria, Mary, Augusta, Louisa, Olga, Claudine, Agnes would have been difficult to fit on the bow plate, even for a ship the size of Job 534. As it turned out, the name Queen Mary was itself a bit of trouble for Cunard. Another ship, a 900-ton, 70-foot Scottish excursion vessel that was plowing up and down the Clyde estuary at 19 knots and within a short distance of that mammoth ship at John Brown's yard, was already registered Queen Mary, and the stubborn Scott owner wasn't about to give up the name. With some persuasion, he finally agreed to compromise and renamed his craft Queen Mary II. As the day of the launch approached, the Clyde River had to be deepened and widened at the mouth of the River Cart, a tributary of the Clyde, where the stern would come to rest. Town officials closed the shore road for fear that when the ship came down into the river, a rush of water would go over the banks. Drag chains weighing 2,350 pounds were fashioned over the ship's side to slow her descent into the river. School children were informed that they would have a holiday to watch the launch, and workmen got four tickets for family and friends in their pay envelopes. Job 534, a ship almost scuttled and scrapped before she reached her element, was ready to be launched. End of Chapter 2 Chapter 3 the launching of a queen. Sir Thomas Bell stood at the window of his John Brown shipyard office, watching the rows of cranes hovering over Job 534 quiver in the 65-mile-an-hour wind that swept up the Clyde overnight in the wake of an Atlantic squall. He wondered to himself if Job 534 was not jinxed. The unfinished iron ship lay in a timber cradle waiting to be launched on the next afternoon, September 26, 1934 by the hand of Her Majesty Queen Mary. Here it is, just 24 hours before the launch, and foul weather threatened another delay. Sir Thomas, as director of the yard, knew that the decision to cancel or go ahead with the launch was his to make. He started toward the telephone to ring up Cunard's Liverpool office and suggest that the king be notified the winds were too strong to proceed with the launching. The shipbuilder gripped the telephone, lifted the receiver, then slowly put it back to its cradle. He decided to chance a change in the weather. It was risky business making such a decision, because the royal party would have to come from London, and if the launching were postponed at the last minute, they would need enough time themselves to cancel the elaborate arrangements that accompany a king and queen when they travel. At dawn the next day, Sir Thomas was sure he had guessed right. The day was cold, damp, and gray, but the winds had subsided. Before mid-morning, however, the gray skies let loose a torrential rain. Despite the downpour, the ceremony now had to go ahead. Some 300 carpenters worked through the morning in the drenching rain to clear the shoring under the massive 50,000-ton hull. With their hammers swinging in unison, they rammed home countless finely tapered wedges that lifted the hull a fraction of an inch above the position in which she had been built. When there was no doubt the ship was resting firmly and ready to descend into the river, six triggers that would release the wedges were installed. Shipyard superintendent William Leon then carefully cocked the triggers. With a light touch of her hand on the release button, Queen Mary would electrically fire the triggers simultaneously to start the ship sliding toward the river. Once the ship was ready to slide, workmen plastered a 10-foot-wide swath of soft soap and tallow to the full length of the ship at the waterline, 1,004 feet. Other workers were placing the drag chains over the ship's massive sides. In all, there were 2,530 tons of chains, one end clamped to the hull and the other coiled like a snake on the launching pad. These drag chains would act as brakes, slowing down the ship's descent into the river. She was now ready to be launched. This was the moment the famous lowland Scott shipbuilders had been working toward. 
thousands of spectators from all over the British Isles were arriving to the congested, dirty, old riverbank town of Clydebank. 30,000 had tickets to cross through the weathered, white wooden gates at John Brown's shipyard to gather at the base of the world's finest ship and stare up at her steep steel cliffs rising nine stories high. Across the river, 1,500 lined the decks of the liner Tuscania, moored close enough to give a good view of the launch, and thousands more were standing in the abandoned shipyard across the river and in a farmer's field along the high banks on the other side of the river. It was a proud day for Clydebank. The city provost boasted that 250,000 people had come from outside of Clydebank to witness the launching. Of all these thousands, only a half dozen actually knew that Queen Mary would give her name to the ship. The Queen, accompanied by King George V and their elder son, the Prince of Wales, arrived by motor car from Glasgow. Both King George and the Prince were dressed in naval uniforms. The government had banned all aircraft flights for miles around for fear the noise of the airplane engines would drown out the ceremonies which were to be broadcast live around the world. A rare treat to the owner of a wireless set. George Blake, the British Broadcasting Company commentator, was already giving a description of the crowds when the royal family arrived. He was struck by the number of people who had braved the rain squall to witness the launching. The multitude huddled under the umbrellas, he said, looked like so many black stones on a beach. Looking up at the massive structure in front of him, he described the ship thusly. It is as if I were facing a great white cliff, terrific and overwhelming. The monarchs were escorted to a covered balcony draped in a royal red velvet bunting, sitting on spider-like legs of steel piping and overlooking the crowd assembled on the starboard side of the ship. Below stood a democratic mixture of English gentry and Scottish workmen in grimy overalls, and in one simple gesture of respect for the crown heads, the spectators folded away their umbrellas and removed their headgear and stood silently in the drenching rain. Queen Mary greeted the crowd with a wave of her hand and then stepped back to listen while the Prince of Wales described to her the construction of the ship from information he learned when he had visited the yard. King George moved to the podium and spoke to the assembled people of ships, of the sea, of England, and the men from England who go down to sea in ships. It was a poignant speech from a man who loved the sea. He said in part, as a sailor, I have deep pleasure in coming here today to watch the launching by the Queen of this great and beautiful ship. We come to the happy task of sending on her way the stateliest ship now in being. It has been the nation's will that she be completed, and today we can send her forth no longer a number on the books, but a ship with a name in the world, alive with beauty, energy, and strength. Samuel Kinnard built his ships to carry the mail between the two English-speaking countries. This one is built to carry the people of the two lands in great numbers to and fro, so that they may learn to understand each other. May she, in her career, bear many thousands of each race to visit the other as students and to return as friends. He concluded with, We send her to her element with the good will of all nations, as a mark of our hope in the future, she has been built in fellowship among ourselves. May her life among great waters spread friendship among nations. As the king finished his speech, he turned and left the podium, leaving behind the neatly typed copy of his five-minute speech. A Cunard aide meticulously gathered up the pages of the speech. He was so impressed by the speech that he later suggested, and his suggestion was accepted, that the speech be framed behind glass and installed on the ship. The speech was mounted on the bulkhead, on the starboard side of the promenade deck at the entrance to the main lounge, when the ship's appointments were completed, and there it remained. However, during his speech, the king did not once hint that the ship would be named in honor of his wife, Queen Mary. The name of the ship was a well-kept secret, so much so that not even Great Britain's poet Laureate John Massfield knew what it would be when he wrote his seven stanzas to number 534. The poem, even today, is known as number 534. The poet read his poem at the launching, 
concluding with these prophetic lines. May shipwreck and collision, fog and fire, rock, shoal, and other evils of the sea be kept from you. And may the heart's desire of those who speed your launching come to be. Number 534 was now ready to be launched. The ceremony moved from the covered balcony to the glass-enclosed launching platform facing the knife-like bow of the giant ship. Standing clustered inside the room were the people whose lives would shape the future of the ship. King George V would die before the ship would sail. The young prince standing beside him would become Edward VIII, a king who reigned less than a year and was never crowned. Neville Chamberlain, who would become the prime minister, but failed to bring his promise of peace in our times, and would be replaced by the man standing nearest to him, Winston Churchill, who of all those there would come to love this ship the best. The Queen, dressed in a coat of a rich dark sapphire hue, with a collar of fox dyed deep blue, was the first member of the British royal family to launch a merchantman. She was a bit nervous and asked to be coached in her task, the whispered instructions to her were clearly heard over the broadcast of the launching. With all in readiness, she snipped the satin cord holding a bottle of Australian white wine and sending it crashing against the bow plate of the ship. She uttered these words, I am happy to name this ship Queen Mary. An audible gasp followed quickly by an outburst of cheers went up from the crowd. King George bent over in laughter as he watched a press photographer soaked with wine scramble for cover. The queen paused for the cheering, then said, I wish success to her and to all who sail in her. Sir Percy Bates next instructed her to push the button, firing the triggers and setting the ship in motion. Was that right? She whispered. Sir Percy nodded. The whole Clyde side was silent. The timbers creaked, but the great ship made only a barely perceptible movement. This moment had governed the minds of the shipbuilders from the day the keel was laid. Now, they wondered, had she lain too long in the timber way? Had she frozen to the way during those idle years? No, not this ship. She had been given the name of a queen, and, like a queen, she descended slowly and gracefully. Fifty-four seconds later, she came to rest in the river, 1,196 feet away, and exactly as plotted by the shipyard engineers. Hardly had she bobbed in the water than she was taken in tow immediately by seven tugs. She was the heaviest ship ever launched on the Clyde, in fact, the heaviest ever launched anywhere in the British Isles, so it was expected that she would create a near tidal wave. In anticipation, authorities had closed Shore Road on the opposite riverbank for fear the launching would swamp the roadway. Actually, the ship settled rather gently in the muddy river held back from a bigger splash by the tons of drag chains. She did slosh the water over the banks of the Clyde and wet the feet of hay farmers in fields a half mile away. The English called this ship the Pride of England, a statement that irked the proud Scots. To counter the claim, the dry-humored Scots made up a limerick which panned the English claim. Ne'er you forget that this ship you English call the English Pride, t'was built by the Scots. Of the Clyde. This flat-topped Queen Mary, as she floated downriver to a fitting basin, was truly the pride of the Scots. The king and queen recognized this when they went to greet six of the workers who helped build her and who had worked for John Brown Shipyard for fifty years. The king paid homage to their craftsmanship by saying, A part of you goes with this ship. And a part of James Dunsmere, an engineer, John Reavy, a brass finisher, John Connolly, a boiler maker, David Mitchcutchian, a shipwright, James Thompson, a plater, and James Martin, a riveter, remained with the Queen Mary all her days as exemplified by her strength, her beauty, and her stability. No higher tribute to craftsmanship could be made. In the months that lay ahead at Clydebank, this shell of hand-wrought steel, held together by ten million rivets, was converted into a luxury liner. When she was finally fitted with her engines, her three funnels, her swimming pool, her boilers, 
her electrical equipment, her woods, her metals, stones, and sailing equipment. She weighed 81,237 tons. Less than France's Normandy, but nearly double the tonnage of Germany's Bremen. She had 12 decks, reaching as high as the hand on the Statue of Liberty. Her first-class dining salon was so large that Cunard's first steamship, the 207-foot-long Britannia, along with Columbus's whole fleet, the Nina, Pinta, and Santa Maria, could fit inside with enough room to spare to comfortably accommodate for dinner the 800 first-class passengers. When the forward funnel was installed, it towered 15 feet higher than Niagara Falls. It is so large that three train locomotives abreast could pass through it. The three funnels, elliptical in shape, measure 36 feet fore and aft by 23 feet four inches across and are graduated in height. The forward funnel stands 70 feet six inches tall, the middle funnel 67 feet six inches, and the after funnel 62 feet three inches. From the keel to the top of the forward funnel measures 181 feet. Workmen installed 15 tons of stainless steel in her kitchens. 4,000 miles of cables went into her electrical system. Six miles of carpeting were laid in her inside decks, and 13 miles of fabric were needed for curtains, draperies, and chair coverings. The main lounge, a lofty room unsurpassed in beauty even today, is 96 feet long and 70 feet wide, almost the girth of the ship, and has a 22-foot ceiling. Inside the room are seven fireplaces with onyx mantelpieces. Perhaps the finest touch of all is her wooden paneling. 56 of the world's rarest woods, representing each of the colonies under British rule at the time the Queen Mary was built, were cut into thin sheets of veneer and delicately laid over the steel interior like caviar spread over a cracker. It took 18 months, fully as long as the actual construction of the outer shell, to finish the interior work. On March 7, 1936, she was ready for a new monarch, King Edward VIII, who had visited her twice before as the Prince of Wales, to inspect. King George V had died in January. The new king strolled from the engine room to the crow's nest of the ship, insisting that he be allowed to climb the 110 steps and peer out onto the deck, 130 feet below. As he scanned the horizon, King Edward spied the smoke of Glasgow's industrial slum district and decided he'd tour that sooty section of the otherwise beautiful city of Glasgow. The tour, and his subsequent statement after seeing the squalor and poverty that something would be done, earned him the title of the Pink Monarch. He was not pink, but rightly concerned as a king for his subjects. He knew there was a danger in a country with hungry people at one extreme and a newly outfitted luxury liner on the other. There were other events that concerned him too at that late hour in 1936. Hitler's stormtroopers were sweeping through the Rhineland. Abyssinian Emperor Hale Selassie, had exiled himself in the face of invading Italian fascist troopers, and the Spanish Civil War had Spain in flames. The world was teetering on the brink of hell. Amidst the apprehension of the times, the luxurious ship at Clydebank turned over her engines for the first time, while still fast to the fitting basin dock in a test to determine if the four turbines were in operating condition and if the four 35-ton bronze propellers would react properly to speed commands. She was ready to sail on her own, and on March 22nd, 1936, she began her long trek downriver en route to Southampton, England. At her helm was Sir Edgar Britton, a Cunard Commodore and her newly named skipper. He was immediately impressed with the ease of handling of this great ship, the biggest in size and tonnage that Sir Britton had ever mastered. As she eased down river, Alexander Gray, an electrician at a Glasgow factory, stood watching. She's immense, he thought. Bigger than I thought. She should have been named Queen Mary because she is simply majestic. Gray would not see her again until 1942, when he boarded her on the Clyde to make emergency electrical repairs. 
Then, she was no longer the majestic black, red, and white luxury liner he had seen in 1936, but a drab gray lady of war, a troop ship. He'd see her once again as she steamed into Long Beach, California, where he'd moved to years later. Gray was among thousands who watched as the Queen Mary sailed down the Clyde for the first time. They cheered her passing. The Clyde, until 1773, was mainly a small boat river because of its numerous shoals and mudflats. In places, the river was only 15 feet deep, at low water, and it wasn't until dredging started in the 1900s that the low water depth of 26 feet was maintained, making the river navigable for larger ships. The river drains 1,481 square miles from the highland headwaters where it drops from an elevation of 560 feet down to 200 feet in less than four miles. Even with her dredged channels, the Clyde River proved too small for the Queen Mary's 39-foot draft. She was grounded twice in the mud and didn't reach the Firth of the Clyde until March 25th. Two days later, she sailed into Southampton waters, where workmen had only recently completed the dredging of the world's largest and deepest dry dock, the King George V Graving Dock. Gordon Holman, a journalist for the London Evening Standard, recalled the event. Nothing could have been more vivid in all the memories of the Queen Mary than her first appearance in the waters of Southampton. At Calshot, I watched her enter the Solent from the east her three giant funnels seeming to rise higher than the Isle of Wight. Oddly, at that moment, the German liner Bremen was sailing down the Solent, bound for New York. When she sighted the new queen, she sounded her siren in salute. The deeper, stronger-throated Queen Mary answered. Then the ships glided past each other, disappearing in a curtain of rain. The Queen Mary went immediately into dry dock for the last-minute checks against leaks and damage before her maiden voyage. While at Southampton, her final luxury appointments were added. Her artworks, murals, paintings, and metal and marble sculptures done by 30 artists from the United States and Great Britain. She was turned into a floating art gallery. Tom Webster, the famous sports cartoonist, finished his mural of 90 famous sporting figures, including American boxers Jack Dempsey and Joe Lewis, for the Sun Deck Gymnasium. Philip Connard painted the largest panel, 26 by 14 feet, of Merry England, showing coaching, fishing, painting, sailing, and other pursuits of the wealthy, to be hung in the main dining room. Doris Zinkaisen painted a mural for the Veranda Grill, which measured more than 1,000 feet. Her sister Anna did panels for the main lounge. Kenneth Shoesmith, England's best-known poster artist in the late 1930s, painted panels in the tourist class library and the altarpieces for the Roman Catholic Chapel, located in a fold-out wall in the sitting room on the promenade deck. Charles Pears painted the old Mauritania arriving at the shipbreakers at Rost. There were paintings of peaceful English landscapes, circus scenes, Chinese dancers, flowers, topless maidens, but Duncan Grant's mural of two naked men was considered too bizarre and was rejected. So was the portrait of a sweet-stained Scottish riveter working on the Queen Mary at Clydebank, because it was too industrial for a luxury ship. Rebel Stanton even created a new art medium for the Queen Mary. He sculptured a bas-relief of a nude woman for the tourist lounge on A-deck, of sun-deck hardwood fixed to a plywood panel and surfaced with nickel to a depth of 0.025 inches. He described the work as in the nature of an experiment, an experiment that was startlingly beautiful and surpassed all his expectations. Other sculptors used wood, metal, stone, and plaster to depict maritime history, English history, man's contest for speed on the water, and even the light, frivolous modernality of the day. The huge bronze doors leading to the main dining room were done by Walter and Donald Gilbert, who had to wait until Philip Connard finished his soft buff and gray-blue pastel mural of Merry England, because the doors had to be made to fit into the blank space left by Connard in the mural. The Cunard Company had designed a 30-foot, 24-foot wide, and 13-foot high bas-relief map of the North Atlantic 
and installed the map on the wall in the first class restaurant. Sailing across the face of the map was an illuminated miniature Mary, which was electrically guided to indicate to passengers the exact position of the liner during every stage of the voyage. Just outside of the first class dining room is located the mammoth swimming pool, which resembles a sunken Grecian bath. Kinnard placed artificial palm trees along the edges of the pool, which were lightly stirred by breezes from hidden fans. The floating city was ready for her luxury years, but she needed a trial run to make sure her precision engines functioned as the engineers said they would. With Commodore Britain at her helm, she moved out the Solent April 15, 1936, for four days of sea trials. She was able to get to speeds up to 32.84 knots, but she also had minor engineering flaws. Cunard ordered these corrected, causing a slight delay in the planned maiden voyage of the ship. In New York, the delay was welcomed. Pier 90 on the North River, built especially for the Queen Mary's 1,000-foot length, wasn't completed. By mid-May, the engineering flaws had been corrected, and the steamship company announced that her maiden voyage would begin May 27th. Two days before the sailing, Queen Mary, now England's Queen Mother, escorted by her son, King Edward VIII, the Bachelor Monarch, journeyed to Southampton to present the ship named in her honor, with a three-foot by one-and-a-half-foot silk replica of her personal standard. The Queen's flag was encased in glass, and in a brief ceremony was hung underneath the bas-relief sculptured marble bust of Queen Mary, a sculptured portrait done by Lady Hilton Young. King Edward, watching the hanging ceremony from the staircase in the Piccadilly Circus shopping center on promenade deck, chuckled as he studied the sculpture. <laughs> My, what a stern scowl Mother has. At the flag presentation, King Edward was in an unusually jovial mood, and took a seven-mile jaunt around the ship, inspecting every portion, even to the point of laying a half-crown coin on the engine mounts to test their vibration. When he came to the dog kennels on the sports deck, King Edward quipped, and not even a lamppost. One was immediately installed. Also in the royal party that day were the Duke and Duchess of York with their daughters Princess Elizabeth and Margaret Rose. The two princesses tried out the slide in the children's playroom, and thus it became known as the Royal Slide. George, the Duke of York, had little idea that within seven months, upon the abdication of his older brother, Edward, he'd become King of England, nor that his daughter, Elizabeth, romping around the Queen Mary's decks, would become Queen of England on his death in 1952. But there were many changes awaiting England and the world that were not too evident in 1936, changes that would have a more profound effect on the monarch of England than even the king's abdication to marry the woman he loved. Hitler was already moving the world toward war, but then even he was looked upon as a man who wanted only to rebuild Germany. One of his prized accomplishments was the construction of the Zeppelin, Hindenburg. Shortly before the Queen Mary's maiden voyage, the Hindenburg had successfully completed her 4,400-mile flight across the Atlantic in 61 and a half hours, landing safely in Lakehurst, New Jersey. In New York City, a flying buff and World War I aviator, Kenneth P. Baer, wrangled a last-minute seat on the Hindenburg for the Zeppelin's May 14th return flight to Frankfurt, Germany. When Baer reached Germany, he didn't like what he saw. Soldiers were goose-stepping in every block, Baer recalled. All of Germany was an armed camp, and the Nazis were suspicious of all foreigners. I smelled war and left right away for Paris. In Paris, Bear read an item in the Paris edition of the New York Herald Tribune that a new ship, the RMS Queen Mary, was sailing on her maiden voyage for New York. Bear, an amazingly resourceful man, wrangled a last-minute ticket on the Queen Mary in the steerage section. Unlike his friend Eugene Moran, owner of the Moran Towing and Transporting Company, whose tugs would push the Mary into port in New York, Bear was squeezing in at the last minute. Moran had his reservations for the maiden voyage since 1934, and so did 100 others on this, the first voyage. Passage on the maiden voyage had been sold out for months before the ship sailed. 
In fact, passage was booked solid for the next six transatlantic crossings of the liner. As Bear was talking his way on board, the ship was being loaded for her first voyage. The stores appeared to be enough to take her around the world, but were in fact just the normal amount for the Queen Mary's Atlantic crossing. 200,000 pounds of general stores, 5,000 cigars, 20,000 packs of cigarettes, 25,000 boxes of matches, 14,500 bottles of wine, 12,000 bottles of mineral water, 20,000 bottles of beer, 200 kegs of lager beer, 6,000 gallons of draft beer, 400 pounds of caviar, 1,000 pounds of biscuits, 4,000 pounds of tea and coffee, 400 gallons of cream, 2,000 gallons of milk, 50,000 eggs, 10,000 pounds of butter, 2,000 pounds of cheese, 20,000 pounds of sugar, 3,500 pounds of pickles, 3,500 pounds of jams and marmalade, 6,000 pounds of bottled fruit, 20,000 pounds of poultry, 6,000 pounds of ice cream, 70,000 pounds of ice, 9,000 pounds of bacon and ham, 2,000 pounds of sausages, 30,000 pounds of fresh fruit, 50,000 pounds of potatoes, 50,000 pounds of fresh vegetables, 35,000 pounds of flour, 7,600 pounds of cereal, and 600 pounds of nuts. This was to feed 3,000 passengers and 1,100 officers and crewmen for a maximum of four days. There were 12 varieties of jams, 15 of cheeses, and 22 of biscuits. More than 800 of the crewmen were directly employed to look after the passengers. 100 chefs managed the galleys. A special kitchen was designated to prepare kosher foods for Jewish passengers. For the first time on any passenger ship, the Jewish passengers also had a synagogue as a place to worship. The maiden voyage staff had been handpicked from the best of the Cunard White Star employees. Cunard Steamship Company had kept duplicate records since 1932 of passenger preferences for foods, drinks, and sundry items. The Cunard people probably knew the likes and dislikes of Americans better than many American firms. Passenger complaints of English toilet paper, one entry said. Americans desire softer toilet tissue. The Queen Mary on her maiden voyage had American-made toilet tissue. The pangs of the American Depression were easing under the social reforms of the new president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. More Americans were traveling to Europe, and these travelers were all important to the success of this new luxury liner. The French Normandy, a shade longer and a ton or two heavier, was already in the Atlantic steamship competition and had already captured the coveted blue ribbon. The speed title had passed from the Bremen to her sister ship Europa, and then to the Italian vessel Rex, and finally back to the Bremen. The Normandy took it in 1935. The German press congratulated Great Britain on this new shipping wonder, the Queen Mary, but predicted the ship would not take the blue ribbon away from the French. Captain Eric Lemon, skipper of the Hindenburg, denied rumors that the airship would attempt to race the Queen Mary across the Atlantic on the ship's maiden voyage. Sir Britain also announced he had no intentions or instructions to set a speed mark on the maiden voyage, but U.S. Ambassador Robert W. Bingham told the New York Times correspondent in London he heard that the Queen Mary would try for the speed title on her first voyage. Sir Percy Bates, Cunard White Star's board chairman, scoffed at the press speculation by saying, This is a passenger ship, a luxury ship, designed for the comfort and safety of her passengers, I don't think we are going to risk such a ship as this just to win a race. Sir Percy described the Queen Mary as a ship of peace and added, she will be the most profitable vessel Cunard ever sailed. While he spoke, negotiations were underway with John Brown Shipyard to build the Queen Mary's sister ship, one that would be longer and heavier. But on May 26, 1936, the eyes of the world were on the flood-lighted floating Taj Mahal at Southampton as she made ready for her maiden voyage, a voyage originally scheduled for 1933. 
she was ready to sail at last, with a full complement of passengers and crew, and only awaiting the morning west to east tide flow from the English Channel to begin her maiden voyage. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 The Maiden Voyage Cunard Steamship Company had waited ten years for this day. The company's prize ship, the RMS Queen Mary, was ready to sail on her maiden voyage, on the 69th birthday of England's Queen Mother, Queen Mary. As the 1,019.6-foot liner rode out the final hours, secured fore and aft to the dock at Southampton, 2,140 passengers had spent the night aboard. There were 776 first-class passengers, 784 tourist class, and 583rd class, and 1,100 officers and crewmen. The ship's librarian had lugged about 6,100 sacks of mail bound for the United States and Canada. Stamp buffs from all over the world wanted the cancellation. Posted on the high seas RMS Queen Mary, maiden voyage, May 26, 1936. That voyage would begin as soon as the first tide rose the waters of the Solent. Francis McGarry was sorting bone china in the plate pantry. On deck, handling lines, able seaman A.J.F. Golding was making ready to sail. One would sail with the Mary all her years. The other would never reach England again. In the boiler room, Albert Charles Edward Tinker Pierce, a 34-year-old fireman, watched pressure gauges and admired the shiny new boilers as he awaited Commodore Britain's command for steam. Pierce lived to sail the Mary for 21 of her 31 years. Commodore Britain collapsed on the ship's bridge and died five months later. Kenneth Paul Bear, the New Yorker who wrangled a last-minute ticket for a small inside cabin on D-deck, lucked out again. He met an old friend, William Harlow, an executive with United Fruit Company, who managed to slip Bear past the master-at-arms and into his A-deck suite, where Bear, on a $100 steerage ticket, rode first class for the entire voyage. James Siegel, an Englishman, wasn't so lucky. He had slipped aboard as the Queen Mary's first stowaway. He was discovered shortly after the ship sailed and was put ashore at her first stop, Cherbourg, France, less than 100 miles across the English Channel. The maiden voyage passenger list sounded like a reading of Who's Who and Burke's Peerage, but of all those on board for this first voyage, Mrs. L. W. Bailey of England was getting the most attention. She was the oldest patroness of Cunard Steamships and received a personal invitation to travel on the maiden voyage in June 1931, shortly after the ship's keel was laid. She was an old hand at Cunard Steamship travel, but unlike her, Mrs. K. Bird was finding her way around the acres of deck space for the first time, and she was falling in love with the ship. Actress Frances Day got reassurances from her steward that the six laying hens she brought aboard would provide her with fresh eggs daily. Without so much as a question, the baggage master had placed the hen crates and a burlap bag of chicken feed inside the sun deck kennels. Miss Day's chickens laid their fresh eggs, and they were served to her sunny side up during the voyage, despite the 50,000 fresh eggs loaded onto the ship at Southampton. Eighteen special trains left Waterloo Station in London early in the morning and were now dockside, unloading thousands of sightseers, including King Edward VIII. Queen Mary remained at St. James Palace. Watching as the royal party moved towards the ship was Elizabeth S. Turner, who had picked a special spot on the promenade deck to give her a vantage point for sailing time ceremonies. She little dreamed that the thrill of what she was seeing this day would repeat itself 31 years later on the ship's last voyage. The blue ensign was hoisted on Queen Mary's rounded fantail, signifying she was ready to sail under the command of the former British Navy skipper Commodore Britton. With the blast of the ship's deep-throated horn, a churning of her four 35-ton propellers, the Queen Mary stirred. Lines were cast off, and she moved away from the dock, underway on her first voyage. Before she finished with engines 31 years later in port thousands of miles from Southampton, this ship traveled almost 4 million nautical miles, rounded two of the world's most famous capes, and wrote her page in the history of seafaring.
As the queen moved slowly down the Solent towards open waters, other ships in the harbor curtsied their farewells. She slipped past the Isle of Wight and into the English Channel for a quick run to Cherbourg to take on more mail and passengers, and then to proceed to sea, bound for America for the first time. In New York, the 1,000-foot Pier 90, at the foot of 50th Street, the largest pier in the harbor and built especially for the queen, was not quite finished. Cunard and New York City officials were frantic. The Queen's throne had to be ready to receive her in four days. Aboard the ship were 100 newspaper and radio reporters assigned to chronicle the voyage, but there mainly to see if the Queen Mary would reclaim the blue ribbon for England. Incoming wireless messages to passengers made radio traffic so heavy that the press dispatches were delayed for hours. The report that John McLean, the New York Times shipping reporter, filed described the ship as an English castle with three funnels. As the sleek ship steamed westbound, she passed Land's End, a rocky Celtic jut of land that is the first European land sighted by the great ocean greyhounds coming from New York. From the granite villages around Land's End with such romantic names as Mousehole came thousands of Cornish folk to the headlands to watch the Mary pass. We were all taken by surprise when the Queen Mary steamed into view, recalled S. Martin, a young lad who stood by his father's side to watch the ship that day. She seemed much nearer to land than we expected. We watched in silence as the liner, white, fast, and noiseless, steamed away from our left across a glittering sea. There were a few conscious cheers, but most onlookers just turned to their neighbor and said, British and best. Two days out on her maiden voyage, a dense fog sealed in around the liner, and Commodore Britain, mindful of the disastrous maiden voyage of the Titanic in 1912, slowed the Queen Mary. The press rushed to the radio room to flash to the world, Queen Mary will not break Normandy's record. Questioned by New York Times reporter McLean, Chief Engineer L. A. Roberts insisted that no attempt at a speed record was even intended. The truth is that one of the Mary's turbines was balking, and there were passenger complaints about vibrations and soot fallout from the funnels on the sports deck. But with fog engulfing the ship, Commodore Britain was taking no chances with Cunard's prized ship. As the Mary passed the charted spot of the sunken Titanic, the ship slowed even more to allow crewmen to toss over a wreath of red roses in memory of those who went down with the liner. The fog lifted, and the Mary resumed a speed of 29 knots. She was still 100 miles out to sea from New York when the silver underbellies of three Eastern Airlines planes passed overhead in a salute to the Queen. One of the planes was piloted by Eddie Rickenbacker, then president and founder of Eastern Airlines. His co-pilot of the new DC-2 twin-motor airliner was Dick Merrill. Sitting in the compartment was radio announcer Ted Hoosing. Sitting straddle a deck chair on the after section of the Queen Mary, Kenneth Bear shaded his eyes from the sun's glint off the silver airliners. As Bear watched the overfly, suddenly the decks were littered with carnations dropped from the aircraft. Bear wasn't feeling too well after the night before his party hosted by Horace Dodge. He had forgotten he was supposed to be in the radio room to carry on a two-way radio conversation with Hoosing, which was to be relayed to radio listeners in the United States. A deck steward located Bear and ushered him to the bridge, where he described the maiden voyage to Hoosing in the circling airliner. In 1936, the airplane flying over Queen Mary was more a novelty than a threat to the ocean liner, yet the aircraft was a prototype of the jets that would one day wing across the Atlantic in a matter of hours, and spell doom to the majestic ship, now getting her first welcome to New York. When she reached Ambrose Lightship off New York June 1, 1936, Great Britain's prize ship had not beaten the French Normandy's record, but missed the mark by only 42 minutes. The maiden voyage took four days, five hours, and 46 minutes. She had averaged a speed of 29.113 knots. Before she moved into the river harbor, the taxi line to the pier was six blocks long. President Franklin Roosevelt and R.B. Bennett, Canadian Prime Minister, were both on the pier to welcome the ship. The harbor area was jammed with thousands of sightseers. Small boats impeded the giant liner's progress up the Hudson River. 
One of those sightseers was Don Angel, a small Brooklyn boy perched on his father's shoulders. 31 years later, Angel, a Los Angeles Times editorial writer, held his own son on his shoulders to see the Queen Mary sail past his home in Costa Mesa, California, on her last voyage. Eugene Moran watched from the Mary's bridge as the tugs gently nudged the Queen Mary to her berth. Moran, whose tugs would handle the Mary's New York berthing for all her years, had reservations for the maiden voyage since 1934. The New York welcome surpassed the send-off in England, and in time, the Queen Mary became more American than British. In her 31 years, she carried more Americans than any other nationality. And Americans were coming in droves to see this marvel of ocean travel. 6,000 guests came aboard for a series of private parties. 10,000 persons paid $1 for a tour of the ship conducted by pretty young girls dressed in Scottish tweeds. While the parties and tours were going on, crewmen and dock workers were refueling and restocking the mammoth liner for her eastward voyage. Sir Britton held a press conference in which he emphasized he was not going to engage in a speed contest on the return to England. The British press were critical of the Mary's failure to beat the Normandy speed on the maiden westbound voyage, and were now questioning, in print, if the 81,237-ton superliner was actually capable of the contest. With an American movie company aboard to film scenes for Dodsworth, the Queen Mary sailed June 7th with almost as much fanfare as she received on her arrival. She was hardly in open seas when Seaman Golding slipped and fell on the forward deck. He died the next day and was buried at sea. The Mary arrived in Southampton June 10th without a record crossing. The turbine trouble and soot fallout from the funnels was still a problem and a factor in slowing her down. Cunard was sold out on the passage to New York, and the second westbound voyage began on time, despite the faulty turbine. While she was at sea on this voyage, the Hindenburg flew over the Mary and signaled a congratulatory message from Adolf Hitler. Commodore Britton didn't feel in a very congratulatory mood. His ship was running late and arrived four hours later than the crossing on the maiden voyage. The Queen Mary was plagued with machinery bugs, but to the wide-eyed seven-year-old Donald Hall who boarded the ship with his mother for the return to England, it was like something out of Jules Verne. The ship looked immense to him as he looked at the Queen Mary from a distance, but now inside the ship, he was filled with wonder. I remember prowling over the ship and thinking I was inside one of Jules Verne's creations. Hall, now a naval architect in Long Beach, California, can look out his office window and see his Jules Verne ship. So far, the problems with the ship were confined to machinery faults, but in July, while en route to New York, she ran headlong into a vicious North Atlantic storm. The ship's 145-foot-tall foremast caused her to roll and pitch so badly that the crewmen nicknamed her the Rolling Mary. When the ship returned to England, Kinnard dry-docked her at Southampton for nine days, but the work didn't correct her roll, a fault that was not overcome until 1956, when two fin-like stabilizers were installed on either side of the ship at a cost of $1 million. The dry docking did correct the turbine trouble, and on her fourth westbound voyage, the liner claimed a faster speed than the Normandy, but the timing was so hotly disputed that Cunard withdrew its claim. Blue ribboned or not, the Queen was still taking more passengers across the Atlantic than any other ocean liner. And she was drawing record crowds of spectators wherever she sailed. Mary Watchers brought chairs to the South Sea Beach on the English Channel August 4, 1936, to watch the Queen pass. The ship left a seven-foot wave in her wake, which sloshed onto the beach, upset the chairs, and drenched the people. But Cunard wasn't satisfied. They wanted the ribbon, the honor of having the world's fastest ship. The British press openly accused Commodore Britain of being overly cautious and not letting the Queen Mary full out to take the blue ribbon. The day finally came when Sir Britain would let the Mary full out. She began her westward voyage August 19, 1936, and arrived in New York August 23, 
four days, seven hours and twelve minutes later, she had beaten the Normandy. The French yelled foul, but the Queen Mary claimed the blue ribband, and shipping circles accepted Cunard's claim. On the eastward run, the Queen Mary cinched the title by arriving in Southampton in three days, 23 hours, and 57 minutes. Pictures of her arrival were flashed across Great Britain on an experimental device called television, a marvel equal to the Queen's speed run. The Mary strutted into New York on her return trip, a little too heady for the Staten Island Ferry because the Mary's backwash sent a wave over the side of the ferry boat. The Normandy took back the speed title shortly after, and a seesaw speed battle between the two ships became legendary. The Los Angeles Times, apparently growing weary of the conflicting press dispatches over which was the fastest ship, editorialized in 1936 that safety at sea was far more important than speed, concluding, Those in a great hurry should take the Hindenburg. The Queen Mary wasn't making any speed run on October 20th. She ran into a 60-mile-an-hour gale en route to Southampton. Thirteen passengers were injured as the ship was whipped by the winds for three days straight. Commodore Britain remained on the bridge during the storm, which at times was so violent that it seemed it would break up the giant liner. While readying the ship for her return voyage October 29th, he collapsed and died of a heart seizure. His staff captain, R.V. Peel, took command and sailed the ship on time. Captain Peel was to take her through an even worse storm on the return voyage to England in November. She limped into Cherbourg a day late with 20 passengers injured as a result of heavy seas, among them American financier J.P. Morgan. Morgan wrote Cunard a note, suggesting that ropes be installed along the passageways during stormy weather. The ropes were installed, but were a rather unladylike addition to the rear wood paneling in the ship's palace-like hallways. The ship was still plagued with first-year operating troubles. She arrived seven hours late in New York in December because of leaking condensers. Cunard decided to dry dock the Mary in January 1937 and spent $500,000 on alterations to eliminate vibrations and minimize the rolling problems. The work was nearly finished when an outbreak of influenza in England reduced the shipyard workforce and delayed the overhauling. When she was finally ready to sail on February 18, 1937, she had a new skipper, Captain R.B. Irving, and he was a man determined to settle the Blue Ribbon controversy and in favor of the Queen Mary. The dry docking work he soon discovered had not eliminated all the malfunctions. Despite this handicap, the Queen Mary continued to run with capacity passenger manifests, and to Captain Irving's amazement, 40,000 goldfish bound to Great Britain from America, complete with feeding instructions. The Queen Mary carried so many celebrities that the ship's telephone operator admitted he hardly gave a thought to ringing one up. Along with the celebrities, the ship also carried immigrants and travelers who saved their pennies to cross on the great ship. But the Queen Mary had a way of making them all feel royal. One of the celebrities aboard during a New York to England crossing was actress Bea Lilly, who made her now famous Queen Mary statement, When does this place get to England? The classic description of the ship's size remained unchallenged until public relations man Bob Wells, 31 years later, toured the ship in Long Beach and quipped, When are we going to make this the 51st state? The big ship still hadn't settled the issue of the Blue Ribband. In April 1937, Cunard thought perhaps the solid propellers were causing some speed loss. The ship was put into dry dock, and the four propellers replaced with a cast of bronze-magnesium propellers. Cunard's board chairman, Sir Percy Bates, insisted the new props were for the sake of economy, not speed. The ship was still beset with vibrating troubles, and in July 1938, the liner, now two years old, was put back into dry dock in an attempt to eliminate the problem. The work was finished, and the ship was being towed out to the graving yard at Southampton, July 30th, when high winds blew the Mary off course, and she rammed into the concrete side of the dry dock, damaging her hull. She was not able to sail again till August, but then she was ready to challenge the Normandy for a final go at the Blue Ribbon. Captain Irving had been promoted to Commodore, and when he took the Queen Mary to sea, 
he was determined to come home with the pennant. The Queen arrived in New York, August 7th, 1938, three days, 21 hours, and 48 minutes later. She had beaten the Normandy's westward run. On the turnaround, the Queen steamed eastward in three days, 20 hours, and 42 minutes, averaging 31.69 knots speed, a record that Normandy never exceeded, and one the Queen Mary held for 14 years. In the year of 1938, the sea duel between the Normandy and the Queen Mary wasn't very exciting news. The war and threat of war were. The Queen Mary was now carrying increasing numbers of Europeans fleeing the continent. So many were trying to escape Europe ahead of the inevitable war. There wasn't enough stateroom space for all the passengers. Cots were set up in passageways. Douglas Fairbanks Sr. and his wife Lady Ashley were among those caught in the squeeze for space, and their late bookings put them in a cot in the lounge on main deck. By 1939, most of the Queen's passengers were war refugees. She was carrying up to 350 more passengers than usual on each westbound crossing. When she sailed from England, August 30th, 1939, she carried a special cargo of $44 million in gold bullion for safekeeping in the United States. Her decks were jammed with refugees. J.P. Morgan, seeing the plight of the refugee families, gave up his stateroom so that more people could be quartered comfortably. The Queen Mary was at sea September 2nd, making all speed towards the United States. Crewmen went quietly from stateroom to stateroom, painting the ship's 2,000 portholes black. At midnight, the ship's running lights went dark. The Queen Mary, with nearly 5,000 souls aboard, was now a submarine target as the situation in Europe edged towards war. The war began the next day. The Queen Mary's luxury years were finished. She slipped up the Hudson River without fanfare, September 5, 1939. The next time she sailed, she would be a warship. End of Chapter 4 Chapter 5 A Queen Goes to War Kinnard board chairman Sir Percy Bates had described the Queen Mary as a ship of peace. The ship had sailed the Atlantic for three peaceful years, but now, as she tied up to a pier in New York, her luxury years were over. Her old sea rival, the Normandy, was already in port and lying in the next berth. As the Mary's lines were being secured, a French seaman dipped the Normandy's tricolor in a salute to the majestic Queen, and the Normandy's crew cheered her safe arrival. Other ships of the belligerent nations were caught in New York Harbor, too. The new Cunarder, Mauritania II, whose maiden voyage was made June 18, 1939, lay in a nearby berth. And the German liner, Bremen, was secured in a berth a short distance from the Mary. The Bremen's skipper, Captain Adolf Ahrens, had orders from Berlin to sail. But U.S. customs agents had quarantined the ship to search for reported contraband weapons. Although the Bremen was held in port for two days, the United States was neutral and at peace with Germany, and the ship could not be legally seized. Under the cover of fog, the 50,000-ton German liner slipped out of New York September 7, 1939, and eluded British warships by taking a northerly route along the coast of Iceland to a secret German naval base at Murmansk, Russia. Her fate, however, was already sealed. British aircraft caught the Bremen in dry dock at Bremerhaven, and so badly damaged the ship, she had to be scuttled. Cunard's new 83,000-ton liner christened Queen Elizabeth was also a sitting target for enemy aircraft as she floated in a fitting basin on the Clyde River. The question in the United States, however, was what to do with the big liners sitting out the war in New York. President Roosevelt suggested to the Secretary of State Sumner Wells that both the Normandy and the Queen Mary be taken over by the United States and that their costs, estimated at $20 million each, be applied to war debts. Under Roosevelt's plan, the ships would fly the neutral U.S. flag and be used primarily to transport stranded Americans from European war zones. Both France and England rejected the plan. Yet, neither ship dared leave New York's safe harbor for fear of German submarines lying in wait off the U.S. Atlantic coast. New York police guarded both ships against sabotage, 
But strangely, the biggest enemy of the two ships was their idleness. A ship tied to a wharf is more vulnerable to fire, rot, and deterioration than when at sea. Many of the Queen Mary's crewmen had volunteered to return to England and join the armed forces, and essential crewmen were denied permission to leave the ship. The British Ministry of War Transport requisitioned the Queen for a wartime role, and she was now being outfitted for that task. The bright red funnels became a smear of camouflage gray. The white superstructure and the black hull were repainted an ugly sea gray green. This was her war paint. Other work was going on too. The Queen Mary, built for a purple life, was now bristling with armament on her top decks. 33 guns, 12 rocket launchers, a range finder, and a central gun control house. Around her waist, she wore a degaussing girdle, a band of wire fastened to the hull and energized by an electric current to neutralize the hull against magnetic mines. Her luxury trappings, including six miles of Wilton carpeting, 220 cases of bone china, crystal glassware, and silver settings, were removed and stored in New York. The Queen Mary would have normally passed a quiet, uneventful life of luxury, ticketing off the 3,120 nautical miles between New York and Southampton. The war had destined otherwise. In February 1940, a crew of 400 men was assembling aboard the Mary's sister, Queen Elizabeth, thinking they were to move her from the Clyde River to Dry Dock in Southampton. Her skipper, Captain J.C. Townley, got her underway March 2nd. When she reached the open sea, he opened secret orders. Destination, New York. Never had a ship set out so unprepared on a maiden voyage as the Queen Elizabeth when she left her four destroyer escort 200 miles at sea in the North Atlantic. The ship had had no prior sea trials. She was, in effect, an untried ship, and yet was crossing the Atlantic at the height of the German U-boat menace. She steamed 3,127 miles in five days and nine hours, slipping into New York Harbor unannounced March 7, 1940, with only the sludge vessel Coney Island as an escort, a contrast to the arrival of the Queen Mary four years before. While the Elizabeth was docking, the Mary was taking on supplies for her first voyage since September 5, 1939. On March 21st, the Mary, with only half of her normal crew, stole slowly down the river toward the sea. When she reached the open sea, she turned south, a route she had never taken, and sailed to Cape Town, South Africa. The ship looked like a giant gray ghost. The lettering, Queen Mary, on her bow had been blotted out to disguise what ship she was. The stopover in Cape Town was short, just time enough to refuel. The Queen had an appointment to keep in Sydney, Australia. It was a very strange voyage, remembered Harold Blakely, a crewman in charge of refrigeration aboard. None of us really knew where the ship was bound, but in the warm waters of the South Atlantic, we were sure we were not headed for England. When we reached the Cape, we knew we headed for the Pacific. In Sydney, workmen came aboard and removed more luxury appointments, mostly plush public room furniture and 2,500 stateroom doors for storage. She was making room for a new cargo, 5,500 Australian soldiers and their assorted military gear, a strange passenger manifest for a ship designed to carry blue blood. These soldiers were all volunteers for duty in England. The Queen Mary, with this first load of troops, 1,500 more than planned for, sailed from Australia May 5, 1940, on a zigzag course for the Clyde River. The ship had begun a glorious era, trooping. The war in Europe was going badly for the Allies. England and France were now being pushed to the sea. Neville Chamberlain, the man who negotiated the government loan that allowed construction of the Queen Mary to be completed, had resigned as Prime Minister, and in his place, a new, tough-minded PM named Winston Churchill had taken leadership. The British were being pushed out of their last stand, Dunkirk. Eleven days after the Dunkirk evacuation, the Queen Mary arrived on the Clyde. The Clyde folk, surprised to see the ship that had last sailed the river waters six years before as a luxury liner, 
cheered as they saw the thousands of soldiers filing off the queen. They thought they were seeing an army unload from the ship, but they hadn't seen anything yet. The Mary stayed only long enough to refuel and resupply before sailing back to Australia for more troops. England now stood alone and threatened with a land invasion by the Germans, massed in Norway for Hitler's Operation Sea Lion, an invasion that never took place. Oddly, one of the ships loaded with invasion troops was the Bremen. Even though the invasion didn't come, it was still a constant threat. England needed more soldiers to thwart the invasion. The Queen Mary was the only ship big enough and fast enough to deliver sufficient numbers to England on time. The Queen Elizabeth was still in New York, being outfitted for trooping. When she finally did sail, November 13, 1940, she was still not ready and had to lay up in Singapore six months before she could help the Mary. Churchill ordered the Queen Mary's trooping capacity increased to 6,000. It was a bold decision. There was not enough destroyers to provide escorts for convoys, and the Mary's service speed of 28 and a half knots was too fast for an escort anyway. She'd have to travel alone, with speed as her only defense against submarine attack. Before the Queen Elizabeth was ready to join her, the Queen Mary's schedule was almost a railroad timetable of troop deliveries to England. When the German and Italian forces massed in the desert to drive for control of the Suez Canal, the Mary began hauling troops directly to the Suez to defend the vital waterway. On the first voyage into the Mediterranean Sea, headed for the Suez, she was passing the Rock of Gibraltar. The rock defenses challenged her. What ship? What ship? The Mary's radio room replied, What rock? What rock? The recognition signal wasn't long in coming. The queenly gray ghosts, the Elizabeth and the Mary, continued to slip in and out of Sydney, hauling troops to European fronts until the Japanese opened warfare in the Pacific in December 1941. The Australian port was declared unsafe for the Giants, which were so large they had to stagger arrival times because both couldn't get into the harbor at the same time. Now that the United States was in the war, New York was chosen as the operating port for the two ships. It was now a different kind of war, no longer one of containment, but one of offense, and the Queen Mary and her younger sister were to play a key role in this new kind of war. Churchill arrived in Washington for a war conference with President Roosevelt December 22, 1941. One of his first proposals for getting on with the war was to use the two giant Cunarders to transport a full division at one time. General George C. Marshall, U.S. Chief of Staff, opposed the idea of risking so many lives on one ship. Churchill insisted, pointing out how the Queen Mary had delivered soldiers to England at the time of England's greatest peril. General Marshall put it to Churchill bluntly, If you had to give the order, Mr. Churchill, would you take a risk and send a division of men on this ship, knowing that if it were torpedoed, there would be only lifeboats for a fraction of that number? Yes, if it meant shortening the war one day, Churchill snapped. General Marshall accepted the plan. The use of converted luxury liners as troop transports was not a new idea. Great Britain had pressed the paddle wheel steamer Great Eastern into service to haul horses, cannon, and men in the Crimea War. The United States had used liners as troop ships during World War I, but now the United States had no really large liners available. Oddly, plans to build the America, a luxury liner to compete with the Queen Mary, were set aside because war threats made it imperative that warships be built. Even for ships the size of the Queen's, certain alterations were required before they could accommodate a full division. The observation lounge, the rounded bar at the front of the ship on promenade deck, was converted into a maze of five-tier bunks. The long midship's bar on the port side of promenade deck was jammed with 250 bunks, six high with only 18 inches of airspace between bunks. Each stateroom had 18 triple-tiered bunks. The first-class smoking lounge was partitioned off and made into a hospital. With the added bunk space, there still wasn't sleeping room for all when the Mary carried a full division of 15,000 troops. By lottery, 
7,400 enlisted men drew double bunker tickets, meaning that on alternate nights, 3,700 had to sleep on deck or in passageways while the other 3,700 slept in the bunks. While the Mary was in New York being fitted for more troops, work was already underway on converting her old rival, the Normandy, into a troop ship. The Normandy had been seized by the United States and renamed the USS Lafayette. A spark from an acetylene torch ignited Excelsior packaging in the promenade deck Grand Salon and started a fire that spread so rapidly the amount of water required to extinguish the flames caused the ship to keel over on her side. Unable to raise her, the once proud Normandy was cut up for steel salvage. With 14,000 American troops on board, the Queen Mary sailed from New York bound for Australia. She was fast, but was she fast enough to avoid the tinfish death of a German or Japanese sub? Hitler had felt the sting of the Queen Mary's ability to deliver troops. He offered a prize of $250,000 to the crew of the sub that sank her and a reward of the Iron Cross to the sub's skipper. The sub threat was real. On this first trip with American troops on board, the Queen was scheduled to stop at Trinidad for fuel and provisions. While she was at sea, a German sub slipped into Trinidad Harbor and sank two ships at anchor and escaped in the confusion. The Queen Mary received an urgent coded message ordering her to avoid Trinidad and make port in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil instead. She had hardly put to sea from Brazil March 15, 1942, when the Allies intercepted a broadcast from a clandestine radio station operated by the Germans in Sao Paulo, Brazil, which gave detailed information on the Queen Mary's sailing, course, and destination. It was a frightening report, General Dwight Eisenhower wrote in his book Crusade in Europe. It was frightening indeed, but an Italian radio station got the report confused and broadcast information that the Queen Mary had been sunk in the South Atlantic. The ship's radio room monitored the broadcast, and an excited radio operator rushed to the cabin of the skipper, Commodore James Gordon Bissett, a stocky, ruddy-faced Scotsman. The radio man was almost breathless with excitement when he awoke Bissett with a startling statement. The Queen Mary has been sunk! Bissett, who had been forced to retire from the Royal Navy because of age, yawned and replied calmly in a thick Scottish burr. For God's sake, man, keep it a secret. We mustn't alarm the passengers that we've been torpedoed. Bissett was not to hear the last of submarines versus the Queen Mary, one of which said the Queen Mary raced unscathed through a pack of 25 submarines, which were lying in wait for her. Of this report, Bissett commented, with all due respect to the press, this story is a little exaggerated. In fact, one might say damn right untrue. Such might have been the case, but one real report involving a submarine sighting of the Queen Mary is contained in the diary of Field Marshal Lord Allenbrook, an incident occurring September 7, 1944, while Churchill was aboard. Last night, we passed close over a German submarine and intercepted his signal reporting having seen us. As long as the Queen kept her speed up, there wasn't a chance in a million that a sub could have connected with a torpedo, but slowing down or stopping meant sure death. In the early part of 1942, returning to New York from Australia, the Queen Mary was 100 miles north of Bermuda when she passed seven lifeboats adrift in the sea with men aboard. The unescorted queen could not stop for the survivors. In fact, she was under orders from the British Admiralty and the United States War Department not to stop or even linger. We went right on, commented Commodore Bissett, sending a blinker signal that we'd send word of the sighting by wireless. The ship's purser, Charles Johnson, watched the lifeboats bobbing in the South Atlantic from his A-deck porthole. What he didn't know was that one of the men in the lifeboats was his 23-year-old son, a fact he found out when his son sent him a message after his rescue. You don't have to be so haughty simply because you're aboard the Queen Mary. I am blood, you know. In June 1942, the thrust of her 158,000 horsepower engines practically decided one of the most important battles of the war. German Field Marshal Erwin Rommel and his Crack of Africa Corps were pushing the British Eighth Army into a Dunkirk on the Mediterranean. 
The key holding line was El Alamein, a desert outpost 65 miles from Alexandria, and the road to Suez. The Queen Mary arrived with 10,000 troops to reinforce the 8th Army and stop Rommel's push to the sea. By November 1942, the Queen Mary had delivered enough men for the first Allied invasions of North Africa. It was during one of these voyages that the Queen Mary suffered her only damage in World War II. She was transporting 10,000 American troops, October 2, 1942, when she arrived off the coast of Donegal, Ireland, before entering the Clyde Estuary. Here she picked up an escort from the British Navy. One of the escort ships was the old World War I light cruiser HMS Curacoa, commanded by Captain John Wilfred Boutwood, and with a crew of 450 men. Skipper of the Queen Mary for this voyage was Captain Gordon Illingworth. The Queen Mary was on a zigzag course to foil any lurking submarines and was about to overtake the cruiser, which had stationed herself ahead of the liner. On the bridge, the Queen Mary's junior first officer, Stanley Wright, had just finished charting the arrival time at Toward Point at the Firth of the Clyde, a little over four hours' time. He had turned to Captain Illingworth to check his time when he felt a bump. Was that a bomb? Captain Illingworth asked. No, sir, replied the helmsman. We hit the cruiser. Everyone was rushing to open decks. It felt like a shudder, as if the Queen Mary had struck a log. Army Air Corps Private First Class Bill Webb said, as he quit his blackjack game to go up topside to see the stern of the cruiser bobbing like a cork. Webb, who now lives in Placentia, California, remembered thinking, My God, we can't leave those men to drown. Webb wasn't the only one thinking that. The 82,000-ton Queen Mary had struck the 4,200-ton Kurosawa at an oblique angle, but her weight had pushed the smaller ship around, so that the ships were at right angles when the Mary's sharp bow slashed through the ship. Captain Illingworth had a decision to make. Stop and rescue the survivors of the Kurosawa against orders, and at a risk of 10,000 lives, or steam on. He steamed on. Staff Captain Harry Gradage rushed forward to inspect the damage to the Queen Mary. The stems pushed back, and the four peaks awash. The bosun informed him, Water was pouring in and out of the forepeak, but watertight walls kept the water confined. Captain Gradridge remembered thinking just how well the ship was built. It came to me that she had no equal in the Atlantic, perhaps not anywhere in the world. The Curacoa carried depth charges on her after end. If the Queen Mary had struck her at that angle, the explosions could have ripped open the Mary's bow and possibly even sunk her. The cruiser sank within five minutes, and 349 British sailors went down with her. Captain Boutwood survived. Later, at a court of inquiry into the disaster, he was asked, What did the Queen Mary do after the collision? She steamed on. Was that the proper thing for her to do? Captain Boutwood's answer was hardly audible. I would say yes. Despite the heavy loss of life, the answer had to be yes. To delay the Queen Mary in dry dock to repair the split prow would have been equally dangerous. Enemy aircraft often bombed the Clyde shipyards. The hole was plugged with cement, and the Queen Mary sailed for Boston, where she was fitted with a new bow plate. While she was dry docked for this work, the Pentagon had developed a bold new plan to move massive numbers of American troops to Europe for the Allied invasion of the continent. Operation Bolero, as the plan was called, would involve using the Queen Mary, Queen Elizabeth, the Mauritania, the Aquitania, all the Cunard liners, and the French liner Pasteur, which was operated under Cunard command. Only two of those transports were large enough and fast enough to go it alone without escort. Captain Kenneth A. Knowles, a U.S. Navy Reserve officer, assumed command of a small Navy unit in Norfolk, Virginia, which directed Operation Bolero. He had the responsibility of seeing the Queen safely to and from Europe, and he alone had the authority to alter the course of either of the two ships if his anti-submarine section believed submarines were active in their paths. 
The two queens had been taken over by the United States War Department, and though they were manned by British crews, the ships technically belonged to the United States under the reverse Lend-Lease program. Any British official who wanted passage had to apply to Washington for permission. Cunard made no profit from the ships during the war years, but was remunerated for their use by the British government. The money paid was less than half the company's earnings before the war. As the Queen Mary and the other Cunard ships began the fantastic task of transporting more than a million American GIs to Europe, she was now getting air escorts as well as sea escorts while she built up steam for the long run alone. The air escort picked up the Queen Mary just after she cleared the submarine gates at New York Harbor. One of the Navy pilots assigned to escort the Queen was Raymond Rhodes, who was with Squadron VPB-132. Rhodes, now a Fullerton, California newspaper reporter, recalled that the Queen was the only ship brave enough to give the aircraft a position report when the escort ended six to nine hours later and more than a hundred miles at sea. We'd blink a request for a position, and the old queen would snap it right back to us, and in plain language, Rhodes said. It was always accurate, too. Rhodes was amazed at the speed of the queen. From the wake she left, we had to keep reminding ourselves she was just a thing made of steel. And it appeared to Rhodes that he'd just escorted her out when he was back escorting her in. She was operating on a quick turnaround basis, and 1943 was her busiest year. She made 18 voyages to the Clyde, each time with 10,000 to 15,000 American GIs. The number of guns aboard her were increased, and 50 American sailors came aboard as gunners, but never fired a weapon except in practice. Two Army colonels joined the Mary as transport commanders and rode back and forth between New York and England for the remainder of the war. Colonel Dallas D. Dennis, a lanky San Franciscan, and Colonel William R. Barnett, a New Yorker, were in charge of billeting the thousands of troops, but their biggest problem was feeding that many men. Each man who boarded the ship was handed a ticket which told him where to sleep, where to eat, and when. Troops ate in three sections, designated appropriately red, white, and blue. Two meals a day were served, beginning with a 6 a.m. breakfast call that continued to 10 a.m. Dinner began at 3 p.m. and continued until 7 p.m. Meals were served in six 45-minute settings. The food wasn't bad, ex-GI Kenneth Johnson recalled, except the British didn't leave it on the stove long enough to cook. It was true that G.I.'s meals on the Queen Mary were far from the usual Cunard fare, but feeding an army could hardly be done from a French menu. A ham-slicing machine on board during wartime voyages worked 24 hours a day just to keep up with the demand for ham and eggs. The usual Cunard cuisine was served to one wartime traveler, Winston Churchill. In fact, Churchill liked one Queen Mary chef's Irish stew so much that he had him transferred to the Cunarder Franconia when the Prime Minister was aboard that vessel during the Yalta Conference. When Churchill came aboard the Queen, the main deck was refitted to its pre-war standards. His first wartime voyage aboard the ship was in May of 1943. The Queen Mary was on the Clyde River. To cover his travel, the ship's print shop had orders to print menus and information cards in Dutch, and the rumor was deliberately spread that the mystery passenger would be Queen Wilhelmina of the Netherlands, who was in exile in England. Churchill boarded secretly at dusk, May 4, 1943, to sail for America for a conference with President Roosevelt. The passenger manifest for that voyage was a curious mixture. Churchill... British press giant Lord Beverbrook, Averill W. Harriman, plus half of Whitehall, Churchill's military chiefs of staff, and 5,000 German prisoners of war. In addition, there were a few million unwelcome passengers, lice eggs. The presence of lice and Churchill on the same ship threw the ship's officers in a panic. The vermin had been traced to dock workers in Suez who had unloaded the Queen Mary and had left behind some of their outer clothing in trade for garments stolen from the ship's company quarters. 
The ship's sanitary officer had gassed the live lice, but knew that the prolific vermin had undoubtedly laid millions of eggs which couldn't be destroyed by the insecticide. Fortunately, the incubation period for lice is six days, and the Queen Mary could beat that record across the Atlantic. The ship's officers had another worry about the PM's presence. They were concerned over his security with 5,000 German prisoners of war on board. When Churchill discovered plans to transfer the prisoners to another ship, he had the order cancelled. It had been suggested that they should be transferred to another ship, Churchill wrote in his hinge of fate. But I could not see what harm they could do to us. Under due control and without weapons, and since the point was referred to me, I had given instructions that they should come along. When he was told of lice, Churchill snarled, I can scratch as well as anyone. But for Churchill, there was even a greater crisis. The Queen Mary's 27 bars were dry for the war. However, ship's officers saw to it that she was wet at least on main deck. Field Marshal Alan Brooke attests to this in his diary account of a steward pouring water in champagne glasses and was yelled at by Churchill, Stop pouring all that water out. It's too depressing a sight. Churchill had often said that he would not be captured alive. The possibility faced him when he was at sea. He inspected his assigned lifeboat and ordered that a machine gun be installed on the stern. Back in Norfolk, Virginia, Commodore Knowles plotted the Mary's safest course from the latest intelligence reports. A worrisome task because the Queen had to pass through a submarine Piccadilly, the name tag for the spot in the Atlantic where U-boats lurked. The safest course, Knowles believed, was a southerly route toward Cape Finisterre, crossing the U-boat's lanes at right angles. She made it without even hearing a peep out of the underwater craft. On the return trip to the Clyde, however, the Queen Mary was narrowly missed by an explosion 300 feet abeam as she steamed 700 miles off England, with 15,000 American troops on board. The explosion set off one of the few general quarters alarms on the ship. What caused the explosion is still a mystery. Commodore Bissett explained it away as perhaps a spent torpedo at the end of its run, or maybe it was a mine. Churchill was aboard the Queen Mary again August 4th, 1943, with his wife Clementine, his daughter Mary, Harriman, his personal physician, Lord Moran, and his chiefs of staff. The Mary was bound for Quebec for the first Allied conference to plan the Normandy invasion. Main deck was again used to quarter the Churchill party, and the forward smoking room was converted into a plotting room with charts and maps covering the bulkheads. Churchill had brought along models of the Mulberry Harbors, the artificial harbors that were to be used on the beaches of Normandy to assist in landing men and equipment. Churchill wanted to test the harbors before he presented the design to the Allied forces. While a general and an admiral made waves in one of the Mary's giant bathtubs, Churchill floated the harbors hour upon hour, watching how they reacted to the wave action. Clementine finally gave up the idea of bathing in her own tub and went to the next stateroom to borrow the bath of Lorna Wingate, the wife of Brigadier Ord Wingate, Churchill's military chief of staff. It was lucky she did. Churchill kept the bath busy with the Mulberry Harbors until 2 a.m. With even such important personages as Churchill aboard, the Queen Mary was primarily a troop ship and a workhorse at shuttling troops across the Atlantic. Each troop load got a special talking to by Sir Bissett, who carefully explained the importance of the rich murals, fine woods, and artwork on the Queen Mary. He pleaded that the troops not deface the artwork and offered as an alternative the 750-foot-long teakwood railing on the promenade deck as a tree to carve your initials on. The one-third mile-long railing was carved with names, nicknames, initials, girlfriends' names, dates, and even one expertly sculptured nude woman. But not one wall or mural was scratched by the G.I.s, a fact Sir Bissett called an example of the discipline of the American troops. Sir Bissett wanted the carved railing left intact when the Queen Mary resumed her luxury years as a fitting memorial to the brave American fighting men who sailed her to war. 
Kinnard didn't agree, and had the railing planed and sanded to remove the carvings. All except a six-foot piece, which was removed and sent to the U.S. Army archives as a wartime memento. New Zealand troops outfoxed Cunard by pulling out bureau drawers and writing their names on the underside of the drawer, a fact uncovered after the ship retired in Long Beach and was undergoing a refurbishing. There was one mural damaged, but by the officers, not the enlisted men. The officers used drawing pins, thumbtacks, to tack up notices in the veranda grill, explained John Smith, Cunard's public relations chief. They managed to poke some nasty holes in Doris Zenkaisen's mural that took a bit of touching up after the war. Sir Bissett wasn't at all wrong about the discipline of the American GI. He had an excellent chance to prove it when the Mary sailed out of New York at low water with 15,000 troops aboard. The course would pass over the top of the Hudson Tunnel, and the navigator calculated the ship's draft would be less than four feet as the ship sailed over the tunnel. A sudden shift in her weight, such as thousands of GIs moving about the decks at the same time, might cause the ship to strike the tunnel. Cunard's protest of the tunnel's construction in the 1930s was now beginning to make sense. However, Colonel Dennis solved the problem of troop movement on deck by alerting the troops to the problem, and at the hour the Mary was ready to sail over the tunnel, he called out attention on the ship's loudspeaker. It worked, Sir Bissett said. I've never in my life seen grown men stand so still. The Queen kept a railroad schedule to and from New York and the Clyde delivering American troops for the invasion of Normandy. With the invasion underway and well entrenched inside Europe, Churchill boarded the Queen Mary again, September 6, 1944, for another Quebec conference. He was battling a bout of pneumonia. Making matters worse, the Queen Mary was traveling in the warm waters of the Gulf Stream and the ship, without air conditioning, heated up miserably. Churchill preferred working at night, after the ship cooled down, a fact George Moore, a telephone operator aboard, will attest to. Churchill was out of sorts because of his illness. He became angry once when I declined to ring up his staff at 3 a.m. He used some unkind words. It was no use telling him the party he wanted was asleep, unless you wanted your eardrums burst. After the invasion of Europe, the Queen Mary began a dual role. She was hauling troops to Europe as fresh replacements and returning westward as a hospital ship with the wounded. These return trips were some of her most tender voyages, recalled Late Wright, who was an Army major and a former Kansas City, Missouri Presbyterian minister, was the Queen Mary's wartime Protestant chaplain. When the war in Europe ended, May 7, 1945, the Queen Mary had chalked up a record unsurpassed by any ship in the world, even by her big sister, Queen Elizabeth. She had transported 810,730 troops to Europe, and in doing so steamed 569,943 nautical miles. But she was not finished yet with her war duties. The U.S. War Department ordered that the Queen be used exclusively for westbound voyages to bring home the American troops, first the wounded, and the men who had been prisoners of war, and then the thousands of G.I.s who were returning home as conquering heroes. End of Chapter 5 Chapter 6 A Bride Ship The war was over in the Atlantic Theater, the Queen Mary turned on her lights at night and took the black paint off her portholes. The ship looked alive. A proposal was made to use the Queen as a troop ship for the Pacific, but President Harry Truman rejected the idea. Instead, the Queen Mary would be used for a bigger mission, getting the American troops home from Europe. The Queen Mary, built for a lifetime of running back and forth between New York and England, had visited many strange ports in the war. Trinidad, Cape Town, Fremantle, Sydney, Simonstown, Hobart, Freetown, Trincomalee, Singapore, Bombay, Suez, Key West, Rio de Janeiro, Halifax, Boston, Eden, and Massawa. But now she was destined for straight runs between New York and England again, lugging back thousands of American troops, many of those she had taken over to England. 
Her decks were a sea of khaki when she arrived in New York, June 15, 1945, with her first load of returning Americans. 14,526 veterans, mostly wounded or recently liberated from prisoner of war camps. As she edged up the river, whistles were blowing, horns were honking, and bells were ringing. It was the noisiest welcome the Queen had received in New York since her maiden voyage on another June day in 1936. She was alongside the dock at 1 p.m., and the first soldier down the gangway was Lieutenant John Gilbert Winnant, Jr., 23-year-old son of the U.S. Ambassador to England, John Winnant, Sr. Lieutenant Winnant was a Flying Fortress pilot who was shot down over Munster, Germany, October 1943, on his 13th mission. He had been liberated the Saturday before VE Day and flown to England for a reunion with his father and then scheduled for the Queen Mary trip home. Returning on the same voyage was Representative George Grant of Troy, Alabama, who was to report to Congress on the food conditions in war-torn Europe. Hardly had she unloaded the troops than the Mary was at sea again, steaming past a German submarine surrendering to a small flotilla of U.S. destroyers. I watched the little drama of the surrender from the air, Navy Lieutenant Ray Rhodes recalled. The Queen Mary steamed by some five miles. She seemed so majestic as she steamed along, completely ignoring the events off her starboard side of a surrendering sub that hadn't been able to tag her in all those months of crossing the Atlantic unescorted. Each time the Queen arrived with more troops, her welcomes seemed to get bigger. But a group of Canadian GIs didn't think the Queen was playing at cricket. They had been scheduled to sail on her for home when they heard a rumor that they had been displaced by a troopload of Yanks. To make matters worse, it was the 4th of July. The Canadians decided to hold a rebellion of their own and proceeded to wreck the London suburb of Altershot. But it proved to be just a rumor and 8,000 Canadians were taken aboard, along with 6,759 Americans, when the Mary sailed from Glasgow, Scotland, July 7, 1945. To show there were no hard feelings, the U.S. Army band that greeted the ship on her arrival July 11th played God Save the King in honor of the Canadians. The Canadians, in tribute, tossed English copper and silver coins onto the pier until it was nearly covered with coins. On another voyage later that July, American GIs staged a minor rebellion of their own aboard ship when two pet dogs the GIs had smuggled on board were discovered by ship's officers. They were then chloroformed and buried at sea. The Americans were bloody well upset over that debacle, remembered Francis McGarry, a crewman. However, the ship's officers had missed one dog a tiny white mongrel smuggled on board by Sergeant John R. Miller of Queensbury Parish. Sergeant Miller, a crew chief with the 9th Air Force, said the people of Tull, France, has given him the puppy. Six members of the royal family of Saudi Arabia were among the 150 civilian passengers, all delegates to the United Nations meeting in San Francisco on the Queen's return voyage August 6th. But there were no royal suites aboard. The royalty shared the same fare as the G.I.s, even to sleeping on canvas bunks. On this trip, the Queen Mary was headed for Southampton for the first time in six years. When she turned up the Solent, still wearing her ugly camouflage gray, the greeting by the English was equal to her triumphant entry into the harbor after winning the Blue Ribbon in 1938. The English wanted the Mary back and Great Britain's new Prime Minister, At Lee, was insistent about her return to England's control. President Truman rejected the demand, but noted in his memoirs that At Lee's cable was of the utmost frankness in the demand for the return of the Queen Mary and the Queen Elizabeth. At Lee was under great pressure at home to bring British servicemen back to England, many who had been away from their homes for the duration of the war, a compromise was worked out, and other ships were assigned to bring home the British soldiers. When the Queen Mary sailed from Southampton August 17th, she carried in her compartments the famous Old Hickory Division, the 13th Infantry Division, the outfit that had moved from Normandy to the Elbe River at a cost of 20,000 Purple Hearts. As the Mary reached New York August 22nd on the evening tide, she was met by an escort vessel, 
the Army boat Captain William Cassidy, which was flying the Tennessee state flag. On board, the Army craft was Tennessee Governor Jim McCord, who said he came to New York to welcome Andy Jackson's troops home. There were 14,876 troops on board, and it appeared that all were on the top decks to witness the homecoming. Two Japanese flags, liberated from Japanese embassies in Germany, were flying out the portholes. The first man down the gangway was Technical Sergeant Francis S. Curry of Hurleyville, New York, a Congressional Medal of Honor winner. Dogs weren't the only things the American GIs were smuggling home on the Queen Mary. Customs agents were kept busy searching the giant liner for weapons smuggled back as souvenirs by the war vets. Enough explosives were found on one voyage, a New York customs agent said, to blow that ship out of the water. Each trip she made, the Mary had almost a division of men returning from the war. On November 11, 1945, the ship crept up the Hudson in New York under a heavy fog curtain with 14,500 troops of the 35th Infantry Division. You couldn't see the ship for the fog, recalled New York longshoreman James Wright, but you could hear the boys cheering a mile up the river. Inside the Mary's wireless room, Radio Officer William S. McLaughlin had received a welcome home message for the 35th Infantry, signed by Captain Harry S. Truman. President Truman had been a captain in the 35th Division in World War I, but a buck private, not a president nor a general, walked down the gangway first when the Mary tied up. He was Private Almon Conger of Tacoma, Washington, chosen as the one millionth GI to return from Europe. Getting off the ship always seemed bogged by endless delays for the returning GIs. As they waited to debark this time, Tommy Dorsey's orchestra and Martha Ray were at pier side welcoming them home. The soldiers beat rhythm on the steel hull of the Queen as Dorsey's orchestra played old familiar tunes. On her return voyage to New York with another 14,500 troops, New York port pilot Herman Jaff met the Mary and climbed up the Jacob's Ladder to guide the ship into port. A hand reached out to help him on board, and a familiar voice called out, Hello, Dad. Welcome to the Queen Mary. It was his 23-year-old son, Lieutenant Lee Jaff, of the 63rd Division, whom he had not seen for 32 months and did not know was aboard the Queen Mary. A civilian passenger aboard for that trip was Roy C. Denslow of Trenton, Missouri, head of the Royal Ark Masons, who was returning to America after a 20,000-mile, two-month trip to study war damage to Masonic property in Europe. On one of the last voyages of 1945, a civilian passenger had been squeezed on with the 8th and 9th Air Corps units returning from Europe. The passenger was Kathleen Kennedy, a widow of the Marquis of Harrington, who had been killed in action in France shortly after the Normandy invasion. She herself would tragically die in a plane crash in France in 1948 to add to the strange mysticism that surrounds the Kennedy family. Also on board that trip was two-year-old terrier Spotty, belonging to Private First Class James Caputo of Hamilton, New Jersey. For this trip, the dog was an official passenger. A Red Cross nurse found the white-haired terrier wandering on the pier of Southampton, wearing the official insignia of the 70th Division, including a good conduct ribbon and a service bar. Private Caputo had pinned a note on the dog's uniform explaining that he had to leave the dog behind and pleading for someone to care for him and to write Caputo a letter assuring him the pet was in good hands. The nurse was touched by the note and wrangled space on board the Queen Mary for Spotty. Actually, Caputo had been caught smuggling the animal aboard the Queen Elizabeth and was forced to put him ashore. The Mary's first voyage in 1946 brought back the famed 82nd Airborne. Their commanding general, Major General James M. Gavin, told a New York press conference his troops had talked of nothing else but, when we get back, we'll parade right up Fifth Avenue. We walked all over this damned world and we're going to walk all the way, he said. It is one of those things a soldier dreams about. It was obvious General Gavin hadn't talked this over with his troops. As they marched off the ship, they were singing, To hell with parades, we want to go home. They marched up Fifth Avenue, but even if they had their wish to go straight home, they would have found long waiting lines. 
The Pennsylvania station was receiving 25,000 requests daily for train space, and only 2,000 spaces were available. A war bride arrived with the 82nd, Mrs. Emily Glass, a young Englishwoman from Luth, England, who had married Senior Sergeant Robert H. Glass when he was a medic with the 465th Headquarters Group stationed in England. Mrs. Glass was a hardship case allowed to come on the Mary with the troops. The hardship was Stephen, Sean, and Robert Jr., seven-month-old triplets. Captain Robert M. Phillips, the 82nd's chaplain, baptized the infants at sea, and 8,800 members of the 82nd Airborne stood up as godfathers. The Paraglide, the Airborne's shipboard newspaper, banner-lined, Troopers Adopt Triplets. The story said, This is a climax to a love affair that started when the Queen Mary left Southampton. Private William Wolfe started a college fund for the triplets with a $1 donation and collected 8800 before the Mary arrived in New York. The American soldiers were so wonderful, Mrs. Glass chirped. They just did about everything, but none volunteered to wash the 36 diapers a day. Mrs. Glass was one of the 11 war brides who were considered hardship cases for that voyage. They were pioneering a new role for the Queen Mary ferrying 9,000 war brides and their 4,000 children to America and another 10,000 to Canada. When the Queen Mary sailed for Southampton January 18, 1946, she was headed for this new career. At Southampton, some of her war trappings were stripped away to make the ship more suited for the task of hauling war brides. Kinnard designed a special collapsible baby chair to fit on the dining room chairs and equipped rooms for washing and ironing and for the first time since the war years, reopened the ship's nursery. There was no time to strip the mascara of war paint, but workmen did remove the armament to make the floating nursery ready for sailing in February. The Queen Mary, moving thousands of British war brides and their broods, was news but the British Ministry of War Transportation rejected applications for American war correspondents to travel with the brides. The resourceful newsman appealed directly to President Truman and Prime Minister Attlee. The ban was lifted several hours before the February 5, 1946 sailing. The scramble of the correspondents to get on board was all in vain. The ship, with 1,706 brides and their 640 children, was stranded in Southampton when a gale whipped up the English Channel. After a day's delay, the ship sailed February 5th. The first bride aboard was Elva Abbott, who was to join her husband Clayton in Brewer, Maine. Isn't it wonderful, she beamed. You wouldn't have thought so by the tearful goodbyes on the docks as parents of the brides came from all parts of the British Isle to wave and weep. The weather was calm, but the brides were seasick, or so it appeared. The poor dears had been starved for chocolates, Captain Charles G. Illingworth, the Mary's bride skipper, said. When they found the canteens loaded with sweets, I'm afraid they overindulged. The first bride voyage was a day late in leaving, and another day late in arriving. Husbands paced impatiently on the pier. Trying to console them was a lone woman, Mrs. Nancy Burroughs of Bennington, Vermont. She was waiting for her male war bride, Royal Navy Lieutenant Commander Robert H. Burroughs, who was traveling with almost 2,000 brides as the sole war groom. Quite interesting, he commented. Colonel William R. Barnett, the Army Transport Commander who traveled back and forth on the Queen with thousands of GIs, was also in charge of this delicate cargo. But Women's Army Corps Captain Rada Longenecker of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, was assigned to help him over the rough spots. He admitted little experience in handling diaper washing and 2 a.m. feeding problems. Crunching chunks of ice with her mighty prow, the Queen eased into Pier 90 with her first load of war brides. Captain Illingsworth said he had slowed the ship for a more comfortable ride for the ladies, in explaining his late arrival. Major Selig Frund of New York City, the Army's ship doctor, reported that he had treated four cases of measles and had given prenatal care to 404 expectant mothers. The average age of the brides was 22, 
but one, Mrs. Dora A. McKeever, who wasn't a bride at all, but a 65-year-old grandmother, proved to be the most experienced hand aboard in handling crises. She was from Aberdeen, Scotland, and bound for America to join her son, an American citizen, in Piedmont, California. The brides lived six to a stateroom, less crowded than the 18 to a stateroom when the Mary carried troops. Lieutenant Commander Burroughs, the lone male war bride, was assigned to quarters with the ship's officers. He had met his American wife in Washington, D.C. during the war while she was a Women's Army Corps sergeant. It was a sad journey for Mrs. Kathleen Ramsey, who was notified after the ship sailed that her husband, Army Corporal John Ramsey of Wilmette, Illinois, had died of war wounds. A tugboat strike had strangled shipping in New York on this first war bride arrival, but Army tugboats came to the Mary's rescue, and the only noise from the striking tuggers was cheers for the brides. However, the strike did delay the Mary's sailing on February 12th, for Southampton, where 2,300 war brides and their children were already assembled and waiting. Finally, on February 15th, the ship pulled out of the harbor and took on a million gallons of fuel oil from the seagoing tanker Peter Ural. A 12-hour ordeal of siphoning fuel oil aboard through two six-inch hose lines. She got underway the following day. The Mary's sister ship, the Queen Elizabeth, sailed from New York February 21st for Southampton after completing her last wartime duty and was headed for dry dock for conversion to a luxury liner. She was six years old and had never carried a passenger as a luxury ship. The Elizabeth's skipper, Captain C.M. Fuller, made a prediction on the sailing that steamships will not suffer from post-war transocean air travel because of the discomfort of air travel. There is a problem, he said, of getting stuck on an aerodome for days because of fog. You can make planes, he added, but you can't make weather. And then he concluded that the lady of the family will have a large say, and I rely on the women of America to keep us going. Mrs. Emily Weaver, an 88-year-old New Yorker, proved Captain Fuller wrong on March 10, 1946. She had crossed the Atlantic 35 times, many aboard the Queen Mary, during peacetime, but now she took the maiden flight of the American Overseas Airlines flagship, Erie, to Copenhagen. She found the experience thrilling. A year earlier, the real doom to the Queen was tested and proved successful on a military fighter plane. Jet propulsion. On her second bride voyage, the Queen Mary delivered 1,667 brides and their 585 children. It was almost routine now, but on the third voyage, with the Queen Mary one day out of New York with 1,840 war brides and 600 children, Mrs. Pauline Edith Smith, 23, of Manchester, England, began having labor pains. She was only in her seventh month. Captain Carl F. Glink, an army surgeon, delivered the premature boy in a deck smoking lounge, which had been converted into a ship's hospital. He fashioned an incubator out of egg crates, but the homemade rig was fast exhausting the ship's emergency oxygen supply. The wireless room sent off an urgent message to the United States Coast Guard for six tanks of oxygen. The ship was 50 miles east of the Nantucket lightship. A Coast Guard PBM took out with the oxygen and set down at sea alongside the Queen Mary, which had halted engines to allow the transfer of oxygen tanks. Army Chaplain Major Lay O. Wright baptized the infant Lay Travis Smith. Nine hours later, the child died. When the ship arrived the next day, a tiny casket, improvised in the ship's carpenter shop from wooden packaging crates, was brought down the gangway by two crewmen and placed in an awaiting hearse. Watching the tableau was former Senior Sergeant Russell Dow Smith, who was on the dock to greet his wife and daughter Pauline, age two. He was unaware of the birth and death of his son. A familiar figure came aboard the Queen Mary for her return voyage to England. This time, Winston Churchill was just a passenger. Churchill had made a speech in the United States at a small college in sleepy Fulton, Missouri, but that speech at Westminster College would add a new word to the English language. Churchill warned that an iron curtain 
had fallen across the continent. To describe our World War II ally, Russia, in that manner in 1946 was controversial, and Churchill was catching the devil for it. Yet, on the same March 21st voyage, Churchill shared a table with Prince George and Princess Marie of Greece, who were returning to their homeland and to the first free country that would feel the Iron Curtain closing in around it in one of the first struggles against communism in the post-war period. Private passengers such as Churchill were allowed to travel on return trips to England, but because Cunard didn't yet have control of the ship to bring the Queen Mary back to her opulence, the steamship company charged only $212 for a one-way ticket from New York to Southampton. The fare was considered first class and called Transport Grade A. On this voyage, the ship carried 1,731 passengers and almost her capacity for all three classes. When the Queen Mary arrived back in New York on her fourth bride voyage with 1,712 brides and 620 children, there were two wheelchair brides aboard. Betty Jenks, the wife of U.S. Navy Chief Petty Officer Thomas Jenks of Queens, New York, had been crippled in a jeep accident in England. Mrs. Glenn A. Wilcox, wife of a former Army Sergeant from Omaha, Nebraska, had lost both her legs in a German Blitz of London. By special arrangement, her husband was aboard, sharing a honeymoon on the Queen Mary. Also aboard for this fourth trip was Sir Ian Habron, who was en route to receive the Priestly Medal from the American Chemical Society in Atlantic City, New Jersey, for his work as an organic chemist in perfecting penicillin. On the return trips, the Mary began to take on her old self. More and more distinguished passengers made up her manifest. On the next return voyage, the passengers included the Earl of Athlone, retiring Governor General of Canada and his wife, Princess Alice, Frederico Jimenez O'Farrell, Mexican ambassador to Great Britain, who was traveling with his wife and their 18-month-old twins, Alfonso and Maria, and Miss Sheila MacDonald, daughter of Ramsay MacDonald, the prime minister who had fought so hard to block the government subsidy of the Queen Mary. The fifth bride voyage brought 2,334 brides and 699 children to New York on April 21st. Mrs. Lonnie Perry came ashore with a huge bouquet of irises given to her in honor of being the 10,000th war bride to arrive in the United States. She was a London girl going from the world's largest city to one of the world's smallest, Albemarle, North Carolina, population 4,060, the hometown of her husband a former army major. When nine-month-old twins Paula and Naomi Wagner came off the ship, all you could see was the top of their carrot-red hair sticking above the sides of a canvas laundry basket their mother, Jean, used to carry them ashore to meet their father, Leon, of Chicago, Illinois. At the end of the sixth bride voyage, bringing 1,299 brides and 179 children to New York, May 10, 1946, Colonel William Barnett, the Army Transport Commander, packed his bags and walked down the gangway for the last time. He was leaving after 105 crossings. He was through, and the Queen delivered the last war bride, Mrs. Joan Keller of Sheffield, England, to America for a reunion with her ex-paratrooper husband, Gerald. But the Queen's bride-hauling days were not over. She began bringing the British war brides of Canadians to Halifax. The Queen Mary had carried gold bullion, goldfish, troops, and war brides, but the luggage of British bird painter Lieutenant Commander Peter Scott gave the baggage master some second thoughts. Scott's luggage included cages of snakes, alligators, turtles, and birds. Why? asked the baggage master. To replace those lost at the London Zoo during the Blitz, Scott replied. The baggage master accepted all the menagerie except the alligators. This is no blooming Noah's Ark, you know, he told Scott. I don't like the idea of snakes aboard, but there is too great a possibility the alligators might escape. The ship plied between Southampton and Halifax, hauling war brides and children. On the return trips to England, the Queen made port in New York to pick up passengers. She was not up to her luxurious self, but she was doing big business in providing travel between New York and England. The passenger list had the flavor of the old Mary, with personages like David Sarnoff, 
Dr. Lise Meitner, the Australian nuclear physicists Mrs. James Forrestal, Mrs. James Doolittle, Lester Pearson, then Canadian Ambassador to the United States Baron Robert Rothschild, Mrs. Anthony Eden, and Lieutenant General William N. Haskell, Executive Director of CARE. She was carrying a few unauthorized passengers, too. One trip, ten stowaways were caught, six men, three minor boys, and a woman, all trying to reach America. The woman, Caroline Ivy Vaughn, a 30-year-old London dress shopmaker, told authorities she had been jilted by an American serviceman who promised marriage and she was coming to the United States to find her suitor. On one return voyage, the ship carried 61 priceless paintings of the 18th and 19th centuries and valued at $5 million. The paintings had been on display in the Art Institute in Chicago and were being returned to the London galleries. The Mary also carried the ashes of Harold L. Silver of Queens, New York, an American citizen who, as a volunteer, was on the first voyage of the Queen Mary when she left Sydney, Australia, with troops for England. The urn, draped in both British and American flags, was dropped in the North Atlantic as his last will. The Queen sailed from Southampton September 14, 1946, bound for Halifax, with 2,076 war brides. When she reached Canada, her wartime duty was over. One of the last passengers on that voyage was General Dwight Eisenhower. The ship avoided New York on this voyage. The tug strike was still on, and ending her wartime service, the Queen was anxious to get back into her ermine robes. As if she were rushing back to the throne she had exiled to fight a war, the Queen Mary arrived in Southampton on the fastest trip of her career, three days, 22 hours, and 42 minutes. Kinnard, however, did not claim the record because the blue ribbon she had already won was traditionally the run from Ambrose Lightship in New York to Bishop's Rock off England. She was still gray from the war, but her sister Queen Elizabeth was already repainted red, black, and white, the Cunard colors, and was making ready for her first luxury maiden voyage on October 16, 1946. The Elizabeth was booked solid for that voyage, with some passengers who had made reservations in 1938. The Queen Mary did not sail again for almost a year. 4,000 workmen, many of them brought to Southampton from the John Brown shipyards in Clydebank, swarmed over the ship to begin stripping the troop fittings away in what has been described as the greatest reconversion job ever undertaken on a merchant ship. Thousands of makeshift berths, temporary wooden bulkheads, steel plates, and other non-luxury accommodations had to be dismantled and removed. 10,000 army blankets and as many canvas cots were put ashore. The ship's interior looked like a maze of monkey bars as scaffolding was set in place. The decks resounded with the hammers chipping and scaling paint. The wooden decks, pockmarked from GI hobnailed boots, were wholly stoned smooth. The teakwood handrails were planed and sanded clean of wartime whittlings. The furnishings and fittings, scattered halfway around the world in New York and Sydney, were shipped to Southampton. The preservation of these luxury fittings, many of which were period furniture, saved Cunard thousands of dollars. England, in one of its worst periods of austerity and still on strict rationing, could not have provided such furnishings. The task of sorting and renovating such a large quantity of furniture required Kinnard to lease the huge aircraft hangars at Eastleigh for the job. Workmen overhauled the ship's boilers. Other engine room equipment was taken apart and inspected for worn parts. 4,000 miles of electric cabling was traced inch by inch in search of worn wiring. Skilled woodworkers went over the wood paneling, renewing the rare woods. A new cinema, large enough for 200 people, was built on the starboard side. Two garden lounges were added to the port and starboard sides of promenade deck, and a cocktail lounge to the main restaurant. Air conditioning was installed in the public rooms. By May 4, 1947, the Queen was ready for dry docking at the King George V graving dock, still the largest dry dock in the world, and one built especially to handle the 1,000-foot Queen Mary. As the ship was being eased toward the dry dock, high winds were raking the harbor. 
The queen was just at the mouth of the dock when the winds caught her broadside and carried her toward the quay side wall. For seven desperate hours, seven tiny tugs strained in a seesaw battle to hold back disaster, the crushing of the starboard side against the concrete dry dock walls. Finally, the winds shifted and the queen's charmed life was saved. In dry dock, she got her first complete overhaul in nearly seven years. Her war paint was stripped, her four bronze propellers were removed, and the entire underwater portion of the hull was scaled of barnacles. Like a giant cocoon, the metamorphosis from troop ship to luxury liner was completed in dry dock. Her newly appointed skipper, Captain C.G. Illingworth, who had been with Cunard for 37 years, part of it on the Mary, took her out to sea trials July 24, 1947. The next day, while thousands of sightseers braved foul weather lining the shores of the Isle of Wight to watch, the Queen Mary and the Queen Elizabeth steamed past each other, the Mary coming back from sea trials and the Elizabeth bound for America. The Elizabeth saluted her elder sister with three short and three long blasts of her horn. The Mary returned the salute. The eleven-year-old Queen Mary, born in a depression, had survived mankind's greatest war and was now ready to reclaim her crown as the Grand Monarch of the North Atlantic. End of Chapter 6 Chapter 7 Her New Luxury Years Her brass polished, her decks caulked and wholly stoned bleach white, her woods restored to look like new veneer, and her bulkheads freshly painted. The Queen had her old glamour as she loaded 1,867 passengers on board at Southampton July 31, 1947, for her first peacetime voyage since the bleak September day in 1939. The Queen Elizabeth had been handling passenger trade for almost a year, and now she was making ready to sail from New York on a parallel eastbound voyage a route planned for the two leviathans before either vessel was built. The two giant queens would sail in opposite directions for the next 20 years, on timetables as regular as train schedules, passing each other in mid-Atlantic with a horn salute. A tall, graying American, Major General William J. Donovan, who headed the Office of Strategic Service in World War II, was a passenger on board. He had been touring Europe to inspect the tightening of the Iron Curtain, and would, like Churchill, sound a warning for a world at peace only two years. It was an uneventful crossing, slower than the Queen's previous luxury trips, but when she arrived in New York, the city, which had always been partial to the Queen Mary, let loose the pre-war peon to greet the stately three-stacker as she sailed up the Hudson. Bands were playing, boats were tooting, and people were cheering the monarch had regained her throne. Donovan told a dockside press conference that the Russians were engaging in psychological warfare and warned that it was going to be a long time before America could pull her troops out of Europe. He predicted a Cold War. Captain Illingworth, asked by a newsman why the Queen was so slow on this trip and why she hadn't tried for a new speed record, snapped, Why should we? We hold the record now. And after all, it costs money to burn the extra fuel to obtain the added burst of speed. The Queen Elizabeth, younger and seasoned by war, had set no speed records either, and she never would exceed the Queen Mary's August 1938 record. On her turnaround voyage, the Queen carried Lady Nancy Astor, the Virginia-born former member of the British Parliament, Senator Elmer Thomas of Oklahoma, and Congressman Orville Zimmerman of Missouri who were en route to a United Nations conference on agriculture in Geneva, and Mrs. Edna Blue, chairman of the Foster Parents Plan for War Children, Incorporated, who was headed for Europe on a seven-week tour to find needy children for Americans to help. Also on board was Lady Peel, the former actress Beatrice Lilly, who said she was still wondering when this place would get to England. A young American actress was aboard too, Elizabeth Taylor, 15 years old. The Mary was her old self. She had all the opulence of an old British hotel built into her. 
The bathtub in one of her first class staterooms was so large it would take up the entire bathroom space in a comparable compartment on other passenger liners. Even tourist class cabins were large and spacious. There was something different about this ship. I can't tell you exactly what it is, said Harold Blakey, a crewman who served her since the maiden voyage. She is aged for a ship, but she still has that graceful, beautiful look of a real lady. She is like a child that almost died at birth. There is something special in the way you treat such a child, regardless of her age. The crewmen felt that way about the Mary. They made the passengers feel that way too. The cuisine on the Queen Mary was among the best served anywhere in the world. Cunard trained its chefs in the world's leading restaurants before allowing them aboard a luxury liner like the Queen Mary. They had to excel in every form of preparing a meal. There were few dishes the chefs could not prepare, and they were so confident of this that the daily menu challenged the diner to order something they couldn't prepare. A Greek lady at my table once asked for couscous, said Don Beasley, a Cunard waiter on the Queen Mary from 1958 to 1965. When the wheat and lamb steamed stew arrived, it won Grecian accolades. Southerners could get hominy grits for breakfast, but when they ordered Dr. Pepper, Cunard waiters went blank. The beverage, a favorite of Southerners, was never carried on the Queen Mary, a fact which caused one Cockney waiter to ask a passenger from Georgia, is this Dr. Pepper a health drink? Breakfast offered 80 choices of food, from ham and eggs to 11 different cereals and five kinds of toast. Tea was from Ceylon, India, and China, and high tea at 4.30 p.m. each day was as much a Queen Mary ritual as it is in Highburn. Such a variety of crumpets were served with tea that these delicacies proved to be the downfall of a brazen stowaway who was feeding himself at tea time in the first-class lounge. The stewards noticed he was a bit piggish about taking too many sweets. The evening meal was a seven-course dinner, and only once in the Queen's luxury years, on November 6, 1947, did passengers have to miss this sumptuous meal and settle for sandwiches. 2,000 passengers were aboard in Southampton for the westward voyage. When they went to the dining room for the evening meal, they discovered 500 crewmen, mostly waiters, stewards, and cooks, had walked off in a wildcat strike. Among those eating cold sandwiches that night were the Duke and Duchess of Windsor and Mr. and Mrs. Harold S. Vanderbilt. The strike was settled the next day, and the Mary sailed for New York. The strike had delayed her sailing, and she was late arriving in New York. To keep up her schedule, crewmen and shore personnel began a whirlwind operation to load her for a quick turnabout. When she sailed November 12th, she had a turnabout record of 25 hours and 35 minutes. The passenger list was like her early days. Among the 1,525 passengers were Bob Hope, Loretta Young, Robert Montgomery, Alexis Smith, Jennifer Jones, Noel Coward, Wesley Ruggles, Lee Ephraim, and novelist Daphne du Maurier. Bob Hope entertained the passengers in the main lounge for three nights straight, but all the hurry to turn around was in vain. A storm delayed her arrival in Southampton 12 hours. Storms at sea continued to plague the two queens' schedules. Quick turnarounds became a contest to keep up the timetables. In February 1948, the Queen Mary set a record of just five minutes over 24 hours in getting back to sea. Passengers seldom realized the colossal job of reloading a ship the size of the Queen Mary. To do it in 24 hours is a Herculean task, but the Queen Mary broke her own record by turning around in 23 hours and 35 minutes, April 8th. Fred W. Worrell, Cunard's victualling superintendent in New York, stood on the dock checking off the supplies. 6,650 tons of fuel oil, 5,000 tons of fresh water, 77,000 pounds of fresh meat, 27,500 pounds of poultry, 11,000 pounds of fresh fish, 66,000 pounds of potatoes, 33,000 pounds of fresh vegetables, 15,000 dozen eggs, 22,000 pounds of flour, 11,000 pounds of sugar, 
1,300 gallons of milk, 1,110 boxes of assorted fresh fruit, and 4,400 quarts of ice cream. When she came into port, 80,000 pieces of soiled linen had to be laundered and returned. On an average voyage, particularly after a rough crossing, up to 3,000 pieces of crockery and glassware had to be replaced. As the Queen sailed for England on her first turnaround, it was Captain Illingworth's last trip. He was ending 40 years of Cunard service as a Commodore in retirement. Captain G.C. Cove was appointed the Mary's new skipper. He was on a Christmas New Year's holiday when the Queen Mary anchored in the roadstead off Cherbourg, France, January 1, 1949, under the command of her staff captain, Harry Grattridge. She was there to take on 500 passengers for a westbound voyage. Cherbourg is a shallow port, and no quay is available for the Queen Mary to tie up. The ravages of war were still noticeable in the harbor. Winds up to 80 miles an hour buffeted the harbor. With his passengers safely on board, Captain Grattridge ordered the anchor hoisted. He watched from the bridge as the anchor detail struggled to get the anchor up. It was snarled in steel webbing of a German submarine net which had been destroyed by an Allied landing party in 1944 and lay on the harbor's bottom. The wind suddenly shifted the Mary's stern and Captain Gratteridge heard a sickening scraping sound. The Queen Mary, the second largest ship afloat, was hard aground on a sandbar in front of the Chavagnac Fort at the harbor entrance. The 1,740 passengers had settled back for a pleasant voyage to America Charles Lofton and Myra Hess sat in the main lounge chatting over tea. To everyone, except the crew, everything seemed normal. Captain Grattridge asked for French tugs to come out and tow the 81,237-ton vessel off the sandbar. Three tugs braved the winds, but the huge ship wouldn't budge. The passengers were told there might be a slight delay, so Dame Hess and Benno Moisewicz volunteered to give a piano concert in the main lounge to entertain the passengers. Senior baggage master Alec Harry Peerless winced. Dame Hess wanted her piano delivered from her stateroom to the lounge stage. Peerless had spent hours maneuvering the grand piano into her stateroom. Lofton gave one of his famous readings of the Bible, but nothing moved the mountain sitting on the sandbar. At high tide the next morning, the Mary was still stranded, she lay in a position where only her stern section was aground. Her forward section was afloat, keeping the mammoth Mary from listing. The winds had died down, and now sixteen tugs strained to free her. When she was refloated, Captain Grattridge sailed for Southampton, ninety miles across the English Channel, where she was docked until divers could go under the stern section and inspect her for damage. The Queen Elizabeth was in dry dock, undergoing a periodic overhaul. Workmen were preparing to pull the Elizabeth's propellers, but the work was cancelled because Kinnard feared she might have to be pulled out of dry dock and put into service if the Mary's damages were extensive, and the Mary might need the dry dock space. Berthed nearby was the Coronia, Kinnard's new 34,183-ton liner, preparing for her maiden voyage. Some of the Mary's passengers accepted Cunard's offer to sail on the Coronia, but she was too small to take all the Queen's passengers. The underwater inspection showed leaks in the stern section. To plug them, Cunard poured 100 tons of special quick-drying cement into the breach. The cement had to be mixed topside, hauled below in buckets, and poured into the spot where the ship was leaking. It took 4,000 bucket loads to seal the puncture. The Coronia sailed January 4th with 686 passengers on her maiden voyage to New York. The Queen Mary, her leak plugged, sailed the next day. She steamed past the Coronia two days later and beat her into New York. But even her speed wasn't fast enough for many travelers. Cunard was beginning to feel the pinch of air travel competition, and even the new Cunard slogan, getting there is half the fun, wasn't blocking the new mode of getting there in a hurry. For most passengers, a voyage on the Queen Mary was too much food, too much service, and too much luxury in a fast-moving world of the 1950s. 
The United States had laid the keel on a new $72 million, 990-foot superliner with an all-aluminum superstructure that would give the ship the capability of 36 knot speeds. But those were uncharted storms that the Queen Mary wasn't yet sailing into. Strikes, impenetrable fogs, gales, and storms at sea were realities she was now facing. In the Atlantic, in December 1951, the sea was a boiling cauldron. Ships were breaking up at sea. The Queen Mary was plowing through a hurricane-force wind. Tables, chairs, dishes, and glassware were being hurled about. A passenger was spilled out of his chair after it slid across the veranda grill and smashed against a bulkhead. He came up sputtering and still clutching the arm of his smashed chair. A waiter, also picking himself off the deck, quipped, Souvenir, sir. Seawater had sloshed through the open ports into the R-Deck main restaurant, eight stories up. Crewmen, on their hands and knees, sopped up the seawater with towels and squeezed the water into galvanized buckets while a few brave patrons ate dinner. Captain Grattridge, now the merry skipper, was one who braved the dining room. He had raised his fork to his mouth when an apple zoomed past his ear and smashed against the stainless steel serving bar to the left of the captain's table. The steward cried, Goal, sir! Captain Grattridge said the December voyage was the worst he had made since he went to sea in 1941. There is no other word for the seas than terrific, he said in describing how white water washed over the Mary's massive bow. Not all threats of storms were at sea in the 1950s. Captain Grattridge discovered he had invited Andre Gromico along with American and British military personnel to his cabin for a cocktail party at a time when the Korean War was raging. He found himself in the middle of a sticky political situation, but his tiger, Albert S. G. Marwick, quickly solved what could have been an embarrassing blunder. Captain Grattridge collected wind-up animals as a hobby, and he had his cabin lined with walking bears, hopping rabbits, and the like. Marwick busied himself winding up the menagerie to entertain the guests. They soon forgot their competing ideologies, Marwick said, while crawling around the deck like children, watching a bear that poured himself a drink every few steps. Marwick had more problems than entertaining the opposing atomic powers. Many passengers were under the mistaken belief that it was Marwick, as the captain's personal steward, who picked the six who shared the captain's table at dinner. Picking his table is a privilege so sacred, Marwick said, that not even Cunard dared dictate his choice. Captain Grattridge always liked to have three ladies and three gentlemen at his table with himself as the seventh. Marwick found himself constantly fending off offers to place a certain person at the captain's table. It was a delicate task of refusing without offending. The British are masters at saying no without offending, however. Cunard stewards were masters at being servants without being servile, and the British as a whole are masters at accepting the inevitable with complete grace. Cunard and the Queen Mary were about to be put to that test. In July 1952, the sleek new American superliner United States, under the command of Commodore Harry Manning, sailed out of New York just behind the Queen Elizabeth for the ship's maiden voyage. The Queen Mary, about the same hour, was sailing from Southampton. At 5 p.m. July 6, 1952, Captain Grattridge announced over the ship's loudspeaker, The United States, on her maiden voyage, is passing to our starboard. The Queen Mary's passengers, mostly Americans, rushed to the starboard rails to watch the shiny new ship steam toward Southampton, seven miles north of the Queen Mary's path. Captain Grattridge sounded the Queen Mary's horn, and ordered her colors dipped in a salute to the new ship. She was saluting the victor. When the United States arrived in Southampton, she had crossed in three days, ten hours, and forty minutes, and had claimed the blue ribbon for the United States for the first time in one hundred years. The last American ship to hold the title was the Pacific, which crossed in nine days, nineteen hours, and twenty-five minutes in 1851. Manning refused to fly the broom from the mast as a signal of victory when the ship entered Southampton, because he felt the signal, dating back to 1652, when Dutch Admiral Martin Harpert Zoon Tromp sailed defiantly up the English Channel after a battle with the British, with only a broom for a mast, 
would be an insult to the British. Especially, Manning said, since we took the blue ribbon from such a gallant and lovely lady as the Queen Mary. The Queen Mary had lost the coveted title of the fastest ship afloat. She would never again regain the blue ribbon. But in August 1966, after her fate was already sealed, she beat her 1938 crossing time. She was no longer the fastest, but she was still the choice of most veteran ship travelers, but even they were thinning out. King George VI had died in 1952, and England had a new crown head, Queen Elizabeth II. Her coronation was scheduled in May 1953. The Archbishop of Canterbury was returning to England on the Queen Mary to officiate at the ceremonies. Don Valenti, an ex-boxer who ran the Queen's gymnasium, helped the rotund bishop onto a vibrating machine and started the mechanism. The primate was jerked suddenly, and he tumbled off head first. I couldn't sleep for three nights, Valenti recalled, worrying that I had wrecked the coronation. What could have proved a more serious royal disaster involving the Queen Mary occurred in New York in November 1954. Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, had been visiting the United States and Canada and was returning home aboard the Mary. The Queen's skipper, Captain Donald Sorrell, had been replaced for the voyage by a Cunard Commodore, former Mary skipper Harry Grattridge. The crew felt this was an insult to their captain and called a strike. When Captain Sorrell got wind of the strike, he called the protest leaders to his cabin and in his gentle Welsh way explained that protocol called for the Cunard Commodore to take command of the ship when any member of the royal family was aboard. That nipped the strike. In 1956, the Queen Mary inadvertently became involved in an international child custody case that pitted the United States against Russia. Alex Trostov, a Russian, booked passage on the ship for himself and his American-born daughter, Tanya, too. He was returning to Russia by way of England. His divorced wife had legal custody of the child, and she filed a kidnapping charge against Twashtov. Immigration officers searched the ship for the child, but could not find her or Twashtov. The Queen Mary sailed, and Twashtov came out of hiding. By the time the Queen Mary reached Southampton, it was a full-blown international crisis between the United States and Russia, with Great Britain in the middle. The British barred Trostov from taking Tanya from England until the British courts could decide the U.S. claims that Tanya, an American citizen, was being taken to Russia against the wishes of her mother, who had legal custody. The court ruled in favor of the mother. The ship was still having troubles rolling in heavy seas, Cunard ordered the ship placed in dry dock and installed four wing-shaped stabilizers amidships. The stabilizers, two on either side, had an outreach of 12 and a half feet and were 7 feet 3 inches in width. Each pair of stabilizers worked independently of the other and were controlled from the bridge. The provided passenger comfort was long in coming. Cunard in April 1959 began discussions on building a new liner to replace the aging Queen Mary. By November 1960, the British government announced it was giving Cunard a direct grant of $9.1 million and a low-interest loan for $43.3 million for the construction of that new ship. The French had finished their new liner, the France. She was on her maiden voyage February 2, 1961, when she crossed parallel with the Queen Mary. The Mary flashed, You are a lovely lady. The France replied, But you'll always be a queen. But her days as a queen of the seas were numbered. In October 1963, Cunard board chairman, Sir John Brocklebank, announced the steamship company would build a 58,000-ton, 2,000-passenger, 960-foot liner, to replace the Queen Mary. Sir Brocklebank also announced a desperate move for the old Greyhound of the Atlantic. He said the Queen Mary would be used for winter cruises to Lisbon, Madeira, and Las Palmas for Christmas 1963. Using passenger ships for cruises to exotic ports was the steamship company's answer to the slipping profits lost to airlines. 
Even though the Queen Mary proved a popular ship for cruising, she was too big and too awkward to get in and out of small ports. Also, she was not air-conditioned, except in the public rooms, and that system, even though at the time it was installed was the biggest air-conditioning plant in the world, was often faulty. Perhaps the most ignominious incident in the life of the Queen occurred when she came into New York Harbor in 1964 and was cited by the New York Air Pollution Control for belching too much black smoke out of her funnels. The ship was fined $100 for the smoke violation on November 11, 1964. She was not only smoking too much, but the oil that created that smoke was costing too much. The Queen Mary, the ship that almost bankrupted Cunard in her construction, was now bankrupting the company by her operation. She was costing an average of $50,000 a day to keep her in service. She was losing up to $2 million a year on the North Atlantic run. By December 30th, 1964, her doom was sealed. Cunard signed a contract with John Brown Shipyards to build the Q4, the Queen Mary's replacement. This sleek, slim model would be used for around-the-world cruises by sliding easily through the Panama or Suez canals. The Queen Mary's Victorian spread of 118 feet couldn't. The keel of the new vessel was laid in July 1965 as Cunard celebrated its 125th anniversary. The new ship would burn only 500 tons of oil a day, and yet could carry as many passengers as the Queen Mary, but never in her style. The passengers on the Queen's later voyages were of her era, mostly older people, steeped in tradition and resisting the fast mode of jet travel. They were not as chic as her passengers once were, and not as many either. As few as 800 were making the crossing, and the 1,100 crewmen were stumbling over each other trying to serve them. In the 1960s, jet travel had eroded deeply into the ship's travel market. Economy class flights from New York to London were $300. Tourist class on Queen Mary was $496 discounted to $420 during the off-season. First-class jet travel was $712.50, while the Queen's fare started at $946. The Queen Mary had always feared being sunk by an airplane, not a submarine, bemoaned the ship's printer Jim Hawkins, and now it's finally happened. She had lived a charmed life, but now she was in troubled waters. She was living in the twilight of a way of life, too big, too costly, and too old. She could not recapture the joie de vivre of the past. This ship had not changed. The world had. The swinging 60s were the jet-set era. This was no place for a queen. She was now 30 years old, sagging and creaking with age, and showing rust lines in her steel complexion. She was that way in May 8, 1966, at sea headed for New York, when her new skipper, a Welshman named John Treasure Jones, who had only taken her command in February, opened a sealed message from Cunard headquarters. It told Captain Jones that the ship would be taken out of service and sold. To the silver-haired captain, it was a direct blow, a particularly painful message. He had first served aboard the Queen Mary as her first officer in 1953, and later as staff captain, and finally, her master. The last ship Jones had skippered was the Mauritania II. He had taken her to the shipbreakers at Inverkeething in December 1965. I walked down the gangway without looking back at her, he said. I could not bear looking at a ship that was to be broken up. The Queen Mary, he thought was now facing the breaker's hammer. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 The Final Transatlantic Voyage Captain Jones, English correct to the nth degree, hadn't reckoned with an Oklahoma country boy like Lloyd D. Hart or the tenacity of H.E. Bud Ridings Jr. If he had, he wouldn't have given the Cunard report more than a smile he would have had no fears about taking the Queen Mary to the breaker's yard. By the time Captain Jones opened the sealed message, Hart had already plotted his practical joke 
and writings had taken the bait. By July 1967, Long Beach had cinched the purchase, and while the Queen Mary rode out her last days back and forth between New York and Southampton, her future was being plotted in the box-like city hall in Long Beach, California. It was a frantic scramble to put together one great last cruise for the Queen of the Seas, a bit dowdy perhaps, but still every bit a lady. Writings is a get-it-done type of executive who abhors the everything-by-committee approach to a problem. While the committees were fretting, Writings bored in on the task of sailing the world's second-largest ship from one ocean to another, almost 15,000 miles around Cape Horn and through fall, winter, spring, and summer to Long Beach's harbor. He would not hear of Cunard's continual whining that such a voyage couldn't be made with passengers, he refused to bring the world's most loved luxury ship to Long Beach as a funeral ship with only a skeleton crew as Cunard recommended. He soon discovered, however, that such an epic voyage involved a logistics nightmare. The 31-year-old ship, without air conditioning, would have to cross the equator twice, enter into water she had never sailed, and be faced with fuel, food, water, and laundry problems that the ship had not had to contend with even during the hectic war years. Cunard was secretly hoping Long Beach would decide the last cruise was foolish and would accept the steamship company's offer to deliver the vessel with only a small crew. Too many uncertainties, argued Sir Basil Smallpiece, Cunard board chairman. But no one was going to turn the promised voyage around. Long Beach was determined to have a last great cruise. The city contracted with Fugazi Travel Bureau Incorporated of New York to put together the last cruise in an unheard of six weeks. Cunard officials, unable to convince Long Beach differently, shook their heads and muttered, This is the Yanks show. Let them run it. Writings flew to South America where he was joined by Horace Craddock, a blustery, flush-faced Fugazi executive who was born in India and still retained his English accent. Their mission was to line up supplies of food, water, fuel, and facilities to launder massive amounts of dirty linen. Craddock had the added responsibility of lining up shore tours for passengers. The Queen Mary would visit five ports in South America, and only at one, Balboa, Panama Canal Zone, would she be able to dock. Ridings had to arrange for tender service in the other four ports. It was a whirlwind trip with hundreds of details to accomplish. When Ridings and Craddock reached the last port, Acapulco, Mexico, they checked into a hotel, ordered a bowl of soup, and promptly fell asleep before the soup could be delivered. Back in Long Beach, the harbor commissioners had another problem. Finding dock space large enough for 1,019 and a half feet of Queen Mary. The space problem was finally resolved by relocating the Owens Parks Lumber Company, a dockside lumber yard on Pier E, to make room for the liner. Even at that, the giant liner extended some 600 feet beyond the north end of the pier. In Los Angeles, the Liberty Park Advisory Council had ordered a replica of the Philadelphia Liberty Bell cast at the same London foundry where the original bell was made in 1752. The bell was now ready to be shipped to the United States. Bernard F. Caymans, Advisory Council Chairman, got the Long Beach City Council to agree to bring the bell aboard Queen Mary. Long Beach scrapped plans for a traditional float to be entered by the city in the New York Rose Parade at Pasadena and rushed through construction of a 55-foot-long, 20-foot-wide float of the Queen Mary riding a crest of red roses. The whole city suddenly became Queen Mary conscious. A note was surreptitiously posted on the police department bulletin board warning that vice officers were no longer to refer to homosexuals as queens. Harry Fulton, special assistant to city manager John R. Mansell, became the city hall's Queen Mary specialist. He came to work one morning to find a picture of the Queen Mary, scotch taped to his office door, with the wording under it, Fulton's Folly. 
Mail concerning the Queen Mary was pouring into City Hall at the rate of 1,000 letters a day, and all of it dumped on Fulton's desk. I tried to keep a count, Fulton said wearily, but I had to give up after 8,700 in order to get my work done. Incoming telephone calls concerning the ship also ended up on Fulton's extension. His desk spindle was filled with speared callback messages. One caller was movie magnate Hal Roach, who suggested that Fulton have lunch with him, and I'll tell you some of the pitfalls of buying an old ship. Roach had bought an old ship for a movie and knew some of the pitfalls facing Long Beach. Fulton was so busy, he never had a chance to take Roach up on the luncheon engagement. It was too late for advice anyway, Fulton sighed. Fulton soon discovered that most callers had quick money schemes involving the Queen Mary or were trying to chisel a free ride on the last voyage. His stock answer was, put it in writing. This tactic discouraged most, but unfortunately, not all. Not only in Long Beach was the interest in the Queen Mary revived by the city's purchase. In New York, the World Ship Society got Cunard to open the ship for visitors when the Queen was laying over between voyages September 6th. Cunard thought only 100 or so society members would come aboard. To the company's surprise, more than 2,000 showed up, and paid one dollar each to tour the ship. They came from as far as Virginia, and by no means were they all members of the ship society. The crowds came dressed in Bermuda shorts and finely tailored Fifth Avenue suits, an odd mixture of ice cream liquors and cocktail sippers. Some had never been on a ship any larger than the Staten Island Ferry. Others had sailed on the Queen Mary before, perhaps only as a standee berth GI, but they came to say their own personal goodbyes to a famous old ship. Kennard, faced with an unexpected large crowd and remembering the souvenir filters back in 1936 when the ship was opened for inspection after her maiden voyage, sealed off most of the ship, confining the tour to areas that crewmen could watch. But after the Queen Mary sailed her 999th voyage, Captain Jones sat down at his dining table and noticed the centerpiece a three-foot silver rose bowl that had been presented to the ship for a safety record by Lloyd's of London, was missing. The bowl, valued at $700, had much more value in sentiment. Captain Jones was angered by the theft. He did an unprecedented thing. He ordered the ship searched. The bowl was not found. When the liner docked at Southampton, British customs officials searched every piece of luggage for the missing bowl, and police questioned each member of the crew. The bowl turned up a year later in a London hawk shop. Captain Jones had to prepare the Queen Mary for the return trip to New York, her 1,000th voyage as a luxury liner between the two ports, and her last. A leaden sky hung over Southampton, September 16, 1967 as the gray-haired skipper gave the command, a touch astern. The ship was underway with 1,500 passengers, mostly Americans, who were to take this last sentimental journey to New York. In a husky voice, Captain Jones spoke quietly of the ship he commanded. No finer ship ever sailed this ocean. There will never be another like her. I don't want this to be a nostalgic crossing. We will go out in a blaze of glory and then on to Long Beach. California's climate will be good for her. One of the passengers was a Queen Mary regular. Russell Abdill of Covington, Illinois, had crossed on the Queen Mary 35 times before. This was to be, he thought, his last trip. He thought so as he watched the Queen Mary tie up in New York, a ritual familiar to her and her crew for most of her 31 years. She had lingered at this pier from September 1939 to March 1940, and had been absent during the war until February 1942. But this was the last time she'd nestle against this pier, one built especially for her. At Clydebank, on the very spot where the Queen Mary had been built, Queen Elizabeth II let loose a bottle of champagne and pushed a button to release Cunard's latest passenger liner. The all-computerized Queen Elizabeth II, 
the ship built to replace the retiring Queen Mary. She was a mite compared to the Mary, just 58,000 tons and a mere 936 feet long. But when she splashed into the Clyde River, she sent a tidal wave of doom over the older members of the Cunard fleet. The new queen was taking the place of both the Queen Mary and the larger Queen Elizabeth in a world shriveled by jet propulsion. But would this miniaturized queen have the same mysticism about her as the Mary? Part of that mystic would be revealed before she sailed on the final return voyage to England. The Traveler's Aid Society held a benefit dinner dance aboard while she was in New York for the last time. 770 guests, dressed in the finery the old queen was accustomed to, came as much to say goodbye as to raise funds for the Traveler's Aid Society. It is a sad and happy occasion, said Mrs. W. Mallon Dickerson, benefit chairman who was recalling her own trip on the Queen Mary in 1959. I'm glad we can pay tribute to the Mary, but it is awful to think she's going to leave us. Mrs. Joseph Lauder, the New York cosmetics empress, stared at the massive ceiling in the main lounge. It was always like being served tea in a castle. I had to come and say goodbye. Mrs. Lauder would not be the last to say farewell to the Queen. On September 22nd, New York Mayor John Lindsay stalling a trip to Washington to meet with the U.S. Riot Commission, came aboard to say his farewell. His voice quaking, he said, You don't have to be British to love the Queen Mary. The mayor presented Captain Jones with a Defense Department citation for the liner's valiant role and outstanding support of the war effort. Lindsay handed Captain Jones a bronze medal from the city of New York and added, some will say that this is a sad day. Rather, it is a sentimental day. In some respects, it is a wonderful day. Wonderful in the sense our city and country are pausing to show this affection and to say hail and farewell to this great ship. Lindsay paused as if finished, then with a broad smile added, And besides, any day is a wonderful day just to see the massive magnificence of the Queen Mary move down our Hudson River no matter what voyage, her first or final. Captain Jones could add little. It is a sad and sentimental day for everyone, particularly my crew, he said. This crew loves this ship, and you cannot say more about a ship or a crew than that. The ceremony was over. Lindsay raced off the ship to catch a plane for Washington, and Captain Jones headed for the bridge to order the ship to sea. The ship had 1,452 passengers, including Russell Abdill. He checked into a New York hotel after arriving on the westbound voyage and called for reservations on the last voyage to England. It was something I had to do, he explained. Another man who had to travel on this last voyage was Albert Robertson, a roofing contractor from Orange, California. He and his wife Grace had come, he said, to honor a period of time that can never be repeated because of the rush of today. Robertson was unaware that the city of Long Beach was selling a cruise that would be the Queen's final voyage, but when he reached England and discovered yet another voyage was planned for October and all the way to Long Beach, just 30 minutes from his home, he booked passage to return on the Queen Mary. Robertson knew little about the Queen Mary, but had become interested in the ship when one of his roofers recalled sailing her to war. The most vivid memory of the XGI roofer's trip was a four-day, 24-hour-long crap game in the bottom of the ship's drained swimming pool on our deck. Someone who knew much about the Queen Mary was on that last voyage from New York, Mrs. K. Bird of London, who was on the Mary's first westbound voyage, was taking the final eastbound voyage. Parties were going on all over the ship in a stiff upper lip gaiety. John Richardson, the New York representative of Christie's, the London auctioneers, stood on the promenade deck holding an empty champagne glass. One feels it is an institution going, a way of life going, he said wistfully. Ronald Coles, a ruddy-faced steward on main deck who had served on the Mary for 12 years, sat in the passageway serving station 
writing a letter home. It bothers a lot of us, he wrote his wife. The old girl has been a second home to us. As they say, inevitable ship, inevitable end. One man who didn't like to think about the end was Francis McGarry, who had worked his way from the plate pantry on the maiden voyage to bartender in the observation lounge on her last transatlantic crossing. A well-oiled patron slobbered, How long you been on this tub, Mac? To call the Queen Mary a tub was to McGarry as if the American had spit on St. Patrick's statue. I've been aboard the Queen Mary, sir, for 31 years, McGarry snapped. No offense, Mac, the patron replied. Everything must come to an end, you know. The end, McGarry said as if to deny in December the Queen Mary would never sail again. I'm not thinking about that yet. For the most part, the starched white servants of the Queen Mary moved about their jobs as if it were her maiden voyage, not the last run to England. Charles Skip, a waiter in the plush veranda grill for 22 years, looked around the ornate supper club and sighed. When she was built, they put everything they could into her. She's pretty much old family to us. William Winslade, a dining steward, said from a lumpy throat, I would cry if I were able. He then excused himself and retreated to a quiet corner and wept. The people of New York had jammed the west side to see her last sailing. Something unusual for New York also happened. The traffic along the waterfront came to a halt to watch the Queen slip down the Hudson, and no one sounded an impatient horn. The harbor was choked with small boats trailing the Queen for the last six miles to the open sea. On the tug Isabel A. McAllister, a champagne buffet was being served as the Queen passed. The partiers paused, raising their glasses in a final toast to the Queen. The gracious dowager sailed past the Statue of Liberty for the last time. Crowds were there, too, watching her sail by. Kenneth Johnson, a Long Beach newspaper circulation man, recalled when the Queen sailed by that statue in June 1943 when he was aboard as an Army Buck private. Johnson watched children playing on the grassy slopes at the base of the statue, and, I got an icy feeling as the ship moved further to sea. I was wondering, he said, if I'd ever see that sight again. Johnson did, but the Queen was sailing by for the last time. When the Queen Mary reached the open seas, 27 South African passengers began dropping special commemorative bottles over the side. They would turn up on beaches thousands of miles from where they had been tossed over. With the ship at sea, Robert V. Storr, a history professor at the University of Chicago, asked the purser, Alastair Graham, if he could see Captain Jones privately. Graham arranged the meeting, and Storr presented Captain Jones with a silver plate stolen from the Boston Mail, a 19th century British mail and passenger ship that had been owned by Cunard. The plate, he told Jones, had been recovered by his father, an antique dealer. Graham returned to his A-deck office to find a pretty 25-year-old San Diego, California woman, Angelina Romero, sitting inside waiting to see him. She was a stowaway, she said, but to Graham's amazement and relief, she had enough money for a ticket. Chief Master at Arms A.E. Durston, a retired English bobby, collared a second stowaway, a 31-year-old New York freelance writer, Thomas Berry, who said he took the voyage to write a story as the Queen Mary's last stowaway. He wasn't the Queen Mary's last stowaway, but he did sell his story to Look Magazine and sent Durston a copy. The gall of the man, Durston commented. As she sailed closer to retirement, a gleaming Lufthansa Airlines jet bound for Germany winged overhead at 10,000 feet. A passenger on that flight peered out the window and watched the ship steaming at 30 knots below. It looked like a toy from that altitude, said Donald Hall, the Long Beach naval architect who had, as a small boy, thought the giant queen was something out of Jules Verne. A small group of crewmen carried out the wishes of Francis Layton of Fort Lee, New Jersey. Layton had requested in his last will that he be buried at sea off the Queen Mary. The crewmen dropped over an urn containing his ashes. The Queen Mary steamed on toward Southampton. The Queen Elizabeth 
headed for New York past the Mary for the last time at 2.20 a.m., September 25th. Passengers of both ships, despite the late hour, lined the rails shouting at each other across the half-mile of water. Both ships let loose three long blasts of their horns. In a moment, their rendezvous at sea ended, never to be repeated. The passengers were draining out every last luxury hour of the old queen. There were widows who had honeymooned on the Queen Mary. There were ex-GIs who had sailed to war on her. And there were veteran ship travelers, all finding some little remembrance of a ship they had come to love. Dr. William Hunter, the Mary's retired ship surgeon, reminisced about the time he thought the Queen Mary was sinking. One night, I awoke to find my stateroom awash with about two inches of water splashing about. Since my cabin was on main deck, I thought we were done for, and rushed out on decks in my night clothes, adjusted my life jacket, and shouting, We are sinking! He discovered that a bathroom leak had flooded his stateroom, and the ship was still afloat. On the last night out to sea, a final party of song, drink, and dance lasted the night through. The ship sent out the first SOS in her history, a joke at that. The SOS involved a plea for help of an unusual kind. The ship had run out of champagne. As the party ended, Captain Jones voiced his feelings. My heart is rather full. This celebration was full of joy, not sadness. It was of things we remembered, not regretted. And seeing the lounge so full and everyone so elegantly dressed reminded me of the days when our ships were filled with passengers and ship travel was at its peak. On this voyage, we regained some of the glory of the former years. As dawn broke at 7 a.m., the bleary-eyed passengers stared out on the seawall at Cherbourg, France. Joseph Reist, Cherbourg's mayor, came out aboard with the port pilot to present Captain Jones with a medallion of the city. Standing on the sports deck, Mrs. Robert Wilder of Warren, Pennsylvania, looked at the French harbor. She recalled the trip as like an echo of the past without a real life of its own. It is very British for the Queen Mary to close out her days this way. It seems that everyone is scared to death to show emotion. The British emotion exploded when the Queen Mary crossed the channel and entered Southampton's harbor. Fireboats, hovercraft, helicopters, and thousands of small boats escorted her majestically up the Solent. The Queen docked dead on time, only to be met by a walkout of longshoremen, called a half an hour before the Queen Mary arrived, leaving the passengers to handle their own luggage. I think it is damn poor show that the dockers struck on our final arrival, Captain Jones smarted. As she tied up, it was the 33rd anniversary of the September 26, 1934 launching of the Queen Mary. She ended an era. The ship made two short cruises to the Canary Islands and returned to Southampton to prepare for the 14,455-mile voyage to Long Beach. By the time the Queen Mary returned to Southampton from her last winter cruise, 860 crewmen had been selected for her last voyage. Long Beach officials were in England, working out the last details of the sailing at Cunard Southampton headquarters. Southwestern House, a dingy, white-fronted, converted waterfront hotel, oddly the same building where General Eisenhower mapped out the Normandy invasion. A decision had been made for the Queen to travel on two of her four engines to conserve oil between the long port-to-port -port runs. Cunard assured Long Beach the fuel conservation was necessary and that the ship could maintain a maximum 22 knots of speed. The number of passengers was limited to 1,200, all traveling first class in staterooms ranging from $9,000 per person to $1,100 per person for the smaller cabins. She was booked solid. In late October, the Queen's last passengers began to arrive from the United States by plane loads. They were mostly elderly Californians who had taken the polar route flight to London, yet others came from almost every state in the Union and from Brazil, Mexico, Peru, Australia, Canada, and from Ireland, England, Scotland, and Wales. A Queen Mary special, the last boat train from Waterloo Station, 
pulled out of London on the night of October 30th for the short run to Southampton. It was cold, windy, and wet in Southampton as the train moved into the shed, a cavernous warehouse-like structure fronting on berth 187 where the Queen was docked. Tons of luggage, everything from steamer trunks to flight handbags, were stacked inside the building as passengers filed off the train to queue up for British customs. The first in the customs line was George Haight, an 87-year-old Californian who shunned a customs agent's plea to be seated until the call to board had been sounded. I had come a long way for this, Haight said. I wanted to be the first one on board. He was. While the passengers mingled, they had no knowledge of a tense meeting between Cunard, Long Beach, and the 860 crewmen. The crew was refusing to sail unless they received a $140 per man bonus. Earlier that day, the crew had received some electrifying news from a brief announcement made by Cunard Board Chairman Sir Basil Smallpiece. Earlier this year, I had to announce the withdrawal of service of not only the aging Queen Mary, but also the Queen Elizabeth. I am now faced with having to announce the withdrawal of the Coronia and the Corinthia this year, and the Sylvania next May. The Cunard fleet was reduced to two ships the Franconia, and Carmania. This meant thousands of Cunard seamen were redundant. Cunard's polite term for sacked. 80% of the 860 crewmen assigned to take the Queen Mary to Long Beach had no chance of employment with Cunard once they returned from Long Beach. The threatened strike was averted when Long Beach agreed to pay a $112 per man bonus. The crewmen were paid off in British pound notes. They lost most of the bonus because the pound was devaluated while they were at sea. The ship would fly the British ensign and would not be officially transferred from the Liverpool Ship Registry until December 11th in Long Beach, but she was already more American than British. Southampton's Lord Mayor husband alluded to this in his solemn ceremony aboard the ship the night before the sailing. Our loss is your gain, he told Long Beach Vice Mayor Robert Crow. For 31 years, the Queen Mary has been the pride of our nation, even more so to the people of Southampton. She will be sadly missed, but we are consoled that the Queen Mary will be a live ship and not scrap. Crow promised to treasure the Queen Mary as much as the English. Captain Jones concluded the ceremony with, I, as captain of this ship, am very proud and honored to take her on her last voyage. It is with some sadness that she is sailing for her last time, but I am glad I am not taking her to the scrapyards, and that, in Long Beach, she will be a living monument to British shipbuilding, engineering, and seamanship. The passengers had begun climbing up a single gangway of this monument to British shipbuilding to board her for her final voyage. Chief Deck Steward Joe Allen watched the passengers coming up the steep gangway and began mentally calculating their ages. My God, he exclaimed, we've only six coffins aboard. Allen had misjudged the sturdy stock of the last voyagers. Not one succumbed during the voyage itself. Allen wasn't the only one who noted the age of the passengers. Bert Pritlutsky, a Los Angeles Times columnist for its West magazine, wrote, you get the eerie feeling this ship is headed not to Long Beach, but to heaven. But not all were ancient and withered, as Pretlutsky described them. I keep thinking, said Jim DePass, a Long Beach, California businessman, that my son Robert may be the last surviving passenger on the last voyage of the Queen Mary. Robert, who was nine on the voyage, will have to outlive Peter Steele, who was eight, and Allison Bernand, who was eleven, in a tontine for the last survivor. The average age of the passengers was in the high 60s. Some were wealthy, but some used cookie jar money to pay for this voyage. Some would be disappointed. Some would complain. Some would get off the ship before it reached Long Beach. But all who stayed with the Queen Mary until she was finished with engines in Long Beach helped write her final seagoing history and inevitably fell in love with the inevitable ship. They would even prove that Cunard was wrong. The Queen Mary could not have sailed on this, her last voyage, without passengers. It would have been on par with going to the breakers.
End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 The Final Voyage A cold, misty, westerly wind whipped across the bleak concrete face of the British transport docks on the morning of October 31, 1967. A 35-piece Royal Marine Band played cheery tunes like Happy Wanderer and Hey, Look Me Over, putting the dockside crowd in a gay mood like the old days of the Queen Mary's sailings. The mood quickly changed when the band began playing Anchors Away, signaling the ship was ready to sail. The Queen was secured portside too, bow to bow with Oriana, a smaller ship only seven years in service. The Queen Mary's stark black hull, streaked with rusty tears from her anchor ports, stood in sharp contrast to the sparkling white hull of the Oriana. The waters of the dredged port had a mild chop, but nothing to compare with the day before, when the loading of the two London transport double-decker buses on the ship's afterdecks had to be postponed. The buses were now firmly secured and looked like a pair of Lesney matchboxes sitting on the massive Mary. The Queen had carried as many as 39 automobiles and even tanks during World War II in her garage holds, but she had never carried a double-decker bus before. Chief Boson Frederick Edgerton, a beefy, ruddy-faced sea stalwart, directed the hookup of the 310-foot paying-off pennant, a flag flown by a ship going out of service, with each 10 feet representing one year of service. As the flag flipped furiously in the wind, Elmer Lalanne, a retired ship's officer from Laguna Beach, California, worried out loud that the long, narrow pennant would entangle in the overhead cranes on the quay. It might as well have. The pennant was stolen by some souvenir collector and was never found. Among the crowds on the dock was a pretty Welsh lass, Margaret Ann Smith, who had a startling likeness to Princess Margaret Rose. She had grown up in Southampton, but had never been aboard the Queen Mary. Home from a London teacher's college on a holiday, she had come to say farewell to the Queen. So had shopkeepers, lorry drivers, and town dignitaries, many of them who had never been aboard her, but were somehow touched by the mysticism of the Mary. Others had close contact with the ship, without ever sailing on her as passengers, Taxi driver Frank Duell had met the Mary ever since her maiden voyage. He had brought sightseers to the dock and lingered to see her off for the last time. Cyril Milham, chief clerk at Western Union International Cables, had wired millions of words to the Queen Mary over the years. This day, he sent out one last cable to the ship himself. It was addressed simply to the Queen Mary and contained one word, Goodbye. Admittedly, there was sadness, but there was also signs of humor. The ship's crew had been cut from the normal 1,100 men to 860 for this voyage. On the starboard side, someone had altered a warning sign, Danger Quadruple Screws, to read, Danger Quadruple Cruise. A homemade sign stuffed out of the porthole read, We won't be back until she's over there. But a newspaper reporter for the Long Beach Independent found nothing to laugh about at this hour. It was 9.31 a.m. in Great Britain and a half past midnight in Long Beach, California, where the first edition of the Independent had begun to snake its way through the giant rotary press, with each revolution of the newsprint absorbing an imprint from a lead cylinder telling that the Queen had sailed at 9.30 a.m. The reporter had been awakened at 3.30 a.m. by bedroom steward Frank Staken to answer a long-distance telephone call from the assistant city editor Fred Hamlin, who insisted the reporter dictate a sailing story six hours before it happened. The reporter lost his argument against such a dangerous practice and dictated the story to rewrite man David Shaw. His last words to Shaw were, God help us if this ship doesn't sail on time. It appeared Hamlin had lost his gamble. The gangway was still down, and for one passenger, Malcolm Dyser, a New York City philatelist, it was his salvation. While the reporter worried about not sailing, Dyser was praying she would not sail. To Dyser's relief, a British postal agent dashed up the gangway and handed him 100 stamped envelopes, his ticket to America. Dyser had sold the envelopes to stamp collectors as a commemorative of the last voyage, with a promise that he'd have them stamped and cancelled in each port. 
The postman had hardly cleared the bottom of the gangway when dock workers lifted it away from the ship. At 9.42 a.m., the port side outboard screw of the Queen Mary began turning. The Marine Band struck up Auld Lang Syne. The Oriana hoisted signal flags reading, Adieu, Great Queen. Her crew lined the deck rails and shouted three cheers. Her ensign was dipped, and her horn shouted three long blasts. The farewell began. As the Queen Mary moved slowly down the Solent, ships large and small signaled their goodbyes. Crane operators dipped the jibs of their cranes as she sailed past in the morning tide. The aircraft carrier HMS Hermes, the frigates HMS Argonaut and HMS Wakeful, and the destroyer HMS Dainty escorted her out. Fourteen Royal Navy helicopters flew overhead in the form of an anchor. A signal went up on the flagstaff at Royal Yacht Squadron, saying, I am sorry, saying goodbye. Very best wishes. Standing on the tender Calshot, two former chief engineers on the Queen Mary, Robert Johnston and Harold Turner, both who had been junior officers on her maiden voyage, saluted their final farewells. It was a sad farewell, enough to bring tears to the eyes of many passengers. Some of those aboard could remember sailing this way 31 years ago on her maiden voyage. Kenneth P. Bear of Bayport, New York, who had squeezed a last-minute ticket on the maiden voyage, had again booked passage at the 11th hour and was aboard for her last voyage, but somewhat miffed to find his name listed on the passenger manifest as Kenneth P. Bema. Harold Buthner of Rye, New York, who had installed the Queen's original radio equipment and sailed on the maiden voyage to check its efficiency, had taken a cabin alongside the radio room for this last voyage. Elizabeth S. Turner of Sun City, California, who was also a maiden voyager, was aboard for her last voyage. Ten members of her crew had sailed with her for all 31 years. Others who had been with her on the maiden voyage and at other times were aboard to take her out of service. Tom McCarthy Hamilton, the ship's librarian, had mixed emotions about the sailing. A tear slipped down his cheek from his right eye, the only eye that could cry. His left eye had been blinded when his ship was blown out of the water at Dunkirk. Hamilton had been quartermaster on the Queen's maiden voyage. He turned to his mate, Librarian Alastair Beers, and said, There's no doubt about it. Ships do have a soul. It is not a question of sentiment. When I see this old girl going to the States, well, it is the next best thing. It would be pure sacrilege for this great, lovely ship to go to the breakers. It just couldn't be done. Hamilton's ship with a soul left her Royal Navy escort at the Needles with a final salute from the Hermes when the entire ship's company stood on the flight deck in a driving rain and gave the Queen Mary a hats-off cheer. The Queen sailed alone into the English Channel, the noises of the farewell lingering behind and fast replaced by the sounds of a full gale blowing through her rigging in the Bay of Biscay. The old queen's wooden paneling creaked like a rusty hinged garden gate as she plowed into the heavy weather. The Queen Elizabeth, on her eastbound voyage, was also in the channel, but not close enough for a last goodbye. There was something strangely familiar about the stateroom B-24 for Mr. and Mrs. James Fitzpatrick of Palm Springs, California. By a million to one chance, they had been given the same stateroom they had honeymooned in during a 1938 voyage. But the Queen wasn't traveling as fast as she did in 1938. Kennard had said she would make 22 knots on the two outboard engines, but hadn't considered the drag of the two dead propellers. The ship was bucking headwinds and was falling behind schedule. She would miss the morning high tide over the rocky Tagus River bar going upriver to Lisbon. Captain Jones ordered the ship deliberately slowed to catch the evening tide. As the ship loped along, Robert Center, a passenger and Long Beach City employee on vacation with his wife, Cleo, began dropping pale green French wine bottles with messages from the city of Long Beach promising the finder a prize for reporting the find. Center carefully charted each drop on a National Geographic map and wrote the latitude and longitude on a piece of pink paper, which was inserted inside the bottle before it was corked and dropped overboard. The bottles would scatter around the world and end up on beaches in Africa, Spain, South America, 
the eastern United States, and the Pacific Islands. Center was performing a service for the city, but another passenger, Ada Young of Long Beach, was also dropping over bottles promising a reward to the finder, but for her own amusement, a hobby she had pursued since she was a small girl in Ventura, California. Twelve hours late, the Queen Mary eased over the river bar and made port in Lisbon, while she was anchored in the harbor, Stacy D. Miller, an ex-paratrooper, sat in a sleazy waterfront bar in Lisbon, listening to the conversation of another American who said the Queen Mary was sailing the next day for California through the Panama Canal. Miller, a Chicago, Illinois railroad hand, had been hitchhiking through Europe and had ended up in Lisbon with only 100 escudos, $3.50 left. He decided to hitch a long ride back to the States on the Queen Mary as a stowaway. With Miller on board, the Queen Mary pulled up anchor and pivoted towards the open sea on the afternoon tidal current. She had to pass under the Salazar Bridge, a long suspension bridge built on the style of San Francisco's Golden Gate Bridge. The ship had a 25-foot clearance, but for passengers standing on the forward decks, it looked as though the main mast would crash into the bridge, an unnerving optical illusion. Many scattered for cover, but what they didn't know was that minutes later the ship would sail over the rocky river bottom with only six feet clearance for her 39.6 foot draft. Lisbon, a port that had seen many ships and many famous sailors, gave the Queen Mary a warm, noisy farewell. She was steaming 709 miles to the Canary Islands for a brief refueling stop at Las Palmas before the long voyage to Rio de Janeiro. One passenger, Edward Osier, 80, of Ventura, California, had come on the trip expressly to see the Canary Islands, a boyhood dream of his. When the ship arrived, Osier lay in his bunk moaning. He had stomach flu and was so weakened he managed to only see the Canaries through a porthole. Canary Islands meant something entirely different to Dorothy Baumgartner. It was a place to buy some cool clothes before the Queen Mary sailed into equator weather. Mrs. Baumgartner's luggage had been left on the dock in Southampton, and the small amount of luggage she hand-carried on board had all winter clothing. She was the only woman aboard attending a formal function in a sheer nightgown during the heat of the tropics. The Queen had tied up to the long concrete seawall before dawn, Sunday, at Las Palmas, just behind a Russian trawler. As the ship pushed away from the wall Sunday afternoon, the port whistles blew, Fireworks went up, and the Russians lined the trawler's decks to give a hand salute to the old monarch. Las Palmas gave the ship one of the loudest farewells she was to receive. The tugboat, Fortunate, which helped the Mary turn, blew her horn so long she ran out of steam and had to be towed back to port. The Queen was sailing on her first long haul, seven days at sea and 3,544 miles to Rio and across the equator. She was sailing into hot water. The ship's purser, Alastair Graham, ordered Jim Hawkins, the ship's printer, to print up salmon-colored 3x5 cards, pleading cooperation of all is earnestly requested in the conservation of fresh water. The cards warned that rationing might have to be imposed. Other than in her war role, no such warning had ever been issued on the Queen Mary, but she was designed for a four-day voyage across the Atlantic, not for a seven-day run in tropic heat. It wasn't long before the ship began to wilt under the tropic sun. Temperatures grew short as luxury accommodations turned into sweat baths. The temperature in some cabins rose to 100 degrees. Passengers were rigging air scoops out of every available material, from serving trays to egg cartons, trying to suck in sea breezes into $9,000 staterooms. Down in C251, in the $1,100 priced cabins, Edward Dunlap, 70, a retired chemist, had an inflammation in his left leg. He was checked by the ship's doctor, Dr. John Wilson, who diagnosed his ailment as phlebitis, the inflammation of the vein. It was serious enough, Dr. Wilson said, to hospitalize Dunlap, he was moved across the ship to the hospital on sea deck in a direct line with his cabin. His wife Thelma, 65, a retired Los Angeles County District Attorney's investigator, sweltered in their portholeless stateroom. Under the bunks, the Dunlaps had stored 300 pounds of books on genealogy, the Dunlaps' hobby, 
which they had purchased in England. Before the ship reached Rio, the Dunlaps had dissected the Queen Mary's genealogy and concluded this lady was no queen, but a tramp. Stowaway Miller had successfully evaded capture and had stuffed himself from a buffet served on promenade deck, but he had no razor and he thought the beard he was growing would eventually give him away. In conversation with a woman passenger, he discovered she was from Chicago and decided to confide his status to her. She loaned him $10 for a razor, toothpaste, shaving cream, and a candy bar, and then went directly to Chief Master at Arms A.E. Durston with her story. Miller, who still believed the Queen Mary was headed for the Panama Canal, had hardly made his purchase when Durston quietly took him in custody. He was locked up in the ship's brig, actually an old isolation hospital located directly under the posh veranda grill. Miller remained in custody until the ship reached Rio, where the American embassy gave him a choice of working off his passage as a crewman for one shilling, 14 cents, a month, or being flown to the United States to stand charges as a stowaway. Miller chose to work. As the Queen neared the equator, Miller had a better stateroom than some paying passengers. He had six portholes, one with a tin air scoop. The passengers jammed the decks at night, sleeping in the open. It took the steel-plated castle up to nine hours to cool down after the broiling sun went down. Captain Jones made no apology for the heat. He explained that Cunard had warned Long Beach that the ship was not built to carry passengers through the tropics. When a passenger asked him if there were any air-conditioned rooms aboard when they met in the main lounge, Jones quipped, You're in one now. Captain Jones' biggest problem was keeping the Queen on schedule. The ship couldn't maintain the 22 knots on two engines. One passenger, Gil Allen, a Desert Hot Springs, California electrician, didn't believe the ship was making all the speed she could. In an encounter in Captain Jones's cabin, the skipper explained, I assure you, sir, the ship is full out. Allen still didn't believe him. There was no let-up in the heat as the ship sailed on a course to cross the equator. Expensive food spoiled quickly in the tropic heat. I've never ordered such food in all my life, explained Mrs. Francis Becker of Garden Grove, California. And here it is, just too hot to eat. The complaints worried Dr. Orville Cole, a Long Beach physician and city booster. He was concerned that Long Beach was getting more than its share of the blame. Dr. Cole decided that much of the problem was idleness and figured that if he could keep the passengers busy, they'd forget the heat. He organized the Long Beach Chamber of Commerce ambassadors to field complaints and plan activities ranging from a treasure hunt to weight-guessing contest. The tensions eased on November 9, 1967, when the Queen Mary crossed the equator, but not because the heat let up. A fresh crop of shellbacks, almost everyone on board, had to be initiated in the ancient ritual over which King Neptune holds sway. The light-hearted ceremony proved Dr. Cole's point. The passengers had time to play, but not the crew, and the crew's quarters on D-deck were no place of luxury even in cool weather. In one of those cabins where six cooks slept, Locke Horsborough, a 56-year-old rotund salad chef, nicknamed Lobster because of his perpetual alcoholic flush, lay bathed in sweat in his bunk. The cabin was located next to the meat locker where the temperature was kept below zero, but inside the cabin, it was 110 degrees. Horsborough's friend, Jimmy Fitzsimmons from the ship's linen locker, stopped by with a bucket of canned beer iced down with slivers of frost from the meat locker. He tried to arouse Horsborough, who was unconscious and had slipped into a coma. Dr. Wilson was called. The stoop-shoulder Scottish physician took Horsborough's temperature. It was 107 degrees, almost as hot as the cabin. He ordered Horsborough carried up to Sea Deck Hospital and started packing him in ice to lower his body temperature. The ship's bars were stripped of every ice cube, but this failed to break the chef's temperature. Lobster died of heat exhaustion without regaining consciousness. As the Queen Mary eased past Sugarloaf and into Rio's famous harbor, Harry Taylor, one of the ship's four printers, didn't have to be told a crewman had died. The hospital had ordered six lead pigs used for the linotype machine brought from the print shop to the hospital next door. Taylor knew that the pigs were to be sewn into the canvas casket to help weigh it down when it was dropped over the side. 
Rio was beautiful. The giant luxury liner sitting in its harbor was beautiful too, but only to look at, not to be aboard. She was hot, stifling hot, laying dead in the water in the sultry heat of Brazil. Not even a breeze stirred. Passengers wealthy enough left the ship as if she were sinking. They fled for the air-conditioned hotels of the city. One couple who left the ship did not come back. Mr. and Mrs. Dunlap packed their bags and their complaints and headed for home, by air. Behind in their cabin were left the 300 pounds of books. These would ride to Long Beach. Bob Hanley, a retired airline company president, had only a mild complaint, and he personally resolved this in a back alley in Rio. Hanley shunned the luxurious Grecian swimming pool on our deck in favor of the less pretentious pool on E-deck, but he found the pool had nothing to entertain swimmers except the rubber bladder from a punching bag. Hanley negotiated in sign language for the purchase of a giant inner tube that had once gone inside a truck tire. He had it inflated and lugged it back to the Queen Mary. The gangway officers had watched the passengers bring back armloads of strange souvenirs, but never anything like Hanley was bringing aboard. "'Begging your pardon, sir,' asked Second Officer Alastair Watt. "'What do you intend to do with that?' "'I've seen your lifeboats,' Hanley replied seriously, "'and I want something safer than that if we're going around the horn.' Watt half believed him. Rio was a three-day stopover. At 3 a.m., November 15th, with few passengers awake to see it, the Queen Mary slipped out of the harbor. It was the only port all along the way that didn't give the Queen a send-off, and only because of the early hour. In Rio, crewmen had purchased a spray of roses, carnations, gladioli, forget-me-nots, bachelor buttons, chrysanthemums, and ferns, fashioned in the shape of a life ring in honor of lobster. Captain Jones read a prayer over his remains, and the crew chanted the Lord's Prayer as six pallbearers raised a board containing the canvas-wrapped body. Locke Horsborough, who had spent 37 years of his life as a seaman, was committed to the deep. Navigator Norman Johnson entered the burial location. Latitude 250.07 south, longitude 440.28 west, on the logbook. One of those watching the simple sea burial was Mrs. Siri Hugh, a 68-year-old native of Copenhagen, Denmark, who was traveling with her husband, Svend. They lived in retirement in Long Beach. Mrs. Hugh reached Long Beach on this ship, but lived less than 24 hours after the ship docked. Rodney Wells, a 16-year-old dining room steward, had become the goat of all practical jokes played by other young stewards. He was timid and stuttered, an infliction that brought him much pain from the tauntings of other young stewards. When Wells came off duty one night, a half dozen young boys were waiting for him for a kangaroo court. The boys grabbed Wells, but he managed to worm free and ran down the passageway, up a series of ladders, and onto the open decks. It was night. In the darkness of the open decks, his pursuers lost him. For an hour, the young stewards searched. The six tormentors feared Wells had fallen or jumped over the side. They had to inform a superior. The ship had already entered the cool waters of currents flowing up the coast of South America from the Antarctic. At midnight, Captain Jones was alerted to Wells' disappearance. He ordered the ship to turn about, and he ordered every available crewman to either join a search of the ship itself or stand watch along the rails. The sea was alive with white caps. Looking for the boy was like finding a dot in a vast black sea. The Mary turned back and retraced her course for two hours in a vain search. Captain Jones ordered the ship to come about and resume normal course. He wrote in the ship's log, Presumed lost at sea, one soul, Rodney Wells, aged 16, a mess boy. At 5.30 a.m. roll call, Wells, his black trousers and white waiter's coast a mass of wrinkles, answered up. He confessed that he had slept in an empty cabin. He was summoned by Staff Captain Percival W. Silson, a balding, prim Englishman who listened as Wells told of his daily torment at the hands of the other young stewards. Silson couldn't bring himself to punish Wells. He transferred him to the purser's office as a messenger and moved him to new quarters. Librarian Hamilton was preparing a special packet of letters entrusted to him for a special cancellation stamp when the Queen Mary went around Cape Horn. 
The packet was from one of the world's most famous stamp collectors, the Duke of Edinburgh, Queen Elizabeth II's consort. The ship was so cold now that the heat had to be turned on. She was nearing Cape Horn. No one aboard, not even her master, had been around the treacherous cape. It was evident that the crew was a bit apprehensive. All glassware was stowed, the decks were battened down, and seamen were telling tales that they had heard other Cape Horners tell about the Roaring Forties. Someone lifted a paragraph description of the horn from John Gunther's Inside South America and posted it on the notice board in the A-deck square. Cape Horn was discovered in 1616 by a Dutchman who named it for the Horn, a village in his native Holland. Gunther's description began. It has never been inhabited, except perhaps by a few stray Indians, sometimes whalers still round it. Otherwise, nobody but a madman would take a ship here, since the Straits of Magellan provide a quicker, less agitated passage. These are about the most dangerous waters in the world. Purser Graham discovered the notice on his bulletin board, ripped it down angrily, shredded it, and walked on to his office. Land was sighted on the starboard side November 19th, it was the snow-capped ridges of Tierra del Fuego. Dr. Cole and his group of ambassadors were busy selling tickets for an unusual bus ride aboard the two London transport buses as the Queen Mary rounded the horn. The money they collected was to go to a school at the Queen Mary's next stop, Valparaiso, Chile. Valparaiso is Long Beach's sister city in the U.S. program of city-to-city -city friendship, the Queen was the largest ship ever to go around Cape Horn, but who could resist doubling the honor, going around Cape Horn on the largest ship and aboard a double-decker bus? Dr. Cole's venture was a sellout. The morning's bulletin carried an item that at 3 p.m., soprano opera singer Martha Vaughn, a passenger, would sing at a concert in the main lounge. It was icy cold, raining and overcast as the Queen Mary steamed into view of the Falkland Islands. At that moment, by odd coincidence, the world's first superliner was passing the beached Great Britain, the first steam-driven iron-hulled passenger ship ever built, and a pioneer in 1843 of the Queen Mary-type superliners to come. In her day, she was also the Grand Dame of the Sea, but for 82 years she had lain rusting on the beach after being disabled while going around Cape Horn. A year later, in 1968, the Great Britain was towed to San Francisco, California to be converted into a museum. Each turn of the Queen Mary's propellers drove her 19 feet further toward becoming a museum herself. Passengers were lining up to board the buses, but Annette Parks, wife of Burt Parks, the master of ceremonies for the crew's entertainment, was the fourth in a bridge game in one of the smoking lounges and found this more interesting than being on deck in the cold, drizzling rain. Suddenly, the sun broke through the clouds and off the ship's starboard loomed up a chain of snow-capped, sawtooth mountains and sheer moss-covered cliffs. The Queen Mary, on a course of latitude 55, longitude 67, was crossing from ocean to ocean. The treacherous Cape Horn came into view, but the roaring forties that struck fear into the bravest of sailors was as calm and placid as a lake. It was chamber of commerce weather. Navigator Norman Johnson plotted the Mary's course within a mile and a quarter of the famous Cape. Dutch Miller, chief of the Long Beach City Lifeguard Service, plunged into the R-deck swimming pool, swam quickly once around it to make the claim that he had swam around Cape Horn, but couldn't resist seeing the famous Cape. He quickly dressed and went on deck. Parks found his wife holding trump card in the promenade deck smoking lounge and literally ordered her to leave the bridge game to watch history sail by. Martha Vaughn had struck her first note and was left literally with her mouth open when at precisely 3.01 p.m. the Queen Mary sounded a blast of her horn, signifying Cabo de Hornos was a beam. Miss Vaughn's audience vanished. Miss Vaughn laughed off her audience's walkout by saying, The horn blew louder than me! Jay Studdard, a former mayor of Newport Beach, California, and a pleasure sailor, had personally plotted when the ship would reach the Cape. He figured the time as 3.30 p.m., missing it by 29 minutes. 
Bruce Lalanne had sent off a radiogram from Los Angeles to his father Elmer aboard the Queen. The message arrived minutes before the ship rounded the horn. It said, Welcome to the Pacific. Not all passengers were pleased with the sight of Cape Horn. Is that all there is to it? asked one woman. A man gazed out at the sheer cliffs, commented, It doesn't look like a horn. All my life I thought it was a piece of land shaped like a horn. On the afterdecks, the crew watched crowds line up for a bus ride around the Cape. Those damn Yanks are daft, snarled one. At home you couldn't get them on a bloomin' bus. They'd take a motor car. A steward joined in. Well, now I've seen it all on this flaming cruise. Passengers in a queue, in the rain no less, to get on a bus. The hidden hostility for Long Beach and Fugazi Travel Bureau directing the last cruise surfaced from one deck crewman who snipped, The Queen Mary has rounded Cape Horn courtesy of Fugazi Travel Bureau and the city of Long Beach. The Queen Mary had rounded the horn. The new shellbacks were also Cape Horners, two of the greatest claims made by sailors. Many have crossed the equator, but few have accomplished the horn. Because the ship was so large, she had to sail around the tip of South America, and this very fact was the chief reason many passengers decided to take the Mary's final voyage. Lawrence Shaw of Lake Oswego, Oregon, said it was his lifelong desire. Carl Weeks of Pewaukee, Wisconsin, sighed, My life is now fulfilled. Douglas A. Graham, a Long Beach oil man who had been all over the world, said he had to come on this trip because I had never been around Cape Horn. Mrs. Dorothy DePass had trouble keeping her son Robert interested in looking at the Cape. He wanted to be on the opposite side of the ship, searching for icebergs. He didn't see any and felt disappointed that he couldn't report his sightings to his fourth grade classmates. The Queen Mary was now 7,400 miles from Southampton and approximately halfway to Long Beach. She headed west into the blue Pacific waters for the first time since the 1940s. She was no longer an Atlantic Ocean ship. At 6.20 the next morning, the Queen had run headlong into a full Pacific gale as she bucked headwinds and heavy seas along the Chilean coast. The ship's crew had battened down for rough seas around the Horn, but the calm seas there lulled them into a sense of security. The glassware cupboards were opened. When the ship hit the heavy weather, the glassware tumbled out and smashed by the thousands. The glassware loss was not all from breakage. Frances McGarry served a woman a drink in the observation lounge. She asked for the drink in a particular tumbler. When McGarry questioned the request, she replied, Oh, I already have 11 of these, and I need one more for my souvenir set. McGarry, a veteran of 31 years on the Queen Mary, found the brazen admission incredulous. Chef Bob Finnegan found a note from the chief catering officer even more incredulous. It instructed him to prepare the Thanksgiving turkey a day early, on November 22nd, because the ship would be in port on Thanksgiving Day, and most passengers would be ashore. Finnegan, a humorous, sharp-tongued Irishman, gave a witty reply to the request. Thanks to God it is not the 4th of July. I'd hate to think what these Yanks would do with all our tea. The turkeys Finnegan was ordered to prepare for Thanksgiving Eve had been put aboard the ship in Southampton, but they had been purchased from a Winchester, England poultryman who imported them from a California turkey ranch. The turkeys had crossed a continent and an ocean by air and ship, around Cape Horn, to be eaten the day before Thanksgiving, somewhere off the coast of Chile. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10, Queen of the Pacific Long Beach's mayor Edwin Wade watched from the shore as the Queen Mary swung into position and dropped the starboard anchor. A stream of rust poured out into Valparaiso's open roadstead, Twenty-four days at sea had taken its toll. The Mary's black hull was streaked with rust. It was the first time Long Beach's mayor had seen the ship since the city made the purchase in July. He had flown to Chile to join the ship for the remainder of the voyage. Wade wondered what the people of Long Beach would think about the rust. He also knew the city had its Queen Mary critics, who would be waiting to find a molehill to make a mountain. It was November 23rd, and the passengers had been aboard the ship for eight days straight, the longest stretch of the 40-day voyage. They were anxious to get ashore. 
Many had purchased tours to see Chile's capital city, Santiago. When the tenders delivered the passengers to shore, they were startled to find the streets guarded by armed soldiers and sailors. Chile was embroiled in a general strike and expecting violence. Dennis Mars, a Fugazi Travel Bureau guide, took a busload of passengers to Santiago. They stopped off for lunch at the Hilton Hotel and were walking across a peaceful plaza to watch the changing of the guard at the presidential palace. Suddenly, the Queen Mary tourists were a little closer to a sightseeing event than they expected or desired. Mars' tour was caught between a surge of strikers rushing the palace and soldiers who were there to prevent the assault. In a moment, it was bedlam, Donald Carpentier of Long Beach said. Tear gas was being hurled by the soldiers and rocks by the strikers. Elmer Davis, a Long Beach City fire captain, calmly filmed the violence with his 8mm movie camera, and when a tear gas canister landed at his feet, he kicked it across the plaza. Mrs. Arthur Johnson, 70, of Van Nuys, California, was plummeted to the ground. Consuelo de Bonzo, who owns a Mexican restaurant in Los Angeles' famous Olvera Street, caught the full charge of a tear gas grenade. Mars managed to round his tour up and retreat for cover. The streets of Valparaiso were calm. The biggest excitement there lay at anchor in the harbor. Chileans lined up for 30 blocks to pay 6.30 escudos, $1, to take a boat ride around the Queen Mary. Siri Hugh lay in the Sea Deck Hospital, and all she saw of Chile was the low, brown, rolling hills and thought how much they looked like the Palos Verdes Hills near her Long Beach home. Mrs. Hugh slipped on the promenade deck during the gale two days before and broke her hip. Albion Lee of Los Alamitos, California, had talked with an American Navy chief petty officer stationed at Valparaiso over George Baker V Queen Mary, the licensed amateur radio station aboard the Queen Mary. He was now having his second Thanksgiving dinner as a guest of the Navy chief. Lee had been chosen for the trip by the Associated Radio Amateurs of Long Beach Incorporated. He had struggled through the British customs with the American manufactured radio equipment and then waited tensely for approval of the Queen Mary Amateur Station, which had to be licensed by the British General Post Office. Before he reached Long Beach, Lee was swamped with amateur calls from all over the world. He was the first maritime mobile station operated by Americans to be licensed by the British. Lee, as chief operator, was assisted in responding to the flood of calls from all over the world by four other radio operators, Ray and Gene Harder, Walt Barnes, and Buzz Reeves. The Queen's stopover in Chile was short. At 6 p.m. November 24th, Chief Officer George R. Carter received the command from the bridge to heave anchor. A Chilean tugboat sounded its horn, and the Queen Mary's low, mournful wail started a chain reaction of harbor horn blowing. Merchant ships from Germany, Japan, and the Netherlands set off a competition of deafening sounds. The Chilean Navy cruiser Captain Black, the old U.S. Navy cruiser USS Nashville, fired up two boilers to produce enough steam for one continuous horn blast. The Navy Yard sirens squalled, and then the city's factory whistles blew. What a thrilling moment, Dr. Lester Lowe, a Desert Hot Springs, California physician and former national commander of the U.S. Power Squadron, said to Jim Stoddard as the two watched from the Mary's open deck. This beats the hell out of Southampton's farewell, added Stoddard. I don't think I'll live to see anything like this again, Dr. Lowe said as the ship slipped away from Valparaiso's farewell. He saw farewells in all the Pacific ports, perhaps not as noisy, but as warm. But it was Dr. Lowe's last voyage. He died of a heart attack in April 1968. The Queen sailed from Chile up the coast to Calo, Peru, a port city built on reclaimed mud flats to serve the capital, Lima. The anchor detail trained to drop the ship's anchor. It was frozen and refused to budge. Chief Officer Carter had the ship swing about and dropped the starboard anchor. The ship, her schedule altered twice because she was falling behind while unable to make 22 knots, was in Peru only 34 hours. The Peruvian craftsmen were going to make the best of her shortened stay. They spread their wares on the grass at the Park Harbor entrance and greeted the incoming passengers with handfuls of llama slippers, alpaca rugs, and stuffed furry toy animals. The passengers brought them by the armloads, all to the dismay of Lawrence Stroud, the ship's sanitary officer. 
Stroud feared the furry things were infested with lice, fleas, ticks, and bedbugs. If the vermin were not alive, Stroud thought, the goods would probably be filled with vermin eggs, which would probably hatch when the Mary got back into tropic waters while crossing the equator a second time. At sailing time, November 28th, Second Officer Alastair Watt was worried about more than Peruvian bugs. He had pleaded for nearly an hour for Peruvian sightseers to leave the ship. He didn't speak Spanish, and apparently his pleadings were so much English to the Peruvians. Chief Master-at-Arms Durston, who had a running battle with Watt, chuckled at the officer's pleading. The bloke should learn to cuss in Spanish, Durston said. He's yelling at me because I told him somebody should have stopped the visitors before they got on board. Let's take them all to Long Beach. That'll serve them right. Harry Taylor, the ship's night shift printer, made the mistake of giving a Peruvian sailor a menu cover with the Queen Mary's picture on it. Taylor looked up from the stone where he was putting together the ship's daily newspaper, Ocean Bulletin, and, I found Peruvian standing ten deep to get one of those flaming menus. Taylor shooed them out and locked the print shop door. With the help of some Spanish-speaking passengers, Watt was finally able to convince the Peruvians the ship was sailing. The Queen was headed for Panama. In the cool Humboldt current, schools of dolphins played across the Mary's bow. The ship crossed the Pacific side equator at 12.57 p.m., November 30th, and the passengers earned a rare honor. They were now double shellbackers and Cape Horners. Mayor Wade became ill with laryngitis and was confined to his main deck stateroom. He was asleep when his wife Mary awakened him and whispered that someone was prowling around the cabin. Wade, barely able to speak in a whisper, rang for his steward. When the steward knocked, Wade turned on the lights. A seagull fluttered about the cabin. It took the three of them to capture the bird and put it out the porthole, apparently the way he came in. Wade sighed. I hope it wasn't an albatross. When Captain Jones heard of the gull incident, he commented, In all my years at sea, it is the first time I've heard of a seagull going into the ship through a porthole, especially while the ship is moving. The gull wasn't the only bird aboard. Chief Boson Edgerton had found a bird nesting in the rope locker on the sports deck soon after the ship sailed from Las Palmas. The bird remained there until the ship reached Chile. Then, she and two fledglings flew out into a strange country thousands of miles from the Canary Islands. Birds weren't the only unusual thing on the Queen Mary. For the first time in all her luxury years, the Queen was serving her passengers in paper and plastic cups purchased in Valparaiso to replenish the broken supply. One veteran, Kinnard Waiter, was moved to say, I'll walk off this ship before I'll serve something in a paper container. Patty Burke, a dining room steward from Galloway, Ireland, needled him with, Listen, before we're in Long Beach, the dinners will be served on paper plates. As the Queen moved closer to her own retirement, another bit of opulence was being sent to its Valhalla. The New York Central Railroad ended the run of the famous 20th Century Limited, a train that in the Queen Mary's heyday took the ship's passengers on a red carpet, champagne, and flowers trip inland. The old train, like the Queen Mary, was a symbol of the past, operating at a substantial loss in competition with air travel. In Peru, a crewman had climbed the mainmast, 209 feet up, and removed the ship's weather vane. The ship would need that much clearance to get under the Thatcher Ferry Bridge to enter Balboa's harbor. By now, the ship was heating up again, but nothing to compare with the Atlantic side. But the homemade air scoops were protruding from the portholes again, as the Queen entered the 42-foot-deep channel, lined with red and black buoys, that guided ships into Balboa and to the Pacific mouth of the Panama Canal. On the way up the coast, Mayor Wade had devised a plan to dress up the ship for Long Beach. He suggested that paintbrushes be fastened to bamboo poles, and that crewmen paint the rust spots black, while the ship was underway. The idea was tried, but didn't succeed. The Panama Canal's chief pilot, Captain Irving Hay, a man who guides hundreds of ships in and out of the harbor, came aboard to bring the Mary into Pier 15. It was the first time the ship docked since it left Las Palmas. It was half tied in the channel, and the ship, low on fuel, and much of her stored fresh water used up, was riding high. The bridge, spanning the channel and carrying Pan-American highway traffic, was now in full view. The same optical illusion that occurred in Lisbon when the ship passed under the Salazar Bridge 
loomed up. Mrs. Betty Ritter, wife of the Long Beach, California newspaper publisher, was standing on the forward decks. It's not going to make it, she squealed, and covered her face. With only four feet to spare, the Queen Mary rode under the bridge to the cheers of both the passengers and the thousands who lined the bridge and rock sea walls. A ship isn't a very exciting sight in the Panama Canal zone, but this one was. The Queen Mary was the biggest ship ever to visit the Pacific side of the canal. Her length exceeded the lock limit by 19 feet 6 inches, and her 118-foot girth exceeded the canal's width by 8 feet 7 inches. Health Officer Stroud had spent most of his time from Peru to Balboa dusting fur items with a powdered DDT to kill any bugs they might have. He was looking forward to the brief stay in Balboa because it would give him a chance to get papers cleared for immigration to the United States before reaching Long Beach. He had been promised a job by Bernard J. Clowardy, a passenger who owned Farmer John Meat Company. Stroud had planned to visit the U.S. immigration authorities in Balboa. However, as the ship docked, he was searching for a $12 pair of llama slippers a passenger had left with him for dusting and had failed to pick up. Someone had stolen them, and the passenger held him responsible. Stroud missed his appointment by the time the ship reached Long Beach. It was too late for him to clear immigration. He was scheduled to return to England on one of the first planes designated to return the crewmen. The ship was in Balboa only overnight. She had to sail on the next half-tide at 2 p.m. December 2nd. The Fort Amador Army Band was on the dock to play the Mary Off with UCLA and USC football songs. As the ship's stern moved away from the pier, the band struck up Now is the Hour, and then went into a lively rendition of California, Here I Come. And finally, as the tugs moved her away from the docks, the Queen once again heard the sad, lowland ire, Auld Lang Syne. The dredge, Mindy, pumping the channel's sandy bottom, tooted her whistle as the Queen Mary glided past. The deep-throated Queen's horn answered echoing off the hills of Cory Heights. The Queen was underway, headed for her last port of call, Acapulco, Mexico. Long Beach Harbor Public Relations Chief, Frank Black, was checking over accommodations for 60 newspaper reporters who were to join the ship in Mexico for a four-day voyage to Long Beach. The only space left on the ship was small inboard cabins on C and D decks. The weather was warm, and the cabins the press had been assigned were like ovens, retaining the built-up heat 24 hours a day. Black knew just how brutal the press can be, and he feared the accommodations, coupled with reports from disgruntled passengers, would provide the press with enough bad stories to scuttle the ship. It was a public relations man's nightmare. The Queen Mary arrived off the headland's entrance to the Acapulco Bay at 9 a.m. December 5th and eased into the bay at 7 knots. She anchored a mile off Colita Beach, Acapulco's famous afternoon beach. As the Queen was letting scope out on her anchor, Billy Baker, a circus horse trainer from Liverpool, England, who had been in Mexico for three years traveling with an English circus, stood on the docks watching. He felt like a little bit of England had come to him in Mexico, I saw her being built on the Clyde, he said, but I never dreamed I'd see her so far from England. The port, small by comparison to other ports the Queen had called on, had no horns or whistles to greet the ship, so the Mexicans did the next best thing. They set off three rockets that burst in a red glare over the Queen Mary. As the Queen jockeyed for position in the anchorage, small Mexican boys who had come out to greet her in rickety rowboats were diving for coins. On the beach, Mexican bands were waiting to welcome the passengers. Bars were set up for free drinks. It was a warm, last welcome for the ship and her passengers and crew in the Queen's last port of call. The 500-passenger tender, President John F. Kennedy, was to move the passengers ashore, but she proved too large for the Queen Mary. The boat couldn't get alongside the Mary's landing ramps. Smaller tenders were pressed into service. The chartered press plane from Long Beach winged over the ship low enough to allow photographers to take aerial views of the Queen at anchor. The reporters landed to be wined and dined by the Mexican government until 2 a.m. when they finally came aboard the Queen Mary to find their staterooms broiling. Cunard crewmen were getting some of their first time ashore and they were making like sailors the world over. 
in a cantina on a back street, gobbling down cactus whiskey, tequila, and margaritas, the crewmen burst into song, a ditty improvised for the voyage. Fare thee well, my true love. I'm sailing far away, to California. It's not leaving Southampton that grieves me, but it is my darling when I think of thee. One of the sailors said he had no regrets for the ship and would be glad when the voyage was over. You're talking from the salty drink you've been downing, William Truith of County Cork, Ireland, a steward aboard for only the last 18 months, told him. We are all very sad to see the last few days of the Queen Mary. We'll be sad to walk away and leave such a beautiful ship in a foreign land. But it is fitting that this ship should go to America. Americans are the only ones who can keep her grandeur intact. Listening to the Irishman talk about the ship, John Krollman, a crewman from the Scottish Shetland Islands, concurred, but added, For a black Irishman to talk that way about the Scott-built ship with the name of an English queen is truly a tribute. The ship had lain at anchor since ten that morning, and the steel bulkheads held the heat inside like a closed oven. Gil Allen, the electrician who had challenged Captain Jones on the speed, decided to cool off. Fully clothed, he went over the side. Kerman fished him out. Chief Master at Arms Durston had snapped back at Second Officer Watt on gangway watch and was ordered to report to the staff captain the next morning for disciplinary action. Watt cited him for insubordination. Captain Silson fined Durston one day's pay. The press was coming aboard after a round of air-conditioned parties to the sobering reality of tourist-class cabins. On the same press boat were the Montegos, a four-member rock and roll group booked for entertainment in the Queen's flamenco room. Except now they had five members, a pretty straw-blonde 21-year-old Jane Frances Militic from Big Sur, California. Miss Militic, broke and suffering from a severe case of dysentery, was befriended ashore by the young rock and roll entertainers. They listened to her story and decided it would be easy to slip her on board for the trip to Long Beach. By 8 a.m., the Queen was ready to haul anchor and leave Mexico for the last four-day voyage to Long Beach. But the anchor wouldn't budge. It was stuck in the mud. For 55 minutes, the anchor watch tugged at the anchor. When Chef Bob Finnegan heard of the difficulty, he telephoned the bridge and asked for Captain Jones. He was told by a junior officer that Jones was very busy. Well, give him a message, Finnegan said. Ask him if I can send some of my galley boys up to lend a hand to the deck crew. Finnegan was joking, but what Captain Jones was facing was no laughing matter. The port anchor was jammed. If he lost the starboard anchor, he would have to hope the ship could dock in Long Beach. A third anchor was in storage, but to connect it would mean several days delay. Captain Jones had planned to dock the Queen Mary in Long Beach, but once he received a report from Durston that another stowaway, Miss Melitic, had been found and that she was sick, there was a possibility that the Queen would be quarantined and have to anchor off Long Beach. The report from Dr. Wilson brought home that fear. I give a tentative diagnosis of typhoid fever, Dr. Wilson said. The possibility of the Queen Mary being quarantined off Long Beach was now real. Back in Long Beach, Mr. and Mrs. Dunlap, who had left the Queen in Rio, held a press conference. Mrs. Dunlap did most of the talking. She described the voyage as a nightmare of rats and cockroaches. She contended that she had been bitten by a cockroach. She reported that the crew had mutinied, passengers had died, and that the ship's doctor wanted to amputate her husband's leg. It was a sensational news story. The news broke on December 7th, when the ship was off Mexico two days out of Long Beach. The working press aboard, particularly the English newspaper correspondents, were sending off reports about the heat, uncomfortable conditions, food poisoning, and passenger complaints. Frank Black's fears were a reality. At no time in her 31-year history had the Queen been so sullied. Captain Jones held his own press conference, denied rat and mutiny charges. He considered the reports libelous. Al Harrison, the Nogales, Arizona Watermelon King, found a way to cool off overheated members of the press. Harrison, who ships millions of watermelons from Mexico throughout the United States, had purchased several hundred Mexican watermelons in Acapulco. He had an old-fashioned watermelon bust for the press corps on the ship's open decks. 
I don't want you fellas talking bad about my ship, Harrison told the reporters. To many of the passengers, the Queen Mary had become just that, my ship. Fanny Sutcliffe, an English-born woman from Long Beach, went to her cabin on sea deck and penned a letter to her son, Arthur. Don't believe all the bad things you read in the newspapers about this voyage, she wrote. It's been wonderful. She suddenly remembered she'd see her son before she could mail the letter, but it was something she had to say. When Mrs. Ellen Downs of London read Ivor Davis's report in the Daily Express, headlined, The Queen That Died of Shame, a scathing sketch about conditions on the ship, she wrote her daughter, Mrs. Alice Needham, in Fullerton, California, just 20 miles from Long Beach, that, I've traveled third class on the Queen Mary, and if there had been any rats on that lovely old ship, I would have seen them. It is no more than a pack of lies. There was one rat on board, but he was no more than a mouse sticking his head out of the piled-up hairdo of one of the characters painted by Doris and Kaizen in the mural in the veranda grill. When a brand new Douglas DC-9 flew over the Queen Mary December 8th off Bonita Island along the coast of Mexico, it dumped a load of carnations onto the decks of the Queen Mary, reminiscent of the maiden voyage flower drop by DC-2 airplanes in 1936. Ken Bear, who carried on a radio conversation with Ted Hoosing on the maiden voyage, looked up at the sleek aircraft leaving vapor trails as it pulled away and mused, were they dropping flowers for the ship's funeral? No, indeed. It was just a preview of the welcome fit for a queen that awaited the dowager off the coast of California as dawn broke on December 9th, 1967. The final hours of glory for the RMS Queen Mary. End of chapter 10. Chapter 11. Long Beach Welcomes a Queen. The last voyage had begun 40 days earlier on a cold, rainy Tuesday morning in October in Southampton. It was ending Saturday, December 9th in Southern California. Before dawn, the passengers and crew heavily wrapped against brisk winds lashing the California coastline were on deck to see the lights of San Diego. It was still dark at 5.30 a.m., when Chief Deck Steward Joe Allen began serving coffee and sweet rolls at the Promenade Deck Buffet. Allen had long ago given up trying to serve these passengers in the Cunard tradition. They were mostly Americans, impatient with the methodical knife-spoon-fork service. They were do-it-yourself people, steeped in the old-way traditions of service. The cafeteria style had at first galled Allen, but he soon saw the efficiency of the American way. But Alan was not prepared for the rush on this morning. He had run out of clean coffee cups in the first hour, and the dishwashers couldn't keep up with the demand. Passengers began grabbing soup and cereal bowls and were lapping the hot black coffee like starving puppy dogs, Alan said. Many had not been to sleep since the ship's final grand ball broke up a sad farewell filled with sentimental songs to sing out the Mary's last hours. The ship steamed past Oceanside, Dana Point, Laguna Beach, as the sun rose over the hills, lighting up an armada of small craft making heavy weather in a choppy sea. The small boats were all headed in the direction of the Queen Mary. Mike Casey, an old Mary bedroom steward, watched out a porthole on B-deck, my God, it is the most fantastic sight I've ever seen, he said, beginning to choke up with emotion. It is the greatest moment of my life. From another viewpoint, librarian Tom Hamilton saw the Armada as Dunkirk all over again. Senior First Officer John Nicholson viewed the boats from binoculars and exclaimed, In all of merchant shipping history, no merchant ship has ever been accorded such honors. Captain Jones was studying the radar screen on the bridge. It had turned into a solid blip. He turned to Captain Silson and said, I never realized so many small craft existed in one area of the globe. I never imagined such a reception. It was a welcome fit for a queen. Watching from the shore, Mary Nyswender, a newspaper reporter, scribbled a note that would become a descriptive sentence in her story for the Sunday Independent Press-Telegram. Long Beach's newspaper. It was a welcome that could only be expressed properly in the language of a bosun's mate, 
Mrs. Nurse Wender, a former Maritime News reporter, wrote. The Mary's chief bosun, Fred Edgerton, couldn't find that many words. He could only mutter one. Fantastic, he said, his weathered face awash with tears. This was the last hurrah for the Queen of Queens. Five thousand small craft trailed alongside the Mary as she steamed within two miles of the shore. Navy minesweepers and Coast Guard cutters had moved in alongside the ship to keep the small craft a safe distance and give the giant queen room to maneuver. She was the biggest ship ever to come into these waters. Beaches were crowded with sightseers. Ambulatory patients at Hogue Memorial Hospital in Newport Beach, a hospital that sits high on a bluff overlooking the ocean, were standing at every bay front window watching her pass. Bob Hanley, the retired airline president from Los Alamitos, California, shook his head as he watched the vast fleet following the ship. He turned to Father William Hollinger, a Catholic priest who had served as one of the Mary's two Catholic chaplains aboard, and said, When a crusty old guy like me gets misty, that's something. It was what sailors dream of, people caring enough to welcome them home. The nuclear cruiser USS Long Beach was standing off the breakwater, flying signal flags reading, Welcome home, Queen Mary. The Navy crew stood along her rails and gave a hand salute as the Mary steamed past. By prearrangement, Captain Jones sailed past the entrance to Long Beach Harbor a half mile to Point Furman, where thousands of Mary watchers lined the Palos Verdes Hills for a view of the ship. The fleet of followers continued to trail in her wake. I can't say enough about the discipline of these yachts, Captain Jones said. They are politely giving the Queen Mary a lane of one cable clear. Captain Jones missed the collision of a sailboat and a minesweeper, or the near collision of the tug Angelus Gate with another minesweeper. It was a Times Square traffic jam at sea. The Mary made a wide, turning arc and headed back towards Long Beach's breakwater entrance to the harbor. The entrance she would pass through, never to sail out again, oddly, was named Queen's Gate, a name selected long before the city considered owning a ship named Queen Mary. U.S. public health officers had come aboard with the port pilot to check Dr. Wilson's report that stowaway Jane Francis Militic had typhoid fever. They decided Miss Militic was suffering from no more than tourista, a common stomach ailment of Americans who visit Mexico. The ship was cleared to dock. At 10.40 a.m., Captain Jones ordered the ship to move through the breakwater and into the harbor. Horns, sirens, and whistles were sounding a welcome. Bands were playing, and people were cheering. I'm absolutely overwhelmed, said Frank Staken a night bedroom steward who had not gone to bed after his last night of duty aboard Queen Mary. Chris Hilton, chief steward on sea deck, was fussing with passenger luggage. He looked in the Dunlap's cabin where the 300 pounds of books were stacked under the bunks and said something that he'd never said in all his 40 years of service on Cunard ships. I'll be damned if I'll move those books one inch out of this stateroom. He didn't. The vast, trailing fleet of small boats was kept outside the breakwater. The Mary was now escorted by fireboats sending out streams of rainbows. The ship sidled up to berth 122 at Pier E at 11.15 a.m. It took some jockeying to get the giant settled, but at 12.16 p.m., December 9, 1967, Captain Jones flashed the order, finished with engines. The seagoing baronial home had ended her sea life 31 years, 6 months, and 9 days after she sailed on her maiden voyage. Charles Albert Pierce, who had fired the engines for the maiden voyage, began closing valves to cool the boilers for the last time. He was 65. You've been good to me, Pierce wept as he talked to the inanimate boilers as the flame flickered out. I'm retiring with you. No other ship for me. Francis McGarry patiently wiped clean the semicircled bar in the observation lounge. You don't have to do that, barked the other bartender. It's all over, Mac. Let's get the hell out of here. Don't tell me what to do, snapped McGarry. He pretended it wasn't all over. 
and that he'd come back the next day and go on serving the Queen Mary. McGarry had promised himself he'd walk down the gangway without looking back. He couldn't, and stood for nearly an hour on the dock, just staring at the dead ship. In the radio room on sun deck, Chief Radio Operator William S. McLaughlin had shut down and was locking the door when he heard a message clicking over the wireless. Instinctively, as he had done for 31 years, McLaughlin went back and copied the message. Welcome from the Bothwells. Please call us. McLaughlin added a message of his own at the bottom. This is the last radiogram to be received aboard the Queen Mary, and sent it on to passengers Mr. and Mrs. Sterling Oakley of Chicago, Illinois. At dockside, a huge circus tent had been set up to handle the passengers' luggage and customs clearance. That morning, Bill Russell, supervisory inspector for the Los Angeles District Customs, had assembled every available customs agent in Southern California for the task of getting 2,000 people, passengers, and crew cleared through customs. He had a bit of bad news for the agents. The foot and mouth disease epidemic had been discovered in the British Isles before the Queen Mary sailed. Russell told the agents every bag had to be opened and inspected, and persons questioned as to whether they had visited rural areas in England. A special dip was prepared for treating suspect shoes, which might have tiny bits of dirt embedded in them. The last night at sea, ship's gardener Eric Littar had received a message from the U.S. Agriculture Department instructing him to toss all potted plants aboard over the side because the soil might carry the foot-and-mouth disease virus. Russell was concerned. He had read press reports about the passenger's nightmare voyage and had thought his agents might be faced with 1,200 angry people. Let me remind you, he cautioned the agents, that these people crossed the equator without air conditioning and their shore leave was often canceled or curtailed to maintain schedule. The bars were for a time, without ice. We were prepared for the worst, commented Raymond Butcher, the customs import specialist. We were also wrong. The people were saints. With the ship safely docked, the restriction of the small boats from entering the harbor was lifted. About 50 small craft moved in and came alongside the Queen Mary, chanting for souvenirs. The ship's officers and city officials were on the pier conducting a welcoming ceremony, but the passengers and crew were stranded aboard, waiting for customs inspection. In a burst of unusual enthusiasm, they started to dump over life jackets, blankets, crockery, silverware, deck chairs, even furniture to the souvenir seekers. Customs agents rushed aboard and threatened to arrest anyone tossing gear over the side. The souvenir party stopped. Watching the madness, Ken Bear thought to himself the ship was being stripped of irreplaceable items. Months later, workmen converting the ship opened storage spaces and found thousands of items, dishes, cups, silverware, that even Kinnar didn't know were aboard. They also uncovered a cache of GI steel helmets left over from the Mary's trooping days. An ambulance had backed up to the gangway, and attendants were moving Siri Hugh down the gangway on a stretcher. She had reached Long Beach on the Queen Mary. She died the next day in a Bellflower, California hospital. The baggage started moving out the R-deck hatchway at 2 p.m. Customs agents began the long vigil of getting the people through the tent. In one bag, secreted, agents found $10,000 worth of undeclared diamonds. The owner was fined $3,700. The Queen herself got off scot-free as an intangible under U.S. tariff regulations, but the goods on her were subject to duty. The crew was as anxious to get ashore as the passengers. Some had to be flown back to England on the following day to catch the December 13th sailing of the Queen Elizabeth for New York. Despite the long voyage to Long Beach, those chosen to join the Elizabeth would have one day at home and wouldn't return to England until after the new year but they were the lucky ones. They had jobs to go home to. The majority did not. One of those who didn't have a job to go back to was Bill Croxton of Cheshire, England, a ship's linotype operator. Croxton had been invited to spend three days with an American printer. He never showed up. I got stoned to the eyeballs, Croxton said. He had been celebrating with the other three printers, all who had been selected for new Cunard assignments. The ship's engines stilled, 
her boilers cold and her propellers disconnected, the Queen Mary was riding out her last days as a ship. Captain Jones many times had welled up with tears during touching moments of the last voyage. On Monday, December 11th, when the ship was officially handed over to Long Beach, he wept openly. The British Blue Ensign, the Stem Jack, and the Cunard House flags were struck. The United States Stars and Stripes was hoisted on the Queen Mary for the first time. There was a lump in my throat at that sight, Captain Jones admitted. That ended the life of the ship RMS Queen Mary, but a new Queen Mary will emerge, which will be honored and revered in the history and glory of the old Queen Mary. Long Beach finally owned her ship. Plans were made to move her into the Long Beach Navy base dry dock to start converting her for the new life. Six maritime unions claimed rights to jobs on the Queen Mary. They disputed the city's claim that the ship was now a building and not subject to maritime union jurisdiction. The unions began picketing, carrying signs, Did you ever see a dream walking or a building floating? The city held an ace card. The United States Coast Guard had officially declared the ship a building. At the Long Beach Independent Press Telegram, Marine Editor Jack Baldwin received a front office memo that he was not to refer to the Queen Mary as a ship in his news stories. How the hell do you write about the world's greatest ship without calling it a ship? Baldwin asked. Some wag at the Los Angeles Times kept the ship alive by occasionally slipping the name Queen Mary into the arrivals and departures of shipping on the Times Vital Statistics page. The unions were dead serious, however. When it came time to move the ship to dry dock on February 21st, pickets were in force outside the Pier E gate. Tugboats moved into position to nose the Queen, a quarter of a mile to the dry dock. Suddenly, a 22-foot cabin cruiser moved across the tug's path. It was a waterborne picket line. One picket even jumped over the side and swam back and forth holding up a picket sign. The tugboat operators, all members of the Maritime Union, refused to cross. The city went to court and obtained a temporary injunction, but then the Navy Department, threatened with a possible walkout of unions at the shipyard, refused to allow the Queen Mary to use the dry dock. Finally, with the Navy Department reversing itself and armed with court injunctions, the Queen Mary was moved to the 1,093.7-foot-long Morrill Dry Dock on April 6, 1968. The 1,019.6-foot-long Queen Mary almost filled the dry dock. The city of Long Beach, for the first time, was able to look at the underside of the Queen Mary, sitting on 500 blocks inside the dry dock. Captain John Lynch, a retired U.S. Navy officer, retained by Long Beach as a maritime engineer, walked under the hull, checking for damages. I've never seen anything like this, he commented. The ship is in surprisingly excellent condition. Workmen coated her underside up to the waterline with 6,500 gallons of anti-corrosive paint, enough to paint a building a mile high. At the waterline, two painters began adding a white line, six inches wide, completely around the vessel. It is the biggest little job I've ever had, quipped one. Three of the ship's 35-ton propellers were removed, and the shafts welded shut. The outboard port side propeller was left and around it built a 125-ton steel enclosure so that museum visitors can see the propeller working. The dry dock work completed, the Queen was moved back to Pier E. Preliminary work began to convert the ship into a museum, hotel, and convention center. Plans were prepared for the new look of the Queen Mary. When the plans and specifications were completed, they made up a book a foot and a half thick and the plans themselves were a foot high and weighed more than 20 pounds. In order to gut C and D decks to make room for the museum, two of the Mary's three stacks had to be removed to lift out 8,000 tons of metal and machinery. When the stacks were inspected after they were removed, Long Beach decided they were too rusty to put back and designed two replicas, which caused the London Times to headline, The Queen to Wear Falsies. To keep her ballast with the loss of all this weight in metal, a special mud used for oil well packing was pumped into the ship's double-bottom tanks. 
The mud is a fluid mixture of heavy materials, primarily bentonite and limestone. The 18 million pounds of mud are the largest amount ever ordered for one ship. The Queen Mary has 66 double bottom tanks, 46 filled with the mud. The city signed a contract with Diners Club to operate the hotel section, which occupies main deck, A and B decks, and the convention center, restaurants, and shops aboard the ship. The city also signed a 40-year contract with the California Museum Foundation to operate the Museum of the Sea aboard the Queen Mary. The Museum Foundation hired a 38-year-old veteran in museum and educational management, Les H. Cohen, a museum director. Cohen contacted a man he believed was the world's foremost expert on the sea to get his ideas on how the 100,000-square-foot multi-leveled museum should be planned. That man was Jacques Cousteau, the Frenchman who brought the story of the sea into the living room through the medium of television. Cousteau became enamored with the Museum of the Sea idea because of my personal aspiration to help communicate the story of the sea. In 1969, he agreed to join Cohen as chief designer and planner. The Pier J complex became the final home of the Queen Mary, her starboard side facing the city's shoreline. She will never sail another mile, but instead float in the quiet waters of the port. Yet she is destined to receive more visitors in one year than she carried as a luxury liner. The inevitable end for the inevitable ship. The Queen of the Queens. End of chapter 11. This was RMS Queen Mary, Queen of the Queens by William J. Duncan. Narrated by Alex Adner of the Alex the Historian YouTube channel.